What's up, all my Ewoks, Tribbles, Droids, and Wookiees? It's Anna, also known as that Star Wars girl. And today is episode six of Force Talks. I know I haven't done a Force Talks episode in a while, but better late than never, right? And today I am joined by a very, very special guest. Now, I've been a fan of his channel for a long time. I discovered his channel when I first was watching, or right after the Soilo movie came out and there was a link for uh, a Soilo Unbridled Rage video on Twitter. And so I clicked it while I was getting ready for work and the video just didn't end. And by that point I was driving to work and the video still didn't end. And then I was at work and the video still didn't end. And then when it finally did end, I was like, that was better than any movie I've seen in a long time. And that person happened to be Mahler. And then a little bit later, I discovered this podcast through this channel that I really liked, which was The Word of Wolf, and so happened to be hosted by uh, that person that did the Soilo video. And so after watching uh, his videos for a long time uh, and, you know, being coming a really big fan of him, Wolf Rags, and watching EFAP religiously, uh, I have finally got Mahler here on my channel for a very special episode of Force Talks. For anyone that does not know what Force Talks is, this is an interview style show that I do that was inspired by the great and uh, recently passed James Lipton, who is one of my heroes. And without further ado, let's bring on my guest. Hello. Hello. There. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Excellent. Um, I see this already in chat. You got the Mauler Army Unite. Thanks to Patrick Willems. Probably start another <laughs> meme for EFAP now. Ah, uh, oh, the memes. Oh, the memes. Well, we're going to talk about EFAP today. We are, because it's, uh, I've said it before many times, it's my favorite uh, podcast. I actually got blocked on Twitter for defending my favorite podcast. <laughs> Did Mauler get blocked? Absolutely not. Did I? Yep. Yeah, it's it, I, people. People are always like, "Why are you surprised?" Well, none of them block you. They block everyone else. It's because uh, they can't. The, the theory, the current theory, is that they can't be seed blocking you. I guess I was just like, "Oh, I'm I'm rarely that mean." They're uh, it's, I'm usually just snarky on Twitter. No, I, I'm. So, you aren't mean, and I'm just like Mahler. You need to get mean. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for the episode of EFAP where you just finally snap. Because I remember watching the Major Lee episode and I'm just sitting there banging my head against the table. I'm like, oh my God. And then the Game of Thrones episode. I don't know how you do it. It's, yeah, the, sometimes you need, you need a level of patience. He, um, he, when he was describing the the Ray and Kylo romance and I refused to believe it, I was just <laughs> saying, and then look what happened in TROS. <laughs> I'm sure he was very happy about that. Oh, uh, uh. Amazing. You mean it wasn't romance? It was a kiss of gratitude. Oh, it was a, it was a. Hey, you want to live? Because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, did you see the theory that it was actually Leia? That saved oh. her. It wasn't even Kyle. <laughs> oh yeah, that's just oof. Uh, but uh, seriously, if uh, you know, if Anakin and other uh, Jedi would have patience like you, I don't think Order sixty six would have happened. Uh, cause that, if that's one, uh, quality of a Jedi that you definitely possess, it's patience. I don't know how you do it, but it is something that I admire. So everyone, are you guys ready for me to start asking Mahler some questions? Mahler, are you ready? I am indeed. All right. Question number one, what inspired you to start making content? Oof. We got a, we got a couple, a couple of content careers, I guess, at that point. So one one is Retro Ahoy, or I think he goes by Ahoy these days. He's the one who he does everything he can to get all of his information correct. He's mm. like, he looks into the the histories and details of all the different things he's covering. And as much as his videos will have like n some fun little bits of commentary where he's just like, the, uh, the, the you'd absolutely consider like uh, entirely subjective. He's mainly just trying to deliver information to the audience members. So he's got like a series where he talks about the history of guns and he uses, um, the visuals from games to to eventually show how they've sort of evolved like he goes through one of his ones about the thompson gun so like why was it simultaneously used for gangsters as well as uh world war ii sort of american soldiers it's like interesting that it has this duality of a reputation and you'll go through it all and i always loved his attention to detail the references and the delivery of information that he would have like nice visuals and stuff so i was like oof, i like i like the in-depthness and i was like 
so, th so you could you could argue that's that's one piece of inspiration. Another one would be um, Passion of the Nerd. He's a Buffy, Angel, Firefly, and a couple of other things analysis channel where he um, his goal is to go very in depth with uh, episodes of TV and explain like through the different pieces of writing how they have conclusions and payoffs that are uh, particularly potent. Let's just put it that way. And I always found him. So if if you think of Ahoy as like the satisfactory for the mind, uh, passionate it was the heart. He, he's very uh, good at explaining why uh, certain content makes you feel certain ways. So I was like, ooh, I like mm. I like both of them. And then um, uh, Er to an extent, uh, I love I love <laughs> his edgy humor, the the, the comedic tie big at editing he would have, and um, then Total Biscuit for uh, integrity, I guess, and presentation. I like to think that there's some of the many like core content creators that inspired what I wanted to do with my channel, um, with those particular sort of attributes. Interesting. Uh, about uh, how long ago was it when you made your first video? Well, that's. I guess it depends on what kind of video you're talking about. Because I uh, first video I, ever. That was. Oh, I'm not even sure. I, I think I want to say like 2000, early 2010s, and it would have been. Uh, either recorded like a let's play on my own or like with a friend and making like a sort of super cut of the funny things that happen in a game. That was what I first tried out. And what but, um, your first video essay? Uh, I guess that would be the the Amnesia, the Dark Descent versus Amnesia uh, Machine for Pigs. I was very upset as a fan that the <laughs> sequel to my favorite all time horror game was very lackluster. When I found out it was given to the Chinese room who had made Dear Esther previously, instead of Frictional, who make masterpieces of games, uh, I was very upset. And it, 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 it's all in there. And I was like, I'm going to make a video and tell people why Dark Descent is so much better. And that was the first one. And I look back on it now and it's like, oh my God, it could be a hell of a lot better. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, we oh, all I start somewhere. <laughs> I know when I look back at my first video, I'm like, oh God, I said like like 10 times in one minute. I'm like, oh, oh goodness. <laughs> but so since we're talking about uh, where it started, uh, tell us about your process. What's the first thing you do when you, you know, get start to work on a video? So consume the thing and, and assuming it's a game or a TV show or, or a movie or whatever, and almost try and not even be concerned with anything, but just let it let yourself absorb all of it as much as you can then uh, second time through and start making loads of notes about pretty much everything even going as far as maybe pausing it i guess the process is going to be different for depending on the media so if we go with movies it would be watch it the first time then second time make loads of notes then third time uh, have it like say on one screen while a script is on the other or you could put that on, on the one screen and then combine your notes upon watching with your new thoughts while watching it again into like a skeleton script and then redraft that script. Assuming again, because this, this is all very specific to what kind of video you're creating, I suppose. But um, one of the yeah, one of my next great... questions was about yeah. the difference, like how you do it based on what content. But we can skip ahead to that one. So it's like, how would well, you? That would be for the rages and praises. The the idea is I chronologically go through, pick out all of the things that I think I can sort of entertain, uh, explain while sort of entertaining in an entertaining way as best I can, like. You can almost sense when you're writing a script sometimes that you're just like, I've explained a lot of events. There's not any jokes that have happened or not even uh, notes for funny edits I could possibly make. And there's only, uh, like I said about Ahoy's videos, the constant delivery of information can be entertaining, but sometimes you've got to try and pick out moments because a lot of people who aren't a fan of my content would say it's very boring. And it's a oh, tough what? Um, <laughs> well, that's, I mean, it's totally fun. like boring. It's like, yeah, anyone, anyone can find anything boring. It's, uh, and so you yeah. try and find ways to. Because delivery of information is one thing. It's, it's, it's often a concern about how to deliver it in... Because uh, you know, a lot of it comes in the, in the recording as well. Like, uh, not only having good takes... or By good takes, I mean not stuttering or, or um, using connecting words like, like, or uh, that sort of stuff. You try and get rid of it all in the um, final version. And the, there's the aspect of a little bit of voice acting too. Trying to... <laughs> raise some things up and bring them back down when you want to talk about some other stuff instead of remaining almost robotic and monotone in the way that you describe something and then people get very bored when listening. You say, ooh, there's loads of things that come into it and the entire goal is to try and deliver what I found when watching it to the person who probably already saw it but may have missed these things in terms of how they connect or how they don't. And it's not some kind of like 
crazy vain brag. It's that that's the, the job I want to do while they're mm -hmm. probably choosing to do a different job. And they like to watch these things because they don't have to do all of the work that leads to the completed sort of entertaining product. That's the idea, right? Yeah. Um, or piece of art, depending on who you are or what you want to call it. I think that some video essays could be considered artwork with how much goes into creating them, but uh, it's, it's oh, probably yeah, a definitely. complicated or controversial subject these days. What is art? Cannot be bad. All of that. Oh, trust me. I've been hearing that for the past week and a half now. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things uh, when I watched, I, I'm blanking on which one it was, but I, I just couldn't stop cracking up because you would say something that happens in the movie and then you would just be like, K. <laughs> like, that is just so funny. There's some stuff that just speaks for itself in some of the movies I've covered. Staggering. Just uh, just the stuff that happened. Like, you literally just explain in a few sentences what that scene was about, and it's just K. Oh, yeah, I think that came up a lot in, in the Game of Thrones ones, because season eight so. is just baffling in terms of what they chose to do. <sighs> Uh, we're we're going to get there, guys. We are going to go through the evolution of uh, Mahler's videos. But so uh, what you're just uh, kind of talking about kind of flows into the next few questions. So let me ask uh, this very specific one. Uh, mm -hmm. What's your favorite part of the process? Um, probably the first redraft of or like the first proof watch of the video, because that's when everything is finally almost complete. Subsequent ones can get annoying because you know the video so well, you're just looking for any of the flaws that remain. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I get one that's got the visuals, the, especially with the critique ones versus the rage ones, because they've got a few extra layers of uh, work involved, like backing track or uh, special effects. I say special effects, sound effects. Mm -hmm. Or even sometimes, um, you know, harder edits to pull off because the rage and praises are usually uh, a lot more streamlined in terms of their point. The critique ones are me doing the very best editing I can do. So. That first proof watch, I'm like, here it all is. Finally, after months, I can finally look at it all coming together. So um, that's probably my favorite part of the process here. Yeah. How many times do you have to, you know, re-record yourself reading your script? Uh, it's very varied because uh, I usually try for each sentence. I like to try and get more, at least two reads of it that I think are strong from listening to myself while I'm doing it, and then. Um, Depending on what it is, I like to try and go for a variation in case I need one. And then by doing that, it takes a lot longer to get all of it done, but I usually don't have to re-record. Like, I don't usually have to go, oh, I need to redo this one. But if I do, I just make notes about it. It can, it can take a long time, but I like my audio to be clear and uh, concise and you know, understandable. Um, and even with my accent, uh, I can I can read out a lot of words that I'm like, oh, that's going to sound really weird. Um, <laughs> like, like saying here instead of here. When I say here, because I'm I'm very British, that uh, a lot of people can be like, "What is he? What is he saying? What's here?" Here, um, like, <laughs> here, here is the very much more clear way of doing it. Is there other words aside from here? Um, how do you say milk? Oh, just milk. <laughs> okay, sometimes that's a weird one. What about water? Oh well, see, so that's one that uh, I guess I, I would say water, but um. That's like an American versus British, but there's like, you could have ones that are like glass or glass, and uh, that can confuse, because uh, British, depending on where you're at, you could say both. Then there's, yeah, this is just lots of stuff, and um, if I can d decide on which one ends up sounding clearer or easier to understand, I'll, I'll usually go with it. Hmm. And whichever, like, one flows more with the conversation. Usually. Yeah. All right, next question. Uh, what is your least favorite part of the process? Ooh, um, probably whenever I get to a portion of the video where I'm recanting um, a piece of plot before I get to analyze it and I just need to fetch all of the visuals that match what I'm saying, it's mm -hmm. like, it's it's a, there's barely any like room to be <clears throat> what I, I guess I would call creative in that one. I know exactly what I need to do, and it's going to take some time to fetch them all and match them all. And so it's just a matter of, it, it's almost like a loading bar, but I'm the robot and I just have to wait until it's done. As opposed to, say, for example, I, I say something like kick the can down the road in my scripts, and I'm like, ooh, what in all of Star Wars could I use that would match that visually? And um, there's a couple of times where people get kicked, 
And for example, like when Obi Wan kicks Django, it's like that would probably be the one I would be thinking of. And I go fetch it and then attach it and look at it. And I'm like, oh, this lines up really well, actually. If I just move this and slow this down, maybe zoom in on this, it's like there you go, it works perfectly. And that's that's a, that's the work is being done and it's engaging and satisfying versus. Um, you know, this is the scene with the Wrath Tars. This is where they are. This is where they're running. <laughs> just get all of that and put it in. I'm like, yep, there you go. That makes sense. Yeah, I totally feel you on that. That is the least favorite part. Um, I don't uh, edit as heavily as you do, but when I have to go in and edit visuals, it's like nails on a chalkboard to being like, uh, uh, I have to do it, but I don't want to do it. <laughs> uh, how has your process evolved since you began? So... Uh, the main concern was always accurate references, which I've gotten much better at. And then I was like, I've always been a crap editor. And I was like, how do I, what is the best possible editing I can do as someone who's just not very experienced with editing? And I was like, well, getting everything that I say proven visually or with audio is going to be helpful. And so I started trying to do that whenever I thought it was necessary. So whenever I said something that I thought a viewer might be like, is that true? And so then I put it on screen. And as I made more videos, I found uh, this is this is actually tied to EFAP quite a bit because uh, a lot of the criticisms I can sort of generate about videos are then things that I will spot myself almost choosing to do in my process. And I'll be like, ooh, how can I be so critical of something like that when I'm engaging it myself? So I try and avoid it or at least um, whenever there's a corner to cut. As long as I'm working smarter rather than working lazier, then I'll, I'll go with it. But if it's like, oh... Um, the TLJ critique was was a lot of gameplay footage, which again people are mostly okay with, and that's 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 great and everything. But the moments where I had editing to prove my points and uh, visuals to match dynamically what I was saying. So, for example, um, I say like this should be here and this should be over here, and then I have Obi Wan pointing to a screen, and then his hand moves with as as I'm saying stuff. It's very um, satisfying for viewers to see, and it shows a lot of uh, let's say care was put into the video. And so I, when I started doing more and more of it and less and less gameplay. And then I was like, why not not have any gameplay at all? And the obvious reason is, well, because it takes months. Well, if you have gameplay, you can get your actual points out relatively quickly. And so I sort of was just like, ah, well, let's consider this an experiment. And the TFA critique series is probably going to be entirely fully edited, but I might consider um, dialing it back in future because it is taking a long time to get them done compared to other things. Yep, still waiting. <laughs> it's coming. Got that sarcastic April Fool's video, but no, uh, you know. I'm, <laughs> and the I'm, editing on those was was uh, as best I could do as well. I was I'm still waiting for the rest of the Game of Thrones. Like, where the hell is it, Muller? That's the thing. I've got people who are like, when's the next gaming one? When's the next Game of Thrones one? When's the next uh, Force Awakens critique? People are still waiting for the Joker praise. And it's just like... Oh, my gosh. Yeah. They're all in their queues, and I, I'm I'm addressing the queues one by one. They, they each get something. Um. So it's coming. It's all coming. It's going to come out eventually. We're just going to find you and lock you in a room with a computer <laughs> and not allow you to leave until they're all finished. Well, you have quarantine now. You got plenty of time to do it. All right. Uh, so next question. Uh, do you have a different approach when critiquing games versus movies or TV shows? So that's complicated, isn't it? Because uh, game, mm -hmm. uh, gameplay and story is, is going to be like... So Soma, for example, it's like, how important is the gameplay versus the story? Because games is gameplay, right? It's always games. It's like, oh, well, Soma's main draw is the intense sort of um, world view the game presents in its story and the questions it asks. And so when you're trying to talk about it, it's like the gameplay sort of sits in the background, but you can still talk about it. It's, it's still, still kind of there. While with movies and TV and anything that's strictly story-based, the writing is a very definitive sort of block you can talk about. Because the question often comes up, with games, uh, if you have a game that's very limited in gameplay but has an excellent story, is it still a good game? It's like, ooh, you don't know. It's, it's a complicated question. So with my gaming approach, it was kind of the same with the movie in terms of I would uh, play it and just uh, get every thought down that I think of things I want to cover um, and then just keep playing it over and over again and, and, and grab all the things I needed. This was the Dark Souls 2 process that was intense, but it, it was the same for Ukulele and uh, Resident Evil 7. The sort of like trying to find everything that's comment onable and then looking at everyone else's coverage to see uh, where my biases would be. So if I made a conclusion and then I saw something in someone's video that I had completely missed or ignored because of something I felt or, or uh, did, then um, it would be really useful to 
getting the definitive on on what it is. But I I kind of tried to just address them all um, as if they're they're all important parts: the the story, the gameplay, the soundtrack, atmosphere, um, animation, graphics, all these different sort of things. Because games are very complicated. While with movies, I try and stay strictly to writing, and then everything else, as much as it is really important, there's loads of craft behind it. Um, I would just argue that it's all designed to accentuate the writing. The writing is the foundation. With gaming, it's a little bit more complicated. It's the, it's the writing and the mechanics of the, the code, I guess you could say. Which one do you find takes you longer? Well, I think because I haven't done a game one in a while, yeah. but I would assume if I was to do a game review these days, considering my standards have kind of gotten a, a lot higher since starting out, it would probably be a game because a movie is actually what you would assume to be the shortest thing to review, and yet uh, the TFA critique once finished is probably going to be over 12 hours or so. So <laughs> it's going to be the longest series I'll have, and it'll be a movie. Ah, oh, I'm excited. Been waiting, been waiting. Uh, let's see. Uh, what is it about horror games that you find appealing compared to other games? Um, I guess in the real world, if you have a look at all of the s sort of standard emotional, I, I don't have like a guide on this, but just the experience of like love or awe or uh, excitement, anxiety, a lot of like the bigger categories, fear, like genuinely, genuine horror isn't something that um, our, our world is kind of cushioned in a way that's designed to keep us away from that for the most part. And so... Mm -hmm in fantasy and media, we can essentially experience it without the repercussions that come with it. Like we know we're ultimately safe, but we can trick ourselves for a minute and experience emotions that are very, uh, almost impossible to experience these days. Cause we need the, we, we needed them once upon a time to help protect us against like some of the bigger predators and dangers of life. But modern society is trying to design it so that we can actually live, you know, decently long lives compared to maybe what it was like back then. So, these games or movies or whatever can bring that emotion out. And it's um, it's something I try and address in the Soma series where I'm like, why do we value being scared? Like, why is that something we would even want? Um, I think it's a fascinating conversation to go over. And I think it is tied to the fact that it's just an experience we very rarely feel. And as long as it's not going to kill us or do permanent damage, it's something of a, an enticing thrill to, uh, you know, try it out. Are you one of those people that loves scary movies and loves being scared by scary movies? Like yes. Uh, after Amnesia, I've been forever trying to find games that'll scare me as much as that game did. Uh, Soma's more of a, a thought game. It's still really scary for a lot of people. I just um, I get fascinated by the, the things it covers. It's existential horror rather than um, what you might call just your standard sort of fear for your life. Is it like, I don't know what these games are because I am the biggest scaredy cat. Uh, <laughs> everything scares me. So I probably would be terrified. And I'm one of those people that when I get scared, I throw my remote at the TV. So uh, chances are I wouldn't do very well with those games. But um, is there something in particular that scares you more so compared to other things in it? Um, in a particular game or just in the horror genre? Uh, both. Um. Something that scares me more so than other things? Is that? Well, like, you know, some people just say uh, the cheap thing to do is like a jump scare. So I don't know right. about these games. So I don't know what the premise is. Uh, um, what is it in the game that is so compelling that's with the horror aspect of it that scares you? So Amnesia is, uh, it was novel back in the day, but that's that's uh, over a decade ago now. That's what that's what actually kicked off the big uh, Let's Play sort of explosion on YouTube, I think, was Amnesia and Outlast. But uh, the the thing with uh, Amnesia was just uh, they took a very long time to show you in an overt way what the threat even was. It was mainly just atmospheric, trying to convince you that you're just a guy trying to get through this weird castle you've woken up in. You've got limited resources, but there's a clear direction you're supposed to go. But then every weird things just keep happening, and they put you on edge. And um, a lot of the enemies are very roaming. So, like, the, the, there isn't... Because this is the difference between Amnesia and Outlast for me, is that the scripting versus the... Outlast wants to grab you and shout at you but when you don't necessarily expect it. While Amnesia, pretty much every person's gameplay is going to be different, depending on what you choose to do, how fast you choose to move, and... Um, how much you're listening out for where the enemy placements might be. And I find um, 
the experiences that get you closer and closer to what would kind of run out to be a real experience with with something that's trying to end your life uh, in a very real way. If you can get nice and immersed into that, you can get a, an experience, like I said, that's very almost impossible to feel without actually getting the repercussions. And so amnesia comes very close, or at least it, it, it did back in the day. It's probably not going to scare me as much these days because I, I know it too well. But um, I've heard that Frictional are baiting the next game. It's going to be coming out this year, so I'll be playing that immediately. And as for Soma, um, I still find that game, when I first played it, it was still terrifying for those same sort of aspects, but it also kind of uh, tries to scare you by thinking about the concept of what it means to be human and uh, the many ways that we could possibly exist while not being categorized as something that deserves a right to different things and also just being looked at as a monster, essentially. And uh, it's quite it can be quite scary in its own way for that. Um, so, yeah, like, like I like guess... Puzzles. To uh, sorry, to, to I guess to answer your question, it was it was just that uh, the the jump scare stuff doesn't really do much for me. I get annoyed by it a lot of the time, um, but like the subtlety of just a big room and you can hear noises. There's something in there, and it's like misty. That's way more terrifying to me. Oh, yeah, yeah. just getting your brain to do the work instead. Well, it's kind of like Jaws, right? You don't see the shark until the end. It's just the shots of the water with the intense music. Because mm -hmm. your mind is what is your imagination is the most dangerous thing in that aspect. And so it, it's as terrifying as you want it to be or that you could possibly imagine. But that's what it sounds like from your description. It, it sounded more like a, a figuring out puzzle game as compared to a horror game. You believe there's actually a lot of puzzles in um, the both Amnesia and uh, Soma to a degree, like connecting, you know, wires to, to power things or put things in the right place and stuff. But the, the angle will always be that you don't know what's behind you or what's around every corner. And so you'll, you'll be as, as on edge as you are immersed. And uh, the game can surprise everyone so well. But they, they always try and change up their formula to a degree. And uh, I'm really hoping they can knock it out of the park again because uh, very reliable development team, Frictional. Mm -hmm. And sorry, everyone in the chat. I keep having to mute myself because my house is under construction right now. So uh, if you hear noises, that's what that is. But I, I meant puzzles as far as like mental puzzles, like like you said, what it means to be human and having to oh, sure, yeah. like those morality things like, oh, if you, there's five people in a burning building and you could save five people that you don't know or like somebody that you do only one person and it's the one person you do know, like what would you do kind of thing. Well, in the same way that uh, if you were cloned, what uh, is that still you? I don't know if you've seen the Prestige or um, even yes. I think we discussed it on EFAP relatively recently. I There's a lot of in the Prestige, of course. He is, is yes. Yeah. Um, a lot of questions get raised quickly with stuff like this, and it starts to worry. You're like, oh wait, yeah, how do I look at this? How do I classify all of this? And uh, it can be quite spooky. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. All right. So let's move on to the next question. Uh, what video was it that did it for your channel? That would be, that's, I guess I'd have to say it's a couple, but, uh, I guess the main one would be the TLJ rage. It was, uh, and I, I mean, I've told people this before, but I was planning, I was writing and it still exists on my computer. I think it's is, it is about 19 pages were done out of like a hundred, but a critique of Westworld season one. That's what I wanted to do next. And then I found out that the last Jedi was in cinemas and I was like, oh, cool. I wanted to see the sequel to The Force Awakens. That movie was fun, and I like Star Wars a lot, so I'm gonna go see it. And then, and then I was left very uh, confused after finishing it because I had many thoughts at once. And I remember speaking to uh, Metal Commander and Fortier, who have popped on to uh, EFAP a couple of times, and um, Fortier was very happy with the film, and Metal was fifty-fifty. And I was only started talking about it once the conversation was over. I think all three of us decided we hated it um, because we were thinking about all the things that it did, and then. I remember it stewing for a while. And I was like, I want to make a video about this. It's just going to be a quick rad video because I actually want to get out of there. And I remember a big concern I had was that I'd only reviewed games up to that point. So I was going to piss off my um, my 2,000 subscribers. And uh, <laughs> let's just say they got eclipsed with what happened with uh, that video. Uh, did you lose any of those? Or did they? I think, happy I, think to grow? I probably did. There's probably a couple in there that really only wanted to see gaming stuff. And so they're probably potentially gone by now. But. Um, as I've told people before, because they find it hard to believe, it's like I was I was always a film person before games. It's just that I happened to be like I, I happened to be pissed off about Machine for Pigs at the time of being okay with making a video, you know? 
And that's that's often the origin for a lot of uh, my videos that get made. It's a passion that goes one way or the other. I really liked uh, Infinity War. I got really pissed off with Black Panther. Um, I really got pissed off with with with, with Dark Souls Two and uh, H Bomber Guy's very poor representation of Matthew Matosis's video of Dark Souls Two. So like, it's all very driven by the heart, and then uh, tempered by the mind is how I would probably put it. While because some people are like, why haven't you made um, you know a rage video on other MCU movies you hate? You just hate black and female protagonists. So I was just like, no, it's just, it's, just a, it's just a coincidence that these things happen when they do. But if you wanted to make the comment that that's the only stuff I hate, then you'd have a hard time because I've got after all the Star Wars movies. It's like, I guess they have a female protagonist at all, so I'm screwed there too. Yep, I just hate women. You know, I keep telling every guy this. I'm like, just from now on, wear a wig, like a long-haired wig and identify on YouTube as a woman. Then nobody can say that to you. Just draw a wig on, over your... Uh, <laughs> Give some pigtails to your little uh, your little avatar. Then nobody can say that about you. Well, they, 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 the fascinating um, new trick I've seen is because they, they get annoyed that um, a lot of people in, let's say, EFAP community or um, just, just you guys as well, a lot of different people will say, like, we don't hate female protagonists and they'll cite aliens and uh, T2 and T1, obviously. An alien, obviously, but is it just you know what the characters I'm going for? Sarah Connor and uh, Ellen Ripley, well, right? And, and that you mentioned Buffy. Like, well, I don't think I've ever met a guy that likes Buffy as much as you do. <laughs> it's, it's like it's, it's possibly my favorite content. That's the funny. That's why. So, like, longtime friends of mine, when they find out that people think that I hate female protagonists, they're always confused. They're like, "Do, do they?" And I was like, "Yeah, they don't know. It's fine." Um, but they see that now as like the equivalent of saying, I'm not racist, I have a black best friend. That, that, that's what they think that uh, the equivalent of saying they like Ellen Ripley is. It's like, you don't hate women, but you like her. They'll say like, you only like them because they're essentially male characters that are females or something what? like that. It's, well, it's bizarre. And I was just like, you really want us to be sexist, huh? <laughs> and usually those people that are the most sexist ones. You know, well, the, yeah, I mean, this is the thing. My my points in my videos are not like there's too many women in it. I I, I, I don't do that. So I, I always get confused. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the prior to um, the stream, we we're talking about like a, a tweet that's gone out recently saying that a uh, ball of fads are, are, are Trump supporters. I'm like, wait, 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 wait what? <laughs> so did... You can clearly hear from his voice. He's not American. <laughs> it's just bizarre to me. I don't, I don't know where they got it from. <laughs> Where's the connection? <laughs> I just, I remember the the first time, like, I feel like Wolf brought that up on EFAP. And he's like, if anything, he's like, we've never even spoken about politics to each other. But based on, like, the things that we do have to address, it's like, we're pretty liberal compared to the shit that people think that we are. Oh, the labels get so complicated these days. It's like, <sighs> and, and that's the thing I, I knew uh, when creating a lot of this stuff that as a viewer of other stuff at the time, I was just like, it's so tiring when politics just keeps coming into all of this stuff. And, uh, and of course, the response is politics is in everything. And you're like, okay, all right. <laughs> I guess that means that we should just constantly mention how much we hate Trump in every video. <laughs> like, oh gotta, gotta do it. Well, I mean, you can even bring up, like, whenever people do that, it's like, okay, let me explain to you, like, Star Trek. I know that you're not a, a Trekkie uh, in particular. I don't even know how much you've watched it. I just remember uh, somebody asked you on... I, I caught a glimpse of the Nerdrotics uh, stream, and the only little bit that I heard you say was, oh, yeah, I'm not really into Star Trek. And I was like, God damn it. No rage <laughs> videos for Picard from Mahler. Oh, my my heart. Yeah, but, uh, I was say that this, I'm sure one of you guys are taking care of it, though. Oh, dude, I, I'm blowing gaskets in my head uh, from watching that damn shit. But uh, they're the next gen and even you know the original series it's very political the stuff that they deal with like they're one of the best episodes that all of these crazy people forget because they've never seen it there's an episode where Riker you know second in command of the Enterprise uh in the next generation he's interacting with this alien uh race and they don't have genders and the character that he's interacting with is explaining to him how they used to have genders, but they've evolved past that. So they're all gender neutral. Mm -hmm. And that people that do identify as having uh, a gender as either male or female, they're seen as, you know, that there's something messed up with them. And so they have to get sent to these facilities to be fixed. And then you find out that this character is one of them and that she identifies as a woman. And then her and Riker fall in love and he, uh, you know, tries to save her because her people find out. And, uh, you know, he risks his 
career trying to save her because one of the things in Starfleet is that they believe if you're being oppressed in any way that Starfleet can be a refuge for you. And uh, at the end of the episode, she gives in and she gets brainwashed back by her society to go to, you know, a rehab facility because it's bad to identify as female or male. And that he ends up with like a reprimand. And I'm like, all the people that are crying about wanting representation and non-binary, it's like they did that in Star Trek uh, back in late 80s, early 90s. You know, they've been doing yeah. this for a while. There's a way to do it and to do it right. And it made sense within the story. And it wasn't virtue signaling. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, uh, um, it's funny when some people like uh, Buffy could be considered SJW. It's like it, it may have been if it came out today, but that was well before any of this happened. And, uh, you know, like um, I don't know if you knew, but the Joss Whedon had to fight to get a gay relationship on that show, and yet it's so woven into the narrative that it's no, um, it's it's there's no trouble. There's no there's no like arbitrary nature to it, where it's just plugged in and, and given. All kind. Of, it's funny because I've been watching through it with uh, with Fringy, and there's this um, this time in season six where uh, one of the male characters is leaving on an airplane, and they're all saying goodbye. And there's five of our main characters, you could downright call them protagonists, and four are women. And I was like, "Do you notice that?" He was like, "No." And I was like, "Yeah, you don't notice it because they're all characters instead of." <laughs> And you don't have them constantly being like, we are powerful women, us lot. <laughs> it's just like, no, they're just people. It's, uh, it's, it's just fascinating that um, you have Captain Marvel and uh, like Batwoman and Ray, <sighs> all of these awful, awful, awful just representations of, of what female characters can be. And it's just like, why did you do this? You just, you removed any personality and just gave them superpowers. It's like, good job. Well, that's one of the great things about Buffy. I mean, when Willow is like first discovering her magic and all of that, and like it, they, they all have flaws and they have human characteristics, which when they do finally achieve something that they've been working for, like let's say maybe they're working for something throughout maybe four episodes and they finally are able to get that thing done or, you know, find a certain character, a bad character that they need. I don't want to spoil anything for people that haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the show in long long time i probably won't watch it again for a long long time too but uh when the thing happens with the thing with the thing that you've been trying to find the thing for a very long time and they finally find the thing and they're trying to do the thing with the thing it wouldn't be satisfying if buffy could have done it from the beginning yeah and, and uh, a lot of the well all of the female characters certainly main cast have very significant flaws that uh lead them into let's say darker moments in their arcs that they can overcome and work toward while I don't even, what is, what is a, like, I know this is tired, but it's just like Ray, Captain Marvel, that woman, <laughs> none of them have any flaws according to their own sort of worlds and narratives. She's like, nope. And you see, I kept making excuses. Like when I watched The Force Awakens, I'm like, okay, here are all of my concerns, but their concerns right now, but there's two more movies coming and they're going to get mm -hmm. answered in those two movies. So I made excuses like, why can Ray fly the Millennium Falcon? Why is the Millennium Falcon there? How is she perfect? Like, it, it's like the excuse that I use. I'm like, yeah, you've seen a car your entire life. When you first get behind the wheel of a car, you don't know how hard it's going to be to make a left turn or a right turn for that matter. Yeah, uh, You don't flipping, you know, flipping a bitch in the middle of the street, worried about other cars coming, you're not gonna, it, it's funny to see like adults now, one of my best friends, she never drove and she's just learning how to drive now, you know, in her twenties and seeing a full grown adult that's never done this before, trying to do something that is just second nature to everyone that's been doing it for years and she's terrified. It's like, try backing up a car uh, in a straight line if you've never done it before, you know? it's not as easy as it looks just because you've watched other people do it. So with all of that with Ray, I was like, okay, there's a reason why, you know, she's not allowed to say it. She's left there on the planet on purpose. It's all going to get answered. There's a reason why, you know, the Han Solo just happens to pick them up out of all the ships in the galaxy. He just happened yeah. to, you know, and well, it's, um, it's funny because this is something I'm going to go over in the, um, the TFA critique, but, uh, there's a piece of ADR as they're walking to Maz Kanata's, you know, uh, tavern, whatever, cantina. And uh, Han is telling them that he found them because he scanned for it and that it's not going to be long before the First Order can scan for it. 
And it's just a random line, and they've shown from behind when saying it, so I'm assuming it was never intended to be that way. They just realized they needed to have a reason for why Han found them. And it's the way that everything's written in the sequel trilogy. It's like, he, we're, we're sitting there like, how did he find them? Why did he find them then? It's like, oh, well, he had a scanner. Like, that doesn't answer anything. That's just confusing. Because he had a scanner for the money. Found, he found them the moment they left uh, Jakku's atmosphere. Like, really? Of all the of all the times in the world he could have gotten there? It's like, yep, that's just how it worked out. And you're like, okay. And why was he even in that system? You know? And the, the First Order disappear uh, for that moment in the film. They're just gone. And those other factions show up. And you're just like, oh, hey. Uh, what is it? Kanja Club and... Bola Teague or something, and it's just like, who are you people? Like, what is happening? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, like when, people, when people say Force Awakens is the good one, I'm always like, mm. the <laughs> only time that movie is good is when there's nothing to come after it. So there, you have that potential of yeah. it's going to be explained, and it's going to be a damn good explanation. Because they never even touch back on those flashbacks from when she t held the lightsaber. They never acknowledge it again. You know? Uh, are you talking about when she, like... When she holds it? the lightsaber in Maz Kanata's uh, basement. I mean, I guess they, they explained to us uh, where her parents were leaving because they were trying to save her, that uh, that well, evil... That bad scene kid. where, like, she faces Kylo and, you know, he's standing over her. Remember that? And people were saying, oh, those are the Knights of Ren because he wasn't by himself. Oh, right, yeah. Um, like, in the mud. Lots of different theories as to what that even is. I remember people saying that that was supposed to be like when him and the Knights of Ren killed all of Luke's students. And I was like, I don't think that's canon anymore. Like, no. I, I think even Disney has started to say like, oh, it was it was Palpatine that killed all the students, not Kylo, because they, they kind of need him to be a hero now. <laughs> it's like, whoops. You need him to be a hero, but he doesn't talk for an hour of your last movie. <laughs> uh, I mean, well, we could he go said, on. Ouch. Yeah. Great. Oh. What a great character. <laughs> My favorite. Loads of people would say he's the best character in all of Star Wars, and I was just always fascinated by it. Like, I, I don't even know what worst. his character is. He's the worst character. I, I like Jar Jar better than him. Heck, I like the random person that read a line than Kylo. They're he's more like, interesting than him. He's the personification of inconsistency. Like He just doesn't know what the hell he's doing ever. So think, just, if he hadn't died, he would have become evil again in episode 10. That's just how it would have gone. I hope they don't make any. Uh, no, no, no. I just, <laughs> I just want it to just die and just, you know, when sometimes they continue on like with sequels and they just never acknowledge the films that came before. Mm. That's what they need to do if they ever do this again and get someone that actually knows this shit. But uh, we've gotten a little bit off topic because we're going to get back to Star Wars. Uh, one fun thing about my channel is we can always get it to Star Wars, uh, hence the, the that Star Wars girl. But so this is this will be a fun question for you, Mahler. Uh, how exhilarating was it the first time your video got one million views? And can you tell us like a little bit about that? Uh, I, I think that would have been the, one of the critique ones. I can't remember if that, that was with the rage or the critique first. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't see it coming. I didn't, I didn't really understand it. And, uh, it was only after a few more, I think it was once I got further into EFAB and everything that I understood that it was like, it's, um, people were very upset with what they did. And it was, it, I think it all came down to Luke specifically. Like that was the core of it. I remember the end of my part one of the TLJ thing where I go over how Mark Hamill felt about all of this. And it was really important to me because it's how I felt about it. And I've said uh, many times before, it was only, I think it was TLJ that kind of revealed to me that Luke Skywalker was not only like my favorite character in Star Wars, but partly like a huge reason for why I love the OT. And so seeing what they did to him made me very upset. And I think a lot of people felt that way. Yeah. And so having these, these videos is, just catharsis it's like you can sit down and be like oh thank god i'm not alone and that this explains my feelings sort of thing i think a lot of people and you know because obviously a lot of people were making similar videos and i'm um, commenting about it and just it was all very much a big discussion of what the hell just happened guys why is everyone so upset let's figure this out because this is not uh not usual we're supposed to be more than happy about this stuff right this is just a movie it's, it's like and this is the thing um there's this weird sort of cultural thing where it's like as long as we're happy about a movie that's good and normal but if we're unhappy about a movie that's that's toxic and weird and it's just like well it should be treated the same right it's just the inverse whatever happened to make you feel happy surely there would be an equal and opposite that would make you unhappy and i think it's good for us to explore it and understand it 
to thus avoid it in future. And what I would recommend is don't humiliate and destroy beloved characters. This is a very simple sort of, you know, thing, but they just keep on doing it, especially yeah. in the years of 2018 and 19. They went crazy with this. I, I get it. Some people are hung up on the let's do the deconstruction of the superhero. But when you're in a universe that is not meant for that, you know, I mean, the best way that they did it, they already did that with Darth Vader. You know, they deconstructed Anakin and they made him, you know, they showed how he became Darth Vader and it, it gave you that story. You can like the prequels. You can not like the prequels. That's all up to, you know, everyone's opinion, but they already did that. And so doing that to Luke, like, I, I don't know if you've heard me tell this, but I was in the theater and I, I spit out my drink. I was like, what the fuck? Like I screamed that in the theater when he threw the lightsaber. I was so mad. I thought it was a prank. Like somebody had put a fake movie on for me. I couldn't believe that that was real, that I was watching that. Yeah, I was still uh, under the, the Disney spell for about, I want to say the first third of TLJ. I was like, this is fine. This is fine. This is fine. And then I was like, this isn't fine. It was it was especially the uh, the kamikaze where I was like, okay, what the hell? Like, I'm pretty sure. It's, it's, it's kind of a weird experience because part of your brain is like, they've just destroyed space battles in every Star Wars movie that's ever been made. And, and part of your brain is like, no, they that can't be right. That can't have happened just now. <laughs> That's ridiculous, right? As you have to like think about it for a while. And uh, yeah, the uh, it didn't work anymore. And so once, especially by TROS, you know they were they weren't even uh, respectable stories anymore. They're just a big joke. It's like how many more spaceships can we fit on a screen? Oh yeah, they really pushed it with that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, did you try counting them? I think it didn't, isn't there actual count? Because I remember seeing a VFX sort of upload of it where they, they'd modeled every single ship. And I was just like, what an unnecessary thing to do. I just, I stopped. I remember uh, learning about how, because back when they made Return of the Jedi and how those were like pushing the limits of special effects, especially back then and how, uh, you know, ILM, like back in the beginning of it, how it was the most... Um, like cuts that were edited into the final battle over Endor with how many ships that they got to put in because, you know, nothing like that had ever really been done before. And so learning about that, it's like fascinating as compared to this where it's like, oh yeah, just copy and paste this ship and put that one right here, flip that one a little bit. And it's like, why? Why indeed? Why for all of it, really? <laughs> it hurts my soul. But uh, yes, yeah, so you didn't have like any like, holy shit, my video just crossed a million views kind of moment. Or did it take a minute to hit you that it was doing that well? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't really believe it. I remember telling Fortia that uh, the, the big shock would be if it got to 10,000 views, because most of my videos at that point wouldn't crack like 50 or 100. And so when I saw it going above like a thousand, I was like, the most it'll do is probably get to about 10,000. It'd be really cool if I could cross that as a milestone. And yeah, eventually went past <laughs> and I was just um, kind of just staggered. Like it, it's kind of hard to, you just, you just don't know, because uh, you, you visualize for a moment that a potential million people have seen your video. You're just like, what, whoa, <laughs> like, what, what, what's going on and why? And, uh, you know, thinking through all of it was uh, quite an interesting experience. And it's just it's just a matter of Star Wars was beloved. Uh, was. <laughs> was. Uh, would you be, like, happy to hear if somebody at Lucasfilm had watched your critiques? Um, I, I, I guess uh, I'd probably be convinced that that's very potentially happening because there's a lot of people at Lucasfilm. What I'd be more interested in, would just for example, if, if I could watch Ryan Johnson reacting to my TLJ video. <laughs> that would be hilarious. Uh, that's what I say. I do. I've been doing redesigns of like those terrible new warrior characters. And I'm just like, I really wish I could like see the reaction if the artist or the, the guy that created this watched this. Mm. Like, I wish I could see that. Or even if they even acknowledged anything. Uh, like when JJ finally said the fandom menace in an interview, it was like, yes, <laughs> we're real. We're not uh, a bunch of. Uh, I won't say the words that they call us, but we're not a bunch of those things. Well, if there's one thing we can be thankful for about all of these horrible iterations of, of different movies, it's that uh, they've finally given credence, because enough people have, have seen this and been like, what's going wrong? They've finally got enough of a, a people with enough problems to be like, yeah, there is such a thing as screwing this up, and we need to talk about it. Because yeah. uh, 
we all like it when stuff isn't terrible. And as much as there's a huge fan base for stuff like TLJ as well, most of them turned on TROS, so... Um, Oh, that was glorious to finally, oh, it's like you've been calling us Nazis for, you know, two years. But, oh, because we didn't like a Star Wars movie. Get over the, the movie about space wizards. Oh, you didn't like The Rise of Skywalker? Huh, how funny is that? And um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, this, there's so much to it in terms of just uh, how much it's done. But, like, Patrick Willems was, was just cited over and over again because he hated TROS, naturally, because he loved TLJ. Mm -hmm. And so he had like a he had the oh I uh, saw how, it was, what do you say how dare you how fucking dare you J J Abrams I think he said yeah mm -hmm. and so how do you like immediately we're all just like oh man looks like you're getting a bit toxic there buddy looks like um, you're not you're watching the movie wrong I think maybe yeah everyone I remember everyone posting that like you're watching movies wrong and uh, this is a movie about space wizards intended for children. <laughs> throwing that like oh you hate this movie you're attacking the director of this movie but it's just a movie about space yeah movies. you know and jj worked hard man so what are you doing how could you do this <laughs> uh and then he's just like you're taking it out of context it's like nope 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 that's the full context that you used for everyone that pointed out your little mistakes buddy <sighs> these people can dish it they just can't take it all right uh next question uh, how long after you started making content did you make it your full time gig? Uh, it was, I, th I want to say, about a year, maybe half a year to a year. I really can't remember anymore. Um, but it was, it was after because I remember with Black Panther, obviously, was um, quite a controversial one. I didn't realize what I was getting into with that one. I was like, I was really annoyed because I really liked Black Panther from Civil War. I thought he was great, and I was mm -hmm. really surprised to see his movie. And I thought he was pathetic in his movie. And nothing made any sense, and I was very confused. And I was like, "I'll make a video on this," and then I didn't realize I was getting into like this whole yeah. crazy race conversation. I was like, "Oh crap!" I just wanted to talk about how nothing made any sense, <laughs> like I did. And um, yeah, like it, it, the video, uh, you know, spread around and stuff, and did pretty well. And I think it was around that time that enough of my videos had enough traction that I could start uh, focusing entirely on them. But, um, you know, it comes with, this is the thing for anybody who's aspiring to do any of this sort of thing. It's like, you, you gotta be, you make enemies quickly online. There's just oh, so yeah. many people ready and waiting for anybody who has a voice uh, to be, maybe not silenced, but certainly criticized. Yeah, I remember the first episode of EFAP I ever watched was uh, the Rhino Milk one. <laughs> and, uh, you know, going over your Black Panther video. And I gotta say, like, I... I agree with every point you've made about Black Panther, but I still enjoy it as a movie. Like, yeah, it's totally fine. Uh, I would it, put it so, actually as one of my favorite Marvel movies because I thoroughly enjoy it. I'm sitting there going, that's stupid, but I'm enjoying this. Like, that's dumb. That makes no sense, but I really like it. <laughs> I really wanted to like it. That was the thing. I was, I was so ready for it to be an awesome movie, especially as a tee up to Infinity War. And, um, I was just confused by so much of it, and I just I wanted um, I wanted Black Panther to be or T'Challa to be stronger. It, he's very uh, he's very passive in the film. It's a lot of other people making decisions, and he sort of tries to catch up. Yeah, while in, in Civil didn't War, seem like the main character so, in that movie. Yeah, and in Civil War, he's a powerhouse. He's doing anything that he wants, and he makes his own mm -hmm. decisions. And he's like this. He's like a tertiary character in that film. He has like I want to say six minutes of screen time or something. Yeah. It, I think like the mo the best scene as far as like him with character uh, wise was when he does the whole Lion King bit and he gets to go talk to uh, Mufasa with the purple <laughs> magic stuff. Just like yes, it's the Lion King. It's a Marvel movie with superheroes and it's the Lion King. I can dig it, but uh, I don't know because I just that one little scene where his dad dies and he he wants revenge because of that and he's going off and doing that. So he was such a badass and it, yeah. Yeah. And uh, when Hawkeye said he's Clint, and he was just like, I don't care. <laughs> I was like, that's awesome. He just wants to kill everybody. Fuck Hawkeye. I hate Hawkeye. Um, yeah. All right. Well, we're, we're going to get into the Marvel stuff. So I'm going to cut off that uh, mm. until we get back. We're going to get back to that, guys. Uh, all right. Uh, next question. Uh, how did it feel to quit your uh, in real life job? Uh pretty satisfying I guess it's pretty much how everybody would probably envision it we are like I get to pursue 
the thing that I want versus um, the thing that I have to do in order to survive. So uh, it's, it's very, very cool to do um, a job for a living that you were doing as a hobby in the first place. Of course, there are trappings. You, you all have heard of it and possibly experienced it. I don't know. The, um, the idea of once you turn a hobby into a job, it can actually kill the hobby. Um, there's always the worry about burnout. There's, there's there's all these different like negatives that come with it. But uh, certainly when you when you begin, it's a very exciting and uh, freeing sort of prospect because you're essentially your own boss. Despite YouTube being able to choose to end your career at any moment they want, um, you still <laughs> feel very free. And uh, the fact that you can essentially take the breaks that you need when you need and work for a lot, you know, um, there's legal limits on how long you can work. But if you work for yourself, you can work for however long you want to work, especially if you're enjoying it. And then you can be like, you know what, now I'm going to I'm gonna go to sleep at 5 a.m. <laughs> and wake up at 5 p.m. Uh, or something yep. ridiculous. It doesn't even matter. You can do whatever you want. And um, yeah, it's very, it's very liberating, to say the least, and uh, a fun experience. But... Like I said, it's um, it can go awry, and there's lots of different creator stories that I was highly aware of, and there are certain sort of precautions I try to take to uh, mitigate that sort of thing, as in keeping good friendships strong, making sure to keep family ties strong, and uh, making sure you take your, your breaks where you need them. And socializing is a big deal, uh, especially with an online creator, because you can easily get caught in your own literal personal bubble that that just uh, prevents you from sort of. Uh, you, you get locked into that hobby and then it turns into a nightmare as you try to avoid that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think that that's a really big thing for people that, uh, you know, just, just watch content and then they, they want to be, you know, a content creator. And so they, they try and then uh, they find out after a while, like it, it, it does take a lot of work and, you know, sometimes you get, crazy people that don't like that you said you didn't like a movie and they uh, make it their <laughs> life's work it almost seems like to uh, make sure everyone knows how much they did not like that you did not like that movie and not a lot of people can handle that and so when people can yeah. like you know it I think that's what puts uh, you know people that have been doing this for you know years even decades here on youtube it's because you really have to mentally prepare yourself for that kind of stress so how how do you do that so how do i uh like how to follow up with the the little bit of the question like how uh you know because you said you uh were aware of that kind of stuff how how do you uh i keep yourself sane i guess well, like I said, uh, the, the big one for me is the social part. Make sure you hang out with people who are like-minded, just enjoy, sort of uh, consume content with them. Um, and then family connections, got to keep them strong and uh, and and just, you know, get into involved in communities. Make sure you don't, I would say, don't lock yourself off into becoming the creator instead of uh, the viewer as well. Just try and, and that'll keep you in touch with uh, sort of everything that's happening in terms of POV. But um, friends and family, and uh, healthy amounts of time spread between what is obviously the work and and the play, and then maybe just relax. It's uh, and there's so many different stories of so many different creators who have crashed and burned, and it's just like you try and sort of find lessons in some of what they do. But um, some of it's unavoidable. A lot of people experience a lot of mental illness as a result of what is a nightmare online, like uh, the stuff that happened with. Jenny Nicholson's fan base, for example, it's like I could see that uh, not being fun for a lot of people to have to deal with. That was just days of bombardment about being the worst person ever. And, uh, you know, like like there's no presence on Twitter for EFAP outside of me because Rags is, is uh, he, he was banned, I think, before I'd met him. So um, he doesn't <laughs> care. And so I was like, well, I got to gotta try and get, you know, some kind of voice in here because we, we were even covered by, um, was it the editor of the Washington Post? I was just like, geez. How does this even happen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, you know, to this day, they still repost that uh, eleven-hour misogynist stream, <laughs> and, and every time I'm just like, I'm just hoping there's that one comment that's like, you know, it's not even that bad. <laughs> it's, it's like it, it, no, it's, it's a nightmare, but you know. Everyone that I see that defends you, they're like the first thing they say, "Did you watch it?" I'm not gonna watch eleven hours. It's like, well, then how do you know it's eleven hours of misogyny? Yeah, and. I, uh, <laughs> You know, she says some really crazy things about Joker, and uh, it just gets oh overshadowed. God. I, 
I, I was painting when I was watching or like listening to that, I should say. And I just, I, I don't watch her videos uh, to begin <laughs> with. So listening to that, I was like, wait, what? Seven medications. That means he could die. Like <laughs> <laughs> what? Like, uh, I think was, I remember, was that a, was that a movie Bob one? She, Cause I, she might. Oh, maybe she that was a movie Bob one. She said she something else. Yeah. Oh, she's. Uh, what, one of the many ones she had was like, uh, why would the going out of sale guy care that his going out of sale side was destroyed? It was a really, really weird comment. It was like, I don't know, because he's going out of sale. Well, doesn't, uh, that thing, oh, that gets me. So I, I display, you know, my I do a show where I display my paintings at like conventions. It costs, you know, a pretty penny to get signs made like that. So yeah, if he's going out of business and he had that sign customly made, especially with how big it was and that it was printed on both sides, you're looking at easily 300 bucks for that, you know? And he probably wanted to resell it, but I think it Absolutely. actually was on wood, you know? So it would make sense. He wanted his going out of sale sign for the next clown since this clown got jumped, you know? And um, yeah, and she was she was coming on like how people aren't that cartoonishly mean in real life, in uh, uh, you know at late hours of night in a in a rundown city in the subway. It's like yeah, you're not going to find any scary yeah, characters there. True. Yeah, it was for me. The, a lot of it was just like man, she just needs a little more experience in those I regards. Think she's a very sheltered person because even because uh, I, I checked it because she and I live in the same area and how she said she went and watched it at a in a car at a drive-in and me and my best friend are like where the hell is the Joker being shown at a drive-in and we looked at it like no no oh, that, that yeah because it was all in favor of her saying that she was trying to protect herself from getting shot right that was what she said <laughs> and we yeah. were like Guns, guns can get through cars. And her response to that was, she would run over the person before they could shoot her. Yeah. What a strange interaction, you know. <laughs> this <laughs> is I, it's sheltered. Some some people just don't get it, and uh, there's um there's this like psychological thing that uh, they use um, to describe how people deal with fear. Are you gonna run? Are you gonna scream? Or are you gonna freeze? I feel like she's probably either the freeze or the run type of person. I, I'm leaning more towards freeze because if you uh, don't know how to handle these kind of things, especially if you're going to proclaim your ignorance uh, about this, it's like, ugh, you're not going to be able to handle that. Like not knowing that bullets very easily go through cars. Like, do you not know who Bonnie and Clyde are and what happened there? And that was back when cars were actually made of metal, not plastic. <laughs> and, and, yeah, so – that whole thing and there's, there's there's loads more that comes and black panther was obviously another example it's just like these sorts of things can really run you down as a creator and you don't get this in um retail jobs well i guess you can you have different forms of it i suppose but when you can have as much as tens of thousands of people uh and i know that you've experienced plenty of this as well it's just oh. it, it's it's quite a thing and um yeah a lot of people might might refer to it as like a mental fortitude but it, it is often just tied to the uh how much you get and that everyone's got like limits and it's uh, it can be very frustrating you got to be really careful and then you absolutely need that network of friends that can uh, reassure you that it's it's all misunderstandings and uh, well ignorance and anger uh and it comes you know it comes from all sides all over the place and you just you just do your best to sort of uh, remain sane but i think that every youtuber has a degree of like having to deal with a lot of stress from uh, fan bases that cross over and you know, like if you get any kind of coverage from someone who has millions, it's like you, especially as a smaller channel, you can get swamped and you just have to turn the internet off for a little bit. <laughs> it's like, oh well, it was uh, it was nice. You just got to clean it out. Oh yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm more prepared to handle it now. But the the first time that I got it, it wasn't even on a video. I uh, posted a tweet because you know, Twitter is such a happy, fun, nice, uh, yes, kumbaya place. And I posted a picture of this creepy Raylo art. And I even said, I, it was one sentence. It was very, I, I thought it was very specific, but apparently it was so vague, people lost their shit. But it was um, an artist that showed Ray and Kylo Ren in, uh, without uh, clothing on and then the next, like engaging in uh, adult activities. And then the next picture was showing them at like 13 and 15 like with their ages next to them. And I said, uh, I'm 
actually a very big fan of this artist. Like I like their work, but this is disturbing, which equated to her. And this is the argument that they used. Uh, that Star Wars girl has 18,000 followers. I only have 1,000 followers on Twitter. She is attacking me and she is stealing my artwork. And I'm like, your, your, your name was in the, the, the yeah. video, you know? And so I just got bombarded for days and I'm just like, but I'm not stealing your artwork. And at that point I was like, this is either a very, very uneducated people or it's just, it's, because the arguments that they were making, it, it's this doesn't even make sense the way that you're arguing, but it was nonstop. So that was kind of my first experience with it. And again, that wasn't even on YouTube. That was just about a Twitter post. So when stuff happens with videos, I'm very much like, all right, um, if you're not, if this isn't something that I think the person would say it to my face, I just kind of, you know, just laugh sometimes. You know. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a good way to sort of deal with a lot of this is to highlight it and just be like, look how funny this is, and then everyone laughs along with it, and you're just like, yeah, they are, they're, they're, they're clowns a lot of the time. They're not there to actually hurt. They're just there to be laughed at because uh, a lot of it is so ridiculous. Like the amount of different people have told me what my politics are. You know, I'm just like, <laughs> oh, interesting. Oh, I know. That's why when I got so mad when I saw all the stuff with Jenny Nicholson, because I'm like, none of you guys watched it. I was like, none of you watched that episode. And I so I did a stream to talk about it. And I'm just like, I've been watching the show for a long time. Never have any of the guys said anything misogynistic. No, nothing that you guys are claiming is even true. And, you know, do, do they listen? Absolutely not. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. And it, it's at that point, it's like, well, if you're not going to make valid enough arguments, if you're not going to go and do the research, then why should I take your argument seriously? You know? That's yeah. And, uh, and they, they did pull out that one comment from, I think it was either Rags or Wolf, where they said, she, she looks like a creepy android that might stab you. And it was like, oh my <laughs> goodness. And that crossed the line, as we all know, across all of the coverage, that was the thing. It doesn't matter how many different arguments we try to approach and understand and counter in many different ways. You Commenting, and, and that got conflated to comments from me as well. I was like, all I think I said was that she was overexposed. I don't know if that's like a misogynist thing to say. <laughs> I no, I mean, you can clearly see by how bright her light was. I think Rags was the one that commented on that. Like, it's so bright and she's already pale as it is that having, you know, a white background with a blurring light in your face to where you can only see, uh, you know, your hair and your eyes. It's a way that women uh, do it. So that way you don't see like the flaws in their face. So sometimes I know a lot of uh, girl streamers, they'll turn their light, their brightness up if they don't want to do their makeup because it makes their face look uh, kind of more clear, I guess, is the mm -hmm. word. And so they just put on, you know, thicker eyeliner. And so it kind of balances out the overexposure but it's a little trick so that way you can get away with doing less but the way that she had it it was like i i hope that she just started filming and she didn't realize her settings were off like, well, like, I don't even, like even if someone was to just be like oh i, I find that unattractive i'd be like oh is that is that misogyny i don't know yeah, i didn't know I, that's how that worked yeah but I mean, Rags had a good point, though. He's just like, yeah, her light is way too bright. When you're when this is your professional job and you can't, you know, have your stuff right, that would be like as if you didn't have your microphone settings right. So every, you know, a couple of seconds you would hear, you know, mm. like it's it's unprofessional. And I well, think either, either way, like, you know, if I was trying to have some fun, it's not like we we're in a sterile response to everything. I'd be like, yeah, you're going to find some some jabs in there. But I don't see that that equates to basically like tantamount to being monsters. I just, I find it a little bit ridiculous. Yeah. Well, th that's what happens when people take things out of context and they don't even attempt to watch everything through to hear the context behind what you guys are talking about. It's okay though. All of us fans of EFAP, we know. <laughs> we know. <laughs> but we focus on that question for a uh, a while now. I don't even know what question was that one based off of that. Is, that has very much evolved. Uh, okay, here we go. We're back. I think that question was, how did it feel to quit your real life job? All right, here we go. Next question. Go, I guess. <laughs> very much. <laughs> uh, how did your friends and family react to you telling them what you do? 
So uh, they didn't. They, I don't think they did, and still don't understand how it works. They're just like, so you make videos. And I'm like, yes. It's like I, I review stuff, and they're like, uh huh. And how how is it that where's where's where is that a job? How is that? How do you get paid? It's like <laughs> ads, and then support from donations. And they were just like, really? It's like, yeah. They're like because you talk about the movies. It's like yes. It's like I don't. And um, at my sister's wedding. Um, one of uh, a, a little bit more of a distant family member was like, "I've heard you. Um, you have a job now. What do you? What? what but it's on the internet." And I was like, "Yeah." He was just like, "What? How does that work?" And I was like, "So you know, like just talking about movies and stuff, but you, you do that, but like online." He was just like, "I don't understand." And I was like, "I know." And it's just, trying to translate is impossibly hard. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, there's different generations and stuff so it's uh yeah you just sort of try and say like it's uh it's 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 a very simple process of people like to see this stuff and they would would pay to have you create it it's a there's a job that was essentially created out of the people just uh playing with different programs that got in you know created online and uh if you were to actually explain exactly how it works it probably would be extremely complicated actually like how it all came to be youtube and content creation and ads Oh, yeah, I mean, I try at Christmas the past couple of years. They're like, so are you still doing that? And they're like, explain to us. And it's like, you want me to explain how like upload, like editing, uploading, <laughs> how that entire works. And they're like, yeah. And I was like, all right, let me do this. And you can just watch as their eyes glaze over because they you've lost them. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. You, you, you do sort of make concessions. You're like, I, yeah, I, I know I shouldn't explain it because they're just probably going to nod the whole time. Just be like, totally understand what you're saying not at all i had to explain uh not even that long ago what google was to one of my uh my <laughs> aunties so yeah trying to explain this is, is pretty much impossible but they do sort of just hand waves like oh yes you kids with your your modern your, your computers and it's like yep yep <laughs> <laughs> no, I was uh, visiting my dad and I was on my phone and he just like looks over and he's like, so can you go on the internet with that thing? And I was like, dad, you have an <laughs> iPhone. <laughs> The internet is a scary and complicated place. Uh, so do any of your family, have they, like, have any of them seen your videos? Yes. Uh, some of them have, and uh, they find them very entertaining. And then so, some of them catch, uh, one of my sisters caught um, an EFAP episode, and they were very, they happened to catch uh voxus reading out one of his fabled stories oh god and i was just like of all of the things you could have tuned into on EFAP, that's what you got and they were like yeah it's a, it's a very it's a very strange show and i was like it's okay you, you can say that that was terrifying it's fine oh, i remember the first time uh, i ever went on EFAP was for your 50th and the first 45 minutes is him reading the the gay unicorn story and i was like you gotta be kidding me I couldn't believe how long it went on for and how well he, he delivered it throughout. It was amazing. It, it was a very good delivery, but uh, it, it didn't do anything for me, per se. Oh, yeah. That was, it was definitely, um, you know, everybody in the chat was was either loving it or hating it or doesn't know how to feel. <laughs> it's like very confused. <laughs> At that point, I had already been awake for 24 hours. And so I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump on like for like an hour or so before I go to mm. sleep. And then I was like, I jumped on in the wrong part. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, that, that's funny that that was what your sister has seen. Did did they give you any uh, feedback on your your videos? Oh, they're all very very supportive, and uh, I think they they're mostly confused as to how it all even works. So they're just like, yeah, keep it up, keep going, keep doing it. And um, you know, they know it takes up a lot of uh, time, but they just uh, I guess they're just very happy that there's something I can do that's not as like in the different stories I would always come back with from the toy store I worked at or um, the IT support place I worked at, they would always be like, you don't sound that happy. And I'd be like, not really, <laughs> not really. Yeah, I think when I finally quit, uh, like, because I've always done freelance, but I had a job just so I could keep uh, the perks of said job. And it was so satisfying to tell like my cunt of a manager, like, oh, I'm leaving. It was great. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, was there ever a time where you censored your script and after the fact wish you hadn't? I don't think so. I, uh, it's very rare that I would ever censor a script uh, at all. Um, it. Like if you wanted to tell a joke, but you're like, oh, maybe that's a little too far. You know, maybe I should. Um, I did. Uh, there was some what I would call fun insults in the 
the DS2 series I did originally, and then on a redraft, I decided to pull any and all of them out because I realized from the Soma one that if you throw in any insults, people will try and use it to ignore your arguments. And of course, mm -hmm. someone might be like, well, you still do that on EFAP. I'd be like, oh yeah, in a live setting, I'm, I want to have fun with my friends. So if I'm not allowed to just throw in random jabs back and forth, we jab at each other all the time. Like oh, yeah. I can't really be myself. But in a script, if I've got, you know, point, point, point ends with idiot, on a redraft, I can just cut the idiot part out. It's like, yeah, that's fine. It doesn't really bother me. Um, but I suppose that could kind of count. Okay. There we go. Um, what video did you most enjoy making, or which are you proudest of if they're not the same? Um, ooh. So I know that the one that I'm proudest of right now is the Game of Thrones Episode 5 one. That one took a really long time. And uh, I really liked the editing in it uh, when I saw it sort of completed. And uh, Cynic Snacks' animations I really liked. Um, <clears throat> and just I felt like, weirdly, I got a, a hell of a lot of my concerns about Season 8 out in that episode. Even though there's more to come for, for another episode. It's just that um, it was really long. And it worked out really well. And I was, I was just really happy with it. Uh, Funnest one to make, though, because that one, I don't know if I'd describe some of these as fun. A lot of them are very painstaking to get everything in. Um, it's obviously fun once you get to post and then see how uh, what people think and stuff. Yeah. But um, possibly the TLJ critique, because uh, I was I was very, that was really exciting. I was really enjoying the, um, I remember when I put out part two, I was like, I have to get part three out because that's just, that's how it works. You can't possibly break the, the rule of being like, there's a part two, it's got to be part three. And so I was like rushing the crap out of it and um, collecting points as I was going and trying to get them in and make sure the script still matched and getting all the editing sort of sorted out. It was a very uh, topsy-turvy crazy time. And I remember it was, it was like for a week I was sleeping very little to get it done. Um, so I don't know. I, I guess you call that fun. <laughs> it was exciting, <laughs> at least. I would say EFAP is a lot more of a, the fun experience. It's, it's a lot more uh, calmo and... You, you get well, to, that's your hanging with your friends and talking yeah. about things that you're interested in. As far as like, I'm doing air quotes right now. You can't see me working, you know, with, on those videos. Like, you know, when you like kind of how you said you getting very little sleep, it's like you can't sleep because you're you're so amped up to get this done, you know. Kind mm -hmm. of thing. So was that the feeling you had with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, they're all it's I would probably want to break it apart in terms of like there's lots of fun parts and then lots of uh, not as fun parts. And it was kind of like what we talked about earlier with there are certain edits or pieces where I put them in, and I check them and I'm like, oh, that was really engaging and fun. And then others where it's like a stretch of a minute of explanation of things that happen. And I'm just like, it's going to take me like 20 minutes to get this one sorted. And it's going to be really boring. <laughs> And this is actually perfect. I'll lead into the next question. What video did you least enjoy making and which are you least proud of if they're not the same? Uh, least proud of the probably the first one. Uh, I like that it represents the beginning. It's just there's lots of things I find with it that I'd, uh, I would be very critical like of. Day or um, Force Awakens. Oh, I, I mean for the uh, Machine for Pigs, the reviews. Oh, the very <laughs> first video. Okay. Um, but least enjoy making. Um, it could be the current one, the TFA part three, and not not for any other reason than it's taken a lot longer than I would have preferred. It's it's to get everything the way I want it. It's uh, it's been frustrating that like I look at the clock and I'm like, man, I've been working for ages, and then I'm like, I'm not even you know X amount of the way through it yet. Like it feels like I'm getting less returns, but um, similarly, it's some of the tightest work I've done. So you know, it's a trade off, but uh, it can definitely be classified as. A lack of fun when you're you have a, many people asking what could possibly be taking so long, and you know you spend like an hour doing this edit that ends up getting binned because you didn't like the way it ended up, and so it almost counts as wasting time. And you know it, it's uh, it's only building up more and more frustration. But I I'm sure people will be happy when I finally get to release it. And as long as um you know I keep sort of reassuring people that it's coming along, I figure it'll be fine. It's just uh. Yeah, it can be a it can be a, la a sapping of fun as an experience when uh, it goes over the expected time that you uh, wanted to complete within. And then this can follow up. Uh, what video has been the, taking you the longest to make? That'll be TFA long? Part Three, I think. Yeah. How long it, have you been working on it? So it was the it was the end of December. Obviously, that started working on the Tross One. That came out, I think, the beginning 
of February or was it the end of February? Either way, then it was the April Fool's videos and uh, basically between all of that stuff, even I think in November, I had already started working on TFA part three. It was the long project in the background that I keep kept working on in, in, as much as I could between the what you could call smaller projects uh, coming up. And now it's just been nothing but that for ever since um, I'd finished the April Fool's videos. And uh, those had to be redrafted once uh, TLJ, no, TROS came out, um, like the higher quality version. Um, and so that, that still took a few days out, but it's just been every day, it's just been editing that video now. And it feels like I've been doing it since November, almost full time, you know, like as it, it's not actually this, but it feels like I've been working on it for half a year and it's just not finished yet. And so that's part of what makes it feel so frustrating. But um, you do have to reassure yourself and remind sort of yourself of the schedule and how everything turned out. Cause um, there are some people who probably want to make the claim. That's like, he hasn't made this for over a year now. And it's like, well, there's a lot of videos I've made in between them. That's the thing. Like, I got very distracted with Game of Thrones, as a lot of people did. That was very disappointing. And, um, of course, TROS was a huge bump because it changes a lot of TFA. Like, I don't know if you've rewatched TFA anytime recently, but after TROS, a lot of scenes become almost more interesting because of how much they've screwed with it again. I guess JJ didn't care about TFA at the point of making TROS. But, you know, the idea that Kylo was entirely motivated by Palpatine in his mask. It's just like, oh, and he doesn't seem to care about that once he's revealed it. Uh, but it doesn't explain where Darth Vader's been this whole time, or rather Anakin, not helping his family whatsoever, as the Force goes. Hey, you know, that's, that's all. You know, this this all had to be addressed because um, where I had questions in my script, they've now become answers, and I have to address them accordingly. So it was a redraft um, again. And so, yeah, it's all on the way. Um, and I just wish it would be faster. And obviously, there's an idea of um, looking into maybe getting an editor. But the thing is, like, I already do. And they're working on EFAP stuff. That's the idea. I get to work on main channel stuff. So it's like maybe a second editor. <laughs> it's just like it oh just keeps God. going. It's going to turn into your own little business. Uh, so that way your videos can get out faster. I mean, that's the, that's the thing, though. I feel like I might lose my flair if I have someone else edit, you know? Yeah. That's, that's my big thing. It's like some, and you can really tell when a uh, channel that you've been watching as they grow and then they stop making the edits and it's like, there, there's something about it. That's not the same because only you know what you're thinking, and what you truly meant in that moment. And so yeah. for you to put that little edit in it, it, I don't know. I feel like it will have more of an impact than if somebody you give them notes and you're like, okay, do like make it look like this. And then maybe they don't know exactly what you meant at that moment. And when you're editing that, you can make it perfectly match to your tone of voice and what you meant in the moment as compared to someone else. Yeah, I agree with that. Like this, this that's the worry. Well, uh, I think you're doing great so far. Uh, don't, don't kill yourself, uh, doing these, but, uh, I'm looking at my watch going, is it going to come out? <laughs> I swear to God, I will beat Winds of Winter with TFA Part 3, okay? It's going to happen. Well, uh, to get on to the, the next little section, so uh, how I do this is I have, uh, we those were all content-based questions. Now we're going to go into show-based questions, and then we'll make our way back to content, mm. or uh, process, process of content making. Uh, we will get back to that. But so now this next question, uh, what is EFAP and what inspired it for those that do not know? Um, so for the longest time, friends and I would uh, be like, ooh, one of our favorite content creators, be it, you know, wh whoever has made a video that we both watched. Do you want to watch it at the same time while we do whatever? And it's like, yeah, sure. We put it in the watch together. And then, you know, sometimes one of your favorites makes one that you find disagreeable and then you can pause and talk about it. And then maybe you go, hey, let's check out something from Movie Bob. Let's see what he's talking about. He's got an opinion on the newest, you know, whatever. And you end up pausing a lot and talking a lot. And then uh, I remember a friend of mine, I used to do it a lot with years back. We were like, you'd think someone could make a show out of this. And my concern was always copyright. I was like, I think that people would... Uh, would just take down the streams immediately because you're repurposing their content or whatever. And I'm sure that's how it would work. And so I just never tried it. And uh, upon meeting Rags, I found that like it was one of the first times I was hanging out with him, he offered to do that. He was like, do you want to watch blah, blah, blah at the same time? And I was like, oh my God, you do that too? Like I thought I was one of the people 
who did that. He's like, no. And then um, Wolf invited me onto his podcast where they did that. That was the thing of their podcast. And I was like, oh my god, everybody's this isn't not this is not a novel idea at all. Um, but Wolf's was more inspired by drunken peasants, and he liked to look at uh, just funny videos or crazy people videos and stuff. Um, I can't remember if he did politics or not, but I was more thinking, no, I want to go for like the the the, the video essays, the uh, the intellectuals of the internet, the ones who are beyond scrutiny, the ones who absolutely should be left alone because it's all entirely opinion. I was like, no, nah, they get stuff wrong. They get stuff wrong a lot, and they often have very silly things in their videos. And one of the biggest inspiring creators for me to want to try this was Dabwood Thrust. I was blown away by Dabwood Thrust. I would watch his videos and be like, this can't be real. How is this happening? <laughs> and, um, very, very popular, or at least uh, you know, relatively popular. And so the I was like, I think we were supposed to be doing a podcast with Rags um, on his channel, and he couldn't stream that day. Someone was screwing up, and I was just like, okay, I guess um, you know, we could do it on my channel, because uh, Wolf didn't want to do it, and then we were just together. We, we watched a Jared Genesis and Down With Thrust video, I think, and then yep. people were like, please do this again. And we were like, well, what else should we cover? And uh, it was, it, it might actually be the reason it, it just managed to hit the ground running was um, Patrick Willems released his his plot holes, shut up about plot holes video so soon after that. And I was like, oh my God, can we? Can we watch that one and uh, respond to it? I think it, it took us, I, I want to say three hours, maybe four for his whole video. I don't know. And uh, it was just a lot of fun because it was exactly what I was kind of looking to create the whole time, inspired directly by uh, different podcasts like Drunken Peasants and ran by three people who liked to do it in their leisure time anyway. And it was mainly to have fun, meme around, while also having a couple of uh, discussions about you know, the accuracy of the videos and the discussion around the content itself. Yeah, and I mean, those first few episodes are so much fun. Like, I remember watching them because the first one I saw was Rhino Milk, and then I was like, I got to go back to the beginning. And I just remember <laughs> I was, I fell, like, I, I almost, like, fell out of my chair because my stomach was, like, I, I just couldn't stop laughing when Rags points out. He's just like, does he just have action figures glued to his mouth? <laughs> He's like, why does he have a skeleton? <laughs> and it's just like, wouldn't you clean your room before doing a, like a podcast? And oh, it was just so funny. And then I remember when I think Wolf says it when you guys cover Patrick Willems, it's like, wow, we've been going for four hours. This is a long like stream. And it's like, I know that it, what it had gotten to at that point. So I was yeah. like, you don't even know. You guys are, it's like, oh, you guys are all so little here. You don't even know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, well, we did the yesterday's podcast for 10 hours, and someone was like, short. And I was like, we've, this is wrong. <laughs> it shouldn't be considered short at 10. Once upon a time, EFAP was around four to five hours. Those were the days. Well, I mean, it makes sense for what you guys are doing, because if you're going to break down a video, it's like, yeah, pausing every other time somebody makes a ridiculous point and uh, to discuss said ridiculous point. Yeah, and uh, it, the, the logic is always it takes as long as it takes. That was the, the DS2 logic when I made that. I was like, this series is going to be like 10 hours. I was like, is that is that really what I'm looking at here? And then I realized like those arbitrary... So Because a lot of people who don't like my work are like, the, he's the reason they have essay word limits. And I was just like, I mean, depends on what the point of the essay is, I guess, right? If I'm responding, if I'm responding to a sentence, it's probably going to be a shorter essay than responding to another essay. And what about an essay that responds to an essay that responds to an essay? Well, what it, that depends on the sentence. What if the sentence is, what is the meaning of life? Versus how many beans are in the can. <laughs> like, well, probably get the answer pretty quickly on that, on that latter one. But the former one, yeah, you could, you could go on forever because there's lots of things to cover. Yeah, and it, it depends on the person. It depends on, you know, especially when it's like the Patrick Willems one. And I remember that one very clearly, the points he was making. And it's like, wait, wait, what? You're Because you're saying this unironically. Like, let, let's expand upon that and go through every possibility because you are saying it like it's an absolute fact and not an opinion. And I well, think that was, that's kind of where you yeah. got people, your objective versus... That, that was the interesting thing because uh, covering... Downward thrust. Nobody, I don't think anyone was a, was a real passionate fan of his channel, so they were, they were just been like, oh, okay. And Jared Genesis was very funny. Covering Patrick was like, whoa, Patrick's like an established, you know, video essayist, intellectual, uh, taught in film school kind of guy. You can, what are you doing? You can't be doing this. That's his opinion. As far as I'm concerned, he threw the first punch. He was like, people who talk about plot holes are 
don't even watch movies correctly. I was just like, wow, that's bold. <laughs> like, if you want to take that statement, because, you know, we've said since the beginning, it's like, that's not even something that we would say, like, that you can watch a movie wrong. It's a very interesting idea on its own. Yeah, just when people were like that, because I didn't even know that about him, because uh, I didn't know who Patrick Mullen was until I watched EFAF, and I was like, uh, this makes sense as to why I did not know who he is, because in my personal opinion, he just comes off as like a, a very, um, very pompous. Very like, big brain. My my thing is the end all be all. And it's like, I, I don't get enjoyment watching people like that because it's like I went to film school, too. So it's like I have a degree. I can rub it in his face if he wants uh, to say, you know, oh, well, you didn't go to film school. You cannot argue with me kind of thing. It's like, well, I can. Uh, but there is no way, shape, or form you can watch a movie wrong. You know, that like, that's an opinion you can't. Well, it's, it's one of those weird statements where I'm just like, I don't even know that it's possible. Like, it's, it's yeah, exactly. That, that's what I say, exactly. like, watching a movie without seeing it, like, blind or something, I'd just be like, that's just, I don't even, that's just... <laughs> taking it to extremes, I guess, to, to try to answer that question. But the idea, yeah, the idea that you focus on things that make sense and that is considered watching it wrong, it's like, huh. Well, it's Again, one of those old. Things, like uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. So it's like you and I can look at the same, like let, let's say we're looking at a painting and it's like, what's your favorite thing about that painting? There's a higher chance that you and I are going to say different things than we're saying the same thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And so watching a movie and saying that, oh, you're watching it wrong. It's like, there's no way to watch a movie wrong. You can say, oh, well, you know, maybe an opinion is wrong, but that's just your opinion on somebody else's opinion. So that video kind of did it for me is blowing my mind that there is actually people out there like that and kind of more of an introduction. Because even that was earlier on when I started out on YouTube when I watched that. But and that kind of I liked the first one that I saw. And I, then I liked the, the funny one with Jared. Then watching that, I was like, <laughs> this is a good show. I like these guys breaking things down. And so to see it evolve the way it did, it's like, this is why I always tell people, I'm like, yeah, it's long, but then it's it's the perfect thing for your day, you know, because at least for me, because I'm painting and I just have it on in the background. And I'm like, yes, yes. Yeah, that's what I've, I've always loved to hear is that it can, it can just be good for moving time along for people who are doing maybe tough things, tedious things, or just things that take a long time. It's just like, yeah, we'll happily be company for you if you're finding that you're looking for some like because you know time can fly pretty fast without even realizing it um i mean we certainly find that on efap we can be like oh wow we're at the 10 hour mark again <laughs> well, like oh shoot we're gonna have to do another separate stream for super chance <laughs> uh but no uh i was watching one of them i think it was the one right before the toy story 4 one and i was cooking and my stepdaughter she's just like what is his voice? It's weird. And then she looked at like the picture and she's like, there's a doggy and a robot talking. <laughs> she's nine. But I think you guys were talking about like the Mandalorian or something. And she's like, they're talking about baby Yoda. And I'm like, yes, yes. Just, this is the show that I watch. And she's like, why do you watch it? And I'm like, cause it's funny. Cause it's funny. But like having a child's perspective on what you guys are talking about. I was like, this is, this is a hard thing to explain. But uh, moving on to the next question, because this is uh, one I have been waiting to ask you. And guys, we're only on question 17. Let that sink in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is it hard for you to remain unbiased when you have a guest you completely disagree with? Completely disagree with? I guess, um, well, I'm trying to think of what the closest to that would be. Maybe, I guess, people like um, Major Lee or Yezin. Um, Those are the ones I was thinking right now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, I, I mean, I just try and stick to the definitive portions of the argument, right? It's very hard to be unbiased completely about anything. It's, um, I completely agree with, with the idea that we're all human and that it's, uh, it's tough to avoid it. But simultaneously, there's a lot of statements, questions, and conclusions that get made that, that are just, it's very hard to even point out a sense of bias whatsoever. So, um, yeah, like you try your best to, to remain unbiased and uh, civil and professional, but at some points you're just like, Wow, you liked season eight of Game of Thrones, <laughs> and you just like get blown away, especially with the the comment about um the world being better off with Daenerys than not after what she did in King's Landing. It's uh, fascinating. Uh, 
Well, even in that one, like I, I was just getting pissed by how much, uh, he was talking over you and Gary and like, I, I just, I cannot stand rude people. Like that's something that irks my soul to my very core is if you're coming over in a way, coming onto somebody's channel is like going into somebody's house. If you're a guest in someone's house, you can disagree with them, but do it respectfully. And he said something to Gary that if it was on my channel, I would have snapped. In, yeah, in it, it was difficult to remain patient. Uh, there was that part of the episode, I can't remember when, but um, he just wouldn't let me talk. <laughs> I was like, this is uh, it's getting to the point. He was the only person I've ever almost muted on EFAP because I don't like to get to that point. But I was just like, you can't, you can't get to the point where the host isn't allowed to speak. That's a very weird sort of scenario for a podcast, you know? Yeah, that, that, because there's a few that it's just the major Lee one, it, it's painful to watch. It's like, I feel like I'm losing IQ points. But with that one, it was like, I'm about to, you know, go into full on Hulk rage mode. It's <laughs> making me angry. But uh, that, that's why I say it's like, if uh, out of all the qualities of a Jedi, you have definitely mastered patience. Uh, but is it that just because you're trying to remain as unbiased as possible? Um. Well, I would say being British is probably a part of it. Uh, we're known for being very good at queuing. Um, What's the so, so just like queuing up for stuff, just waiting for something to happen. As long oh. as we just need to be told it's on the way, and we'll be like, very well, we will stay. Uh, I don't know where we gained this as an ability, but it's in all of our blood. It's definitely a thing. But it's um, it's definitely tied, I guess, to uh, you want to try and avoid, I guess, ruining um, not only the person's experience while being there. But uh, the viewers experience as well. They don't necessarily want to have to l listen to you sort of uh, harshly rip into somebody when they're, they're desperately trying to just explain themselves. So you just give them every benefit of the doubt that you can. And even at the, at the worst, you still try and just be like, what if what if they, they are very much acting in good faith and they really just can't put across their position as well as um, well as well as you need it to be to understand it. So you do your best to... Um, to just work with them, I guess. But you know, it's it's definitely good that I can have a charge up time between EFAPs so that the uh, the patients can be restored because some some of the guests can um, make it difficult. And, uh, yeah, you can you can tell what I'm losing by uh by mind because I'll I'll be uh, wheezing with <laughs> laughter a lot. <laughs> yeah, I I just don't know how you can handle your rage like that because if I I know I couldn't handle that like just being on the other side watching and listening. It's like, ooh, like, I don't know how you don't snap, but uh, maybe that's just, uh, you know, everyone handles things differently. My, my definite uh, quality that I always have to keep under control is that I do have, uh, I do have this rage in me, but uh, <laughs> you, know, you don't seem to have that. It, it's like uh, when something happens, it's like resort to laughter as compared to anger. I find that a lot of the time I might need to act as the uh, the one that can bounce off of that because a lot oh, of my guests right. will definitely have it. Oh, Cecil, he wasn't mad at you. Do you remember Cecil? I do, I do. It was, uh, it was fun discussing episode three of season eight with him. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that was more, because I remember you were kind of trying not to laugh. I think Rags was the one that was getting uh, the more frustration out of that. But, uh, yeah, I didn't mind it was Aria. I just think that it was done terribly. But uh, we, we, we're not to Game of Thrones yet. We're not to that part of this uh, interview yet. Okay, so um, let's see. Next question. Uh, looking back, if there was one episode you could do over again, which would it be? Hmm. One episode of EFAP specifically? Yes. Um... I guess uh, I kind of like the idea of building on any of the ones that have happened before. Like if there, if there was ones that um, I was mistaken in or ones that didn't flow as well as they could have, I would rather like try and make ones on top of it. But um, to redo one, maybe I'm trying to think of maybe one of the debates and maybe structure them stronger um, because a lot of the debate episodes can often uh, be difficult to sort of streamline because the, obviously you're dealing with two opposing views that are, simultaneously trying to understand each other's points while also being convinced by the other. So it, it, there's these, it's almost like two debates at once happening between as much as two and three and four people. 
and so that's something of, of a learning process, trying to get better at understanding uh, the best way to present debates. So yeah, probably maybe one of the debate ones. I would have to think about which uh, which of them. But the more relaxed, uh, responsey ones, most of them go very smoothly, and I'm very uh, very happy with sort of the response. I might even leave it to the fans. Maybe they could decide which one would be uh, the one to repeat. It's hard to know when you're sort of creating them in the moment. Mm -hmm. I, I do that a lot. That's why I, I wanted to ask you that because I always, I get done with doing something and then I think back, I'm reflecting and I'm like, oh, I should have done this or I should have done that. And especially after like A, B and C happen, it's like, ooh, I wish I would have known this like piece of information back when I was doing this because it would have helped whatever it was that I was doing at the time. Uh, but let's uh, let's see uh, what was the next question. Um, out of all of the EFAP nemesis, uh, which would you most like to debate? Out of who? Sorry. All of the nemesis of uh, EFAP. You know the EFAP um, air quote. It's a good question. Uh, like you, that person, one on one debating. So I guess out of the choice, there's a lot of there's a lot of like pros and cons to a lot of them. Like Movie Bob, for example, I find that would be very funny. <laughs> I have a lot of questions to put forward to Mr. Movie Bob uh, about a oh, lot of his so ideas. The food challenge, to... by the way, is not possible. <laughs> no. Oh well. <laughs> Just think of trying to do a large version of what he, you know, like this. He considered that fairly small. <laughs> so yeah. Um. Uh, and then there's like there's there's Quinton. I wouldn't mind picking the brain of all of old Quinton. I'd love to talk to uh, Down with Thrust. That would just be fun. This is what I mean. Like it's it's kind of complicated. It's like uh, I guess the one that I think would be most entertaining versus the one that I would get the most uh, informative experience out of. I don't know. I'd kind of like to. I'd be interested in talking to them all to some degree. Um, you only get one. Oh, so so tough. Pro probably down with thrust. Really? I think, it, I think it would just be a really fun experience because there's just so much um, sourness with with a lot of the uh, the other creators. Because like I already know that I'm very much disliked by a lot of them, um, and so the idea that they jump into a conversation, I have to spend most of it convincing them that I'm not a monster first. And with with down with thrust, I feel like it would just be a really fun conversation. I would happily talk to him about his favorite games and why he likes them so much. Mm, nice right. relaxing. Okay. That was a very civil answer of you. Um, uh, where was I? Uh, will you ever make EFAP merch? Uh, yeah, we, we, we thought about it. We just don't, don't exactly know the best way to go about it or what we would have, but um, it's yeah. always a potential on the cards sort of thing. I think. This is just me going out there. Uh, rem I remember at one point you said like EFAP is in seasons. And so you could have uh, each like have EFAP on the front of the shirt, like a kind of like band, like a tour, like a tour shirt. And so on the back, you would have each uh, like episode and maybe like a little, I don't know, like rags doing something funny, <laughs> like in the background, like, you know, doing his little doggy dance or uh yeah, I don't like the a little rhino and milk emoji next to that episode, or you kind of that's where that lore came from. On the back is if it's a, a concert, like concert tour t shirt, and then on the front it's like EFAP season one. And then you could do like each one for each season. And even like do a special one, how you did um whatchamacallit, the the fiftieth and you did the twenty four hour stream and then have timestamps from when each guest showed up and then like the little icon of each guest. Yeah, um, I, this is the thing. There's, there's so many good ideas. Uh, I, I do like that one as well. It's just that um, execution is sort of just, just a bit of an issue. And uh, of course, me and Rags are often very busy just making stuff in general. And so to get a sort of a set of uh, different uh, pieces of merch that can sort of work with EFAP can be complicated. But we, we definitely, we've discussed it. We, we do want to try and fix something at some point. Um, but yeah, yeah def definitely on board with the idea. <laughs> uh, I'm really big on marketing. So uh, that's why when I see stuff like that, I immediately am like, how much can you market this to be fullest potential possible? And uh, I also like to collect t-shirts. So I have a very big bias on that. And I would love EFAP t-shirts. So uh, cough, cough, when you're done with your next video, uh, get on <laughs> the app. Uh, let's see, uh, next question. Um, explain to us your true feelings about the Dawn, the hero we all deserved, but will never be allowed to shine. 
Sorry, you all said again? <laughs> it's a funny question, which just got destroyed. Uh, explain to us your true feelings about the Don, the hero we all deserve, but will never be allowed to shine. So he's the perfect representation of everything that's wrong with like the writing and <laughs> something like Captain Marvel or, or a lot of modern ideas of, uh, I guess you could call it female characters, but it's a lot of just characters in general where they, they generate the hero and the villainous or antagonist characters and they've got them backwards just by mere presentation. You look at the narrative, you look at all the things that happen, and you're like, wow, you, there's a lot of things we do not know about the Don, and it's very likely he could have, and then you label all these things, and you're like, that could actually be his character. This could actually have happened, and she would have no idea. And as a result, he's become a beloved character in, in the EFAP lore, and I, I hope he's in Captain Marvel 2. I hope he gets his own movie in the MCU, and I hope he can defeat her when she's inevitably going to try and destroy the world. Um, he's a very good guy. <laughs> He would be the person I'd have on uh, on EFAP in a heartbeat. Oh yes, oh yes. When I watched that, that that legal eagle one, like if there was one episode I wish I would have been on with you guys, that was it. Cause how he's just like, oh, this is what from a woman's perspective, and he's attacking her. I'm like, no, he's clearly being nice to her and offering her assistance, and she mugs him and then robs a clothing store. Like, what is this? <laughs> Oh my goodness, but yes, uh, the Don, uh, he is the true hero. Uh, if it was any other movie, I, that was like, I think the way a love interest or a sidekick was uh, to be introduced. He was a good guy. The Don did nothing wrong. Uh, you know, hashtag me too. He got me too uh, in the worst way possible. All right, next question. Uh, what are a few of your favorite EFAP moments? Um, there's a couple. I think the Isle of Man is probably going to be one of my favorites. <laughs> I was the perfect amount of drunk, and I really had not experienced that flag before or thought about why it would exist. So that's it's definitely up there. Uh, Rags reacting to the Ocean Man meme. That was <laughs> something of a wonder. Uh, there's obviously the finding out Patrick Willard's favorite part of TLJ was the, uh, was the milking scene or whatever he said that. Oh. I think that's like episode three. Or it's one of the earlier ones. It was it was surprising. Uh, oh, there's, there's there's lots. I mean, even the last episode we just did, like there was there was loads of uh, funny highlights with different things that get discussed. Uh, but th those are the ones that immediately come to mind. There's there's uh, there's a lot of channels that make little um, sort of super cuts, and there's there's some things that I'll I'll be like check out on some of them, and I'll just be like, oh my god, I completely forgot this even happened, you know. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, discovering Interlocutal was was because uh, it was on screen for a decent chunk of time before it was pointed out to me, and it kind of blew my mind. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, probably Isle of Man. I, I mean, if I had to pick one, gun to my head. Yeah, I watched that one live, and I was like, "What is this?" And because I wasn't looking <laughs> at the screen, I was just listening to you guys, and I was like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> oh my god, that was a that was a really fun episode. Uh, all right, it's good to good to hear that one. Uh, let's see. Uh, currently, with your EFAP minis, you've been watching bad shows like Batwoman. Uh, would you ever do them to shows you haven't seen but that are highly praised, like Avatar: The Last Airbender? Wait, did you? Did you? Uh, so, so, sorry, the first half. I, I think I misunderstood. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> so you've uh, your little EFAP minis where you watch Batwoman. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Would I do it for, you you do it to like air quote bad shows. Would you ever do that? Like you and Rags with uh, like a good show like Avatar the Last so Airbender? We actually uh recorded watching Mandalorian episode one just in case it could work. And what we found was because we actually quite liked uh the first episode of Mandalorian was we just didn't really talk throughout most of it and then toward the end it was only a quick discussion about some of the things we liked, and I just realized like oh that won't that won't work. But mm -hmm. If we were to deliberately try and make something of a like a format where we could uh, go episode by episode, maybe a, maybe another channel where it's just uploaded, um, we watch one episode per week or something and talk about it. Like, I feel like that could work. But Batwoman, it was a very specific kind of show that works really well with uh, that sort of <laughs> format. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Atla wouldn't work very well because uh, Rags and I are not a fan of it, unfortunately. Get off. <laughs> <laughs> How much have you seen? I've seen all of it. You don't like it? I'm so sorry. 
What don't you like about it? I um I I find that a lot of the writing is far too convenient, and uh, a lot of things don't How? make a lot of sense to me. How? Well, I've got a convenient video up uh, on on the Moolah channel. It's called uh, Literature Devil, and I discuss Avatar, and I go over uh, a couple of things I just wasn't a huge fan of, but. Ultimately, I, I would probably need to rewatch the show in order to have a, a good, strong conversation about it. Unfortunately, I, I just didn't, it didn't uh, hit me in the heart very much, so I didn't care too much after I'd seen the full thing. I was just like, well, that was it. All right, then. Um, it also doesn't help that I don't think it ends uh, very well at all. Like, those last few episodes were actually uh, really disappointing. And I found that talking to different fans, that that was a, a partially shared sentiment. Like, um, just for example, the energy bending being brought in so late um, before the final battle, when you know, there's lots, there's lots of just elements um, that, that were a little frustrating slash disappointing. But um, you know, we're all very different people with lots of different perspectives. It's okay. <laughs> we can't be friends anymore. I'm so um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> how, how how dare you? Uh, Ha, have you seen the M. Night Shyamalan movie that should not exist? No, I haven't seen that. I've been told that's uh, something to very much avoid. Um, I think that if you... Uh, it, it makes Batwoman look like an Oscar-worthy masterpiece. Oh, wow. <laughs> that'll, that'll be good for Batwoman. So, I, I would, if you want to do one of your... Uh, EFAP uh, mini movies to that. Uh, I th I would highly recommend it. It would be good content. Uh, even if like I don't uh, I don't know how much Rags has seen of it, but uh, there is a certain scene in it that I know Rags would lose his mind. So uh, <laughs> I would I would love to see that. Uh, even if you are wrong about Avatar: The Last Airbender, uh, I will. Um, oh put my feelings aside for that for right now and uh, can continue with uh, the next question. Um, that, that, that hurts my soul really badly, but um, it is what it is. Uh, what is Goodell? <laughs> uh, I mean, you'd have to ask Mupa, the, uh, the creator and founder, but I, I, I suppose I can comment upon the genius. It's a, uh, it's a collective sort of explanation of the deeper thoughts and machinations of, of the world and the gaming world that surrounds it, as well as many of the, just me, how media exposes the world to the, the world in itself. That's, that's what Godelba is in a nutshell. Um, but it gets much more complicated than that when you skim even the surface. <laughs> and Godelba is directly inspired by many greats, such as, you know, like H-Bomber Guy or Just Right, even Movie Bob, down with thrust, all of them are considered the the tutors of uh, Mupa to a degree, and I feel that uh, those videos are possibly the best videos on YouTube. I don't see how you could be beaten; uh, they could be beaten. <laughs> uh, can you tell us how you really feel about themes? About themes? Yes. I love themes. Uh, I love how a piece of work can have across a larger narrative present pieces that like all connect to each other and make an overall point or have a lesson or a message that is thoroughly represented and um, just well thought out. What I hate is when a, a writer is incompetent enough to almost fight their own theme without realizing it and then for fans of it to try and excuse the execution by the presence of the theme alone. Having an idea like you can learn from things when you do them badly is pretty basic. I think most people would actually be able to figure that out even when they were like five years old that when they fall over, they learn to pick themselves back up, which is a nice sentiment, it really is. But uh, certain films have a way of trying, or certain stories have a way of trying to project that message and explore it in different character arcs or overarching storylines. And it all binds it together into one singular point or several, uh, while others, fail to present it in such a amazing manner that they almost present the opposite. And you have characters who are making correct decisions, being punished, and as a result, make the wrong decision and get rewarded. And uh, it's very confusing. <laughs> I like themes. I hate it when they're butchered. <laughs> the themes. <laughs> uh, so your, your 
pretty much uh, known on your channel. And if anyone uh, ever uses these words, everyone is like, you got that from Mahler. So it, it has been deemed that you invented the concept of objectivity and subjectivity. So <laughs> I'm going to ask you a few questions, a subjective one and an objective one. And I'm oh not going to tell you which is which. You're going to have to guess. And so okay. is the audience. So Mahler, what is your favorite movie and why? Um, right now it's a cross between either Terminator 2 or The Prestige. Um, really? The Prestige? Because, yeah, Terminator 2, because I watched that since I was absurdly young. I've always loved Arnold Schwarzenegger as an actor. I find him incredibly fun and charming. And mm -hmm. the film itself is staggeringly strong in loads of different aspects, but um, at the core, extremely heartfelt. And uh, I just adore each of the characters and everything about it. It's, it's a film is quite close to me. Um, Prestige, uh, I first watched it when it came out around 2006 or seven, and uh, forever since rewatching it per like each year, I notice more about how it's constructed and how efficiently it it's, uh, gets the entire story across in what is an extremely complicated sort of um, dynamic uh, delivery of a narrative while also remaining completely understandable and um, rewarding for a second viewing and, and um, I've grown to love it more and more and more the more I think about it and watch it. So yeah, those two uh, kind of compete with each other. Were you uh, surprised by the ending the first time you watched The Prestige? Yes. Uh, I was surprised by a lot of it. I think the first time I'd seen it, because I would have been uh, 13, I didn't quite get a lot of it. <laughs> I was like, mm. exactly how everything unfolded, but uh, very strong. And when you are, when he, uh, when they lower him down into the lava, did, did it get you in the feels? Oh, every time. I was always very upset. Uh, such an awesome robot. <laughs> uh, did you ever watch uh, T3? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I saw all the Terminators as they came out because I'm a big into Terminator. And uh, I think with three, I was like, well, that was a film. And then Salvation, I was like, this is getting weird, but I guess I liked it. And then Genesis, I hated. And then Dark Fate, I have many issues with on a personal level. I have not seen Dark Fate, and I don't think I will. Uh, I, I heard, I heard, and I just, I, I can't do that to myself. But uh, I, I thought T3 had potential. I just did not like the casting at all. But um, now, now on to the, the next question. Um, which films would you consider perfect or as close to perfect that you could get? Um, so like the most consistently written or tightest scripts, the, the two examples that come to mind for me, and obviously this is just a crossover right now. There's, there's a lot, it would have to be something I'd have to go through, but, um, it'd be 12 angry men and the prestige. And, uh, the interesting thing between the two of them is that 12 angry men is a much simpler film. It's a group of uh, people talking about something in a room. Mm -hmm. for an extended period of time, while Prestige is a multi-character and country-spanning, um, not, not to mention time-spanning film that, that tries to address a lot of different things all at the different times with loads of different payoffs coming in in loads of different ways, and yet they manage to keep a script that is um, almost entirely coherent. So uh, you, you have stuff like that, and then other films like uh, 2001 or um, Godfather, these these others that are like, in terms of craft, are phenomenal, um, but don't necessarily uh, connect with me as much as others do on like a, I just guess, a heart or personal level. Um, uh, perfect's a complicated word, um, but it, it's just uh, for lack of being able to identify a flaw in writing, at least uh, with the standard I could I could find. But there's obviously going to be um, plenty of things you could probably find in some craft in some ways. Filmmaking combines a lot uh, in one. So even something as simple as uh, the car that's in the background of the Shire in one shot in Lord of the Rings, just like, whoops, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that should be there. So um, there's, yeah, the, it, it's a really interesting discussion to have the, the differences between the two ways of sort of breaking things down. And um, we know very realistically that there are films that don't quite score as, as, as well in these departments, and um, they often can be so dramatically low scoring in them that they become laughing stock. And um, it's interesting to figure out why and how and how to recreate it or how to avoid recreating it. And um, yeah, those would probably be my picks for now. 
Yeah, I remember watching uh, 12 Angry Men when I was in high school in my uh, government class. So that way we can learn about like the legislative branch. And I was sick the next day, so I didn't get to watch the second half of it. So I rented it and I was like, this is a good movie. I've never seen a movie in class that's this good. But uh, I, I would, I think I've recommended this movie to you before. I don't know if you ever uh, watched or not, but if you haven't uh, seen it since, I would highly recommend watching A Time to Kill. I think you would enjoy mm -hmm. that. It's with, it's an all-star cast. It's um, Matthew McConaughey, Sandra Bullock, uh, Samuel L. Jackson, uh, uh, Kevin Spacey back before all of the- uh, the Yeah. <laughs> and um, Keith Sutherland and Kevin Sutherland. Uh, it's great, great movie. I would highly recommend it. And it's mm -hmm. uh, kind of a same kind of aspect of it, but uh, there's a lot more intensity to it. So I think you would really enjoy that movie. Subjectively, I think you would enjoy it as well as objectively. All right, next question. Where was I now? Mm -hmm. uh, which genre of movies do you prefer? Oh, that's a tough one because I like, I, I really like a lot. I'll even go as far as saying that there are romantic comedies that I could possibly find to be very engaging if they're, uh, I guess, written well or written in a way that appeals to me personally. But um, I do always find sci-fi and fantasy to be a little bit more um, enticing just because of the fact that we're going to get some crazier rules or inventions or ideas that are going to be out there instead of a sort of uh, a story that takes place grounded in Earth. But um, I also have a bit of a thing for horror. I always like to check out the best or the, the most appreciated horror stuff because I like, I like me some horror. So again, it really doesn't feel like I'd pick one in, in particular, but if I was told that maybe I was locked in a room and I get to watch one random movie from any any given genre, um, I guess I'd probably go with sci-fi just because of, like I said, looking to hopefully get surprised with um, the writing to a degree, even though it's probably inviting myself to have a lot of bad stuff happen because it's harder to write something as complicated as a brand new world with all the different kinds of rules versus one where you can essentially just recreate or adopt because if you if you make a grounded story that takes place on Earth, I imagine that a lot of the rules are uh, set for you. But if you create a brand new universe, like something in Star Wars or Star Trek, you have to account for um, maybe even writing yourself your own book that nobody ever actually sees that just allows you to keep track of how everything works. But yeah, um, I'm really open to a lot of things, but I guess I would pick sci-fi. All right. Uh, which do you least prefer? <laughs> Probably romantic comedy <laughs> or romance in general. And it's not even because like I, I don't particularly enjoy it. How any of dare you, you misogynistic man. <laughs> you don't like romantic comedies? Oh, my God. I know. I need to be killed. I just It's just that uh, <laughs> of, of the ones that I like, uh, it's very few compared to the other genres. And Which I, ones do you like? Now I have to know. Um, I like Love Actually. I thought that film was you're, fun. You're English, of course you do. Oh, sorry, all right, excuse me, you're British. I can't say the English one. That's a no-no. I learned that. <laughs> um, you can say Welsh, yeah, that worked, but... Uh, okay, we're yeah. Welsh. Okay, you like the movie that takes place in the UK about UK people during the holiday season. It's true. Um, it's a fun movie. I, I is, At least the last time I saw that, it. That's uh, more of a Christmas... It's like, a, yeah, it's romantic comedy, but I would classify that as a Christmas movie. I mean, can't you have a romantic comedy that's set in Christmas, Easter, Halloween, or whatever? Yeah, you can, but I would, the way I look at stuff like that, it's like, uh, hmm, how, to, how to phrase this correctly. It's like, if it's, it has this element in it, but it's more of this, you know, because like uh, Lord of the Rings has, yeah, it has the romance between, you know, Aragorn, but then, you know, it's, it's a fantasy action movie, you know, as compared to, yes, there's these elements in it, but it's the true meaning of it is something else. So I would say that movie, it's like, yes, there's romance with every character in a way, but the thing is like, and he even says at the beginning when he's narrating it, it's like about finding this during that holiday season. So maybe that's just my own personal bias on it, but I see it as more as a Christmas movie. Like if I were to organize it in my house on my shelves, I would put it in the Christmas section, not the, the chick flick section. Yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, have a seed remains of the day. I have not. That's a, uh... It would be very unconventional to describe that as a romantic comedy. Certainly not comedy, but it's uh, 
unconventional romantic film about uh, upper class sort of house caretakers and a lot of the politics that come with it and then a, a relationship that starts to potentially blossom. It's um, much more of a subtle romance, I'd probably call it. But there's, um, there's, there's a re- couple. What is it I remember liking Bridesmaids. Does that count? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, that's a chick flick. What was the movie called when we wrote it down? Remains of the Day, uh, but it's it's quite a slow burn. Wait, is it, a, is it a British made. film? Yes. <laughs> you, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't do your guys' humor. Wow. Well, there's not much humor in it, so you'll be all right, I oh, think. No. <laughs> Let's just say sometimes it, uh, uh, my boyfriend, he loves he loves these British movies and he, he turns them on and he's like, no, you got to watch this. And I'm like, I have no fucking clue what's going on. You guys speak English. I can't understand. There's one where there's something with a dog and the dog ate the bomb. And then there it's, there's all these gangsters and it's these different storylines. And at the beginning they're dressed like Greek or uh, the like, like Orthodox Jews. And then they're not, they're shooting up a bank. And then I could not follow it. I'm like, what? Oh, on he remains of the day as well, I thought. So that might help you find it if you're looking for it. Obviously, yeah, you know, it's not for everybody. It's totally fine. I just, and then I tried to watch like Rock and Rolla, and I'm like, what the hell am I watching? I don't understand it. So oh, maybe that's just don't, me. Do you not love Guy Ritchie films? Well, I mean, most people don't like that one as much as Lockstock or uh, Snatch, but you know, either way. Not, not my genre. I will, um, uh, you guys can do very amazing things, but uh, films, I'm not the biggest uh, the fan of uh, that. Uh, yeah. Just just throwing that out there. Now they're going to uh, peg me as certain words, but it's okay. All right, next question. Uh, when it comes to storytelling, what aspect of it do you find most interesting? Aspect of? Storytelling. Um, it would certainly be the uh, the way it appeals to create sort of the it's just the easier way the term that i um would use for it is just the payoffs um why is it that everyone remembers arnie's hand turning to a thumbs up as he burns in the lava why is it that people always reference back in the day jack falling to his death through the 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 cold water it's like all these ultimate moments all the things in the films build toward them all the, the stories rather and um you know a lot of people describe like story writing as you almost come up with that part in your head and then you're like, how do I get there? And that's part of what I think will happen with like TFA. I think that JJ was probably like, I'm going to have Han Solo's child kill him. How do I get there? And, and they didn't really do a good job of getting there, but the, I find it all fascinating how those become powerful. And um, the way I understand it to be is that you get all of your pieces in place and the audience has no reason or way to understand uh, how all those pieces connect to what's going to be the big payoff. An example of that would be, let's say, Ned Stark's execution from the beginning mm-hmm. of season one. We have no way to connect everything we see in season one, episode one, to that event. And yet everything logically follows with how everyone's built and how everything falls into place until we can't even avoid that payoff. And it's it's huge and it's powerful. I remember um, first showing my friend it, and he was so shocked. He was just like, he's going to come back. And I was just like, what do you mean? He's like, he, they'll, he's gonna, like, there's, they'll, it's like, he's not actually dead. And I was just like, he's gone, man. He was just like, nope, <laughs> nope, they wouldn't do this. <laughs> this is wrong. It's not fair. And it's just like, um, so sad that they would do something like that, but still so effective. And the Red Wedding would be another example of that. And so, yeah, I so love to come back from that. Like, the show, those are your main characters. What do you do after that? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I like finding out why simultaneously, Something like uh, you know Peter dying in Tony's arms in Infinity War works so well, and something like Luke's whole character in TLJ fails so miserably. Like uh, I find the mechanics of how those things become powerful or terrible uh, to be really interesting. Mm, good answer. Uh, who do you think was the best protagonist, and who do you think was the worst protagonist? In just all stuff. In, in- in, out of every movie you've ever seen, which protagonist do you think was the best and which one do you think is the worst? I feel bad about this for the worst, but I can't think of anyone better than to pick than Ray. She's <laughs> not even really a protagonist. She's just a pinball being bounced around by everything else. She doesn't have any desires. She just happens to be around. Um, 
I guess you could say that the one time she seems to want something is when she's like, Kylo can turn to the good side, and then he can't. She's like, oh. And it's, it's like the first time in all of the movies where you're just like, oh, she she not only believes that's possible, but she really wants it, even though I thought she kind of hated it. Huh, how weird. Okay, fine. Um, and then she wants to kill Palpatine briefly in, <laughs> in the last one. But but she's the main character. She's on the screen for the most time. She's supposed to be driving our story forward, and I just, not only do I not understand how that's happening at all, since if you remember, like they find out where Luke is, and they've been looking for him for ages, and who do they send? It's like Ray, the girl that Leia's just met. <laughs> what? Why? And it's like, well, because she's the protagonist. I don't know. That's why she's going. So yeah, she just she fails at a lot of the the sort of standard under uh, standard methods in which you even operate um, a protagonist while also just having no character. So she's probably the worst. Um, even worse than Captain Marvel. Yeah, I think Captain Marvel is a lot more. So this is the interesting thing about Captain Marvel, Ray, and Batwoman. Um, Batwoman is probably the best character out of the three of them because she's got a lot of negative traits. And what I mean by that is um, she values her sister more than the lives of innocent people, and she's totally okay with this. And that is just an element of her is really interesting to think about, like how much of a villainous character she is um, versus Ray, who I don't even, I don't even, you know, I got nothing to work with really. She's just there. She's like a slate. And um, I'd say Captain Marvel is kind of the same as Ray, but inches a little closer to, to Batwoman in that regard, where um, Captain Marvel uh, is right no matter what, pretty much. That's how she feels. And uh, she seems to have goals of just destroying and killing everything in her pathway, whether or not it's good or evil. And she enjoys it. That's the, that's the One of the biggest moments for her is when she blows up all those ships at the end of her movie while shouting out woo. It's really interesting because she's killing thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. And she's just like, yeah. It's like, oh my God. Like, you know, when the Guardians do it, um, it makes a lot of sense because not only are their own men getting killed in the fights, but they're also relatively dubious characters. They're all, um, you know, ex mercenaries of some kind, or they come from backgrounds where, uh, like the Ravagers, which are not morally altruistic uh, by nature. And so, them having fun in a battle like Rocket would, it, it's much more in line with his character. But Captain Marvel's supposed to be this altruistic sort of stand-up character that everybody can aspire to be like, and she's kind of horrible. While Ray doesn't suffer from that, like Batwoman and Captain Marvel do, she just because she's nothing, really. She's just there, and she solves the ultimate issues that each of these movies have in them, and I don't even know what it means to her. You know, like the fact that she's she seems to be happy to kiss that. Kylo. It's just like, whoa, why... <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Uh, you know, it, I, I would imagine there's alcohol involved that we did not see on screen. Um, but that's my uh, giving the big bit of the doubt. But uh, it's a Disney movie. Uh, so, yeah, it is what it is. And so, it's then, who do you think is the best protagonist? So, that one's tough because I'm immediately wanting to go to my favorite movies almost. And. Um... Well, you could answer subjectively and objectively. Yeah, I, I was thinking, like, I guess it's torn between my favorite protagonist versus ones that achieve, uh, like, the protagonist role very effectively, and that is to, to almost push the plot directly because of their interests and their uh, their fight and sort of... Um, I mean, I would probably... I, it's such a cop-out right now, I, but if I had more time to sort of go over it, I think I'd have a more interesting answer, but I really would like to go with Luke Skywalker. He's one of the, like, top-tier protagonists. It's just um, goes on an in incredibly long and important journey out of, after you know failing as a result of his many different um, pieces of ignorance or, or flaws, but they're all motivated by a, a very relatable idea of, of his love for his friends or family, his uh, his different skills being developed by his life growing up in the place that he was in or training that he actually has. And yeah, I, I would like to clarify, as someone just said in the chat, was, obviously I'm not including the sequel trilogy because he's, oof. But, um, that's, a, that's a Disney fan fiction sequel. It's yes. not real. So uh, we're talking about the only movies that exist. Uh, so continue. But, uh, you, you know, like there's, there's a lot of answers to this question. The only reason I, I'm obviously, I've got Star Wars on my mind, especially because of just talking about Ray. Uh, he would be a very strong answer. Um, I'm trying to think of like, there's, there's just there's, there's a lot. I, I think Ellen Ripley in uh, Alien and Aliens would easily be a, a strong choice. She's just, especially Aliens, probably. She's absolutely awesome in that film. Um, mm -hmm. Not only satisfying the um, 
her wants and desires, and, and not to mention her intelligence and uh, proactiveness, sort of sort of pushing along and carrying a lot of the uh, the un unprepared uh, members of the the crew that it, or that there is the team in that film, and um, comes a long way while also being uh, just downright respectable and let's see the, she needs to be idolized not not ray not captain marvel not batwoman <laughs> like we got we got to bring these things back um i know i mean i remember when i was a kid and i watched it uh the first one and then i watched the second one when i was in college because again i'm a really big scaredy cat it took a lot of convincing to get me to watch that and it's like she's trying to tell them no we're not going back to that damn planet you guys are crazy like oh there's already colony she's like they're all dead and then, you know, she goes there with the big, you know, the, the marine type, the big, strong, muscly people that have the big guns that are the best in battle. And she's the one that lives because she's the smartest. Like, that's something to be idolized. I mm -hmm. agree with you. Uh, but what about objectively? Like <laughs> who do you think is the best protagonist? That is something I would have to really look through a lot of uh, different things and then figure out exactly what I think it means to be a protagonist beyond you know person we see the most beyond person that makes most of the decisions um the good character that's on a hero's journey yeah well again this is what i mean it's like uh, why don't I, I can just i can just easily cop out and be like luke 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 is <laughs> luke is bloody brilliant in that regard um but uh, i think you know a lot of people there's gonna be those suggestions i think that are good in chat as well yeah even iron man he's a great protagonist uh, there's 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 a, there's a, there's a really a lot my I mean, I would probably, I would probably try and just uh, expand it a little bit, get the TV shows that there'd be like Buffy's one of my favorites. I, her journey throughout the seven seasons is uh, something I very much enjoy as her, the amount of different things she has to learn and overcome and fail at while also trying to drive her team forward in uh, no matter the circumstance. And of course, uh, I don't just love Buffy on a personal level. I just think it's very well written in many regards. So um complicated answer we could spend a long time on it or not it's really up to you no there's one answer and one person <laughs> got it in the chat and it's sam Best which sam which Mahler. sam sam what are the rings Mahler? gosh you oh right well there's a lot of sams i thought maybe you meant <laughs> no maybe it was sam very from game of thrones everyone's favorite sam from game of thrones do you remember very when he cried in the uh, episode three <laughs> Do you, remember, do you remember Sam the Slayer crying as the zombies approached him and killed his friends? That was great. I did not kill the one dude sitting there <laughs> crying. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. I remember that. All right, next question. Uh, on a similar basis, who do you think was the best antagonist and who was the worst antagonist? Ooh, so um, a lot of the time when I think about the best antagonist, uh, this is, this is sort of a category that I think a lot of people run with as well is that they're often, they represent the opposite of the, the, the hero at the time or, um, the opposite interest, not that it's 100% necessary or anything, but it's very satisfying to watch. And, um, one I like to talk about, or at least will do, uh, as videos come on, is the, uh, the, uh, vulture is like the complete opposite of Spider-Man in, um, homecoming as well as the way they were, they were created being that um, Spider-Man is growing up and idolizing the stories of his local heroes being the Avengers, local as in like Earth at least, um, yeah. and he wants to be like them. And as a result of all of their impacts, he's uh, trying to recreate sort of what they do on a smaller scale. And then simultaneously you have all of the damage they create and all the the sort of more unethical elements being that they they are taking potential jobs away from other workers because they want to capitalize on the alien tech or whatever, you know, depending on your point of view, you can argue this sort of thing. And Vulture then gets created out of desperation to survive in a world where the Avengers not only uh, take the jobs that he's trying to get, but also um, have no care for, for the, the messes they almost leave behind. And Civil War addresses that as well. And so as a result, he's doing petty crimes uh, as a result of the, the messes they leave behind. And Peter's trying to sort of mop up and uh, defend against these the crimes in accordance with what he's seen and inspired by with the Avengers. I, I really like that uh, sort of back and forth in terms of how they're created. And this is, again, there's a lot of favorite uh, antagonists I'd have and a lot of what I would call the analysis for why they work so well would probably uh, relate to that sort of back and forth dynamic or a reflection of, of something to do with the hero as opposed to 
I'm just evil. You got to beat me. It's like, all right, then. And aliens. <laughs> yeah, well, this is the thing. Uh, a lot of people often will be like, you know, it's bad for a villain to be relatively one note. And it's like, no, 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 it's, it's always execution because you can have plenty of, like, Palpatine was pretty much one note. <laughs> it's like, I like power. And it's, you know, if, if you don't, screw you. It's like, all right, very clear. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was honestly expecting you to say Terminator after that. I was not expecting Vulture in that. Uh, interesting. Well, <sighs> Terminators, I mean, if you're talking about the T-1000 or the Terminator, the the uh, T-800, they're, um, they're like a slasher movie villain or antagonist. There's nothing in depth about them, and that's part of what makes them so terrifying is that they're singular in a goal, and there's no way to reason with them, and they don't sleep. Like, that's what's scary but I, I always find an antagonist much more engaging if I can, I guess, understand their motivation as opposed to them being a, uh, an unstoppable force of threat. But you can you can sometimes get that maybe combined into two. There's a lot of um, a lot of different sort of ways. Oh, and and someone said that the Avengers didn't create the mess. The Loki and the Chitari did. It's like, yeah, well, you know, the 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 point of the um, Civil War. Part of it. They don't look back is uh, the point the Civil War was trying to make. And, I mean, fucking hell, Ultron, right? Oof. Whose fault was Ultron, Tony, huh? <laughs> Terrible. Hmm. I, I'm just, every, uh, that was honestly the uh, least likely answer I was expecting out of all of the antagonists uh, <laughs> ever. Gotta keep you on your toes. There's lots of, this is the thing, I feel like there's a lot of good answers. I wouldn't be comfortable in choosing a favorite antagonist of all time because I'd have to think about it for a while. Well, I didn't say favorite. I just said, which one did, do you think was the best? Oh, I still, still would have to think about that for a long time. Yeah. And then uh, coinciding with that, who do you think is the worst? Because I mean, I mean, I'm not even surprised you didn't say Cersei after Game of Thrones. Um, wait for best. Yeah. I don't even. I mean, she kind of goes out like a fart at the end. Nah, that's true. <laughs> that's <laughs> uh, <not real. laughs> worst, uh, worst antagonists. Like, I guess we're looking at like the ones that just didn't re really matter, or nobody really even noticed them, or they didn't have in any way clear motivations. Like we, not only were they not one note, but they didn't even have a note. They were just nothing. We didn't really get it. Um, unfortunately, my mind is like, I'm, my mind's like, hey, Kylo, right? And I'm like, yeah, but. I don't even, I guess he's an antagonist in the first two and a half, right? <laughs> God, he's pathetic. This is a really, like, the sequel trilogy is fascinating to study because it really does everything wrong. This is like, it's a good place to learn. Um, you got Snoke as a suggestion. I guess it doesn't even count, right? Because he's technically Palpatine. I don't know. Was he Palpatine? He was a puppet, right? He said, Palpatine said he was Snoke the whole time. I just read the whole thing that Palpatine purposely made sure he was, like, deformed. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, but yeah, that, that, that's honestly my where my brain's going for now. There's a couple of, like, weaker ones. I mean, the MCU has quite a few weak uh, antagonists. A lot of their formulas are basically the hero, but a bigger version of them, an evil. If you remember, the Incredible Hulk had that. Iron Man 1 had that. Um... Thor, kind of, it's just the Loki is just the evil version of, well, not really. I mean, you can give a pass to that. Um, I, think I always consider Loki more as an anti-hero, because he does have redeeming qualities. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I just meant in the first film, he's kind of entirely just villain. Well, he's a jealous sibling. You know, you and I both have siblings. We know what that's like to have you mm -hmm. know, sibling rivalry. So... I don't, I just, I, maybe it's just the way that he's, uh, if it was a different actor, I would get a different uh, emotion from him. But I never, even when he is the villain of the movie, he, I never see him as a villain. It's an anti-hero or, you know, that's doing more villainous things than redeemable things. But, uh, that's just yeah, that. yeah. Uh, so who are you going with, with the worst? Oh, this is, so this is the problem, right? That keeps happening with these questions is that Star Wars has such the, the greatest examples, and I'm like, I, I can't use Star Wars again. And so I'm like, but who's worse than Kylo as an antagonist in those films? And I'm, I'm like, I'm coming up empty. I'm even trying to think about Batwoman. I'm like, save me from this. Who's a really bad antagonist? It's like, oh, it's it's, it's tough. What 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 are some of your picks out of curiosity? Uh, for worst villain, I mean, right off the top of my head, I, I, when I saw Venom. 
And I'm just like, this guy is absolutely pathetic. He has his motivations, but uh, <laughs> he's big of Adam. Like I said, they do that. Well, it was even before he gets that, it's just my biggest thing is a hero is only as strong as the villain, because if the villain's weak, what does the hero have to rise up against? So when a movie doesn't have a strong villain, it's very disappointing. So people were saying like Phasma and Hugs. Yeah. Phasma. I, I honestly, I probably would go with someone like Kylo because he's just a pathetic, whiny little loser. He's not even a, a villain per se, and he's supposed to be the villain. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, this is one that I would even have to think about because I wasn't expecting to answer my question. <laughs> uh, it's different when you reverse it. But um, one of my big ones, because uh, when I was younger, you know, I loved watching uh, Disney movies. And so one of the really big problems that Disney ran into was they were trying to get the rights to do Lord of the Rings, the animated version of Lord of the Rings. And they they lost out the bid for it. So they decided, what what can we do that's Lord of the Ring s because we need to make a movie like this because another company is doing it. So we need to do that. And so they got this series and they clumped three books into one. They had no idea what they were doing. They couldn't even pronounce these like old English names. And so they did the Black Cauldron and the Horn King in a way he doesn't do anything. And he, he's he's drawn super well. He's animated spectacularly, but nothing is explained in the movie because they didn't even understand the story. And in the books, he's not even the villain. The villain's a completely other character. He's just a side character that kind of mm. gets mentioned a few times. And so in the movie, he doesn't he doesn't do much. He talks about what he wants to do, but it's just a really big letdown. And all like, what what does a uh, uh, Taran have to overcome? All he has to do is apparently break into a castle that is extremely easy to break into multiple times and to escape from, and throw you sacrifice yourself into the cauldron, which he doesn't even do. Gurgi does. And so he doesn't, aside from making friends and not being a jerk, he doesn't really overcome a villain. It's more of a thing about, hey, don't be an asshole to your friends as compared to you're on the hero's journey fighting the villain. So I think that was one that, while it's a movie I love, it falls flat as far as villain-wise. When that was kind of the draw, it's like, oh, it's the, the Black Cauldron and the Horn King is coming, the Horn King, the Horn King. And then it's like, well, the Horn King doesn't do anything. Yeah, that's, I, I mean, that's probably very fair. I haven't seen that movie in so long now that I can't quite remember uh, how it all goes down. I just remember the look of him, and I think that's what most people remember. He's yeah. just, he looks awesome. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's like, oh, it, it has so much potential, but it was a really big flop, and I think that that's a really big reason to it is because, like, I'll always say this, a hero is only as strong as their villain, and if there's nothing... If the villain is weak, there's nothing for the hero to overcome. And so it doesn't make it epic. Like Luke going against Darth Vader and the Empire, holy shit. Like <laughs> he's got a lot of shit to overcome. Especially he started with nothing. And so I think that's why it makes that story so great. But uh, yeah, that, that, I think that would be my answer. I'll go with the Horn King. People are saying Diabito. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, but so who are you going to go with? Oh, Kylo. I I even this is the problem. I don't think of anybody who could be like worse than it than Kylo, like like a worse antagonist. Someone who gets defeated by the hero every single time they fight. Like I don't <laughs> someone who's regularly confused about their own motivation. Like I just and he's supposed to, oh <laughs> like yeah. Uh, I feel like he epitomizes everything that's wrong with a bad antagonist. Yeah, we're not even thinking about that. The Night King. Yeah, plot device. Doesn't do shit. Oh, Night King. Such a disappointment. All right. Well, uh, I think that question was answered, so we can move on to uh, the next one. How old were you when you first saw Star Wars? Ooh, I was very young. I don't even quite fully remember exactly what age when my dad showed me the uh, the original trilogy, and I was blown away. Um, you were and eight. it was so enticing as a world if it, i remember absolutely believing all of it was like perfectly constructed to the point where it's just like this is a movie this is what they're capable of you know mm -hmm. 
I, I had the same thing. Like my aunt uh, shut me in a room and I just, I didn't move for the entire you know duration of the movie. And then she's just like, oh, there's more. And I watched them all. I didn't do anything <laughs> else that entire day. It was just so good. Uh, but you, you don't remember what age you were? Would have been would have been around seven or eight, I think, possibly earlier. Um, I, my dad was throwing was throwing lots of movies at me when I got to around that age. Yeah, I've just... famously told people before that that's when I first saw Terminator One and Two, which uh, is a controversial decision by my dad, but I'm very glad that he made it. <laughs> like I thoroughly enjoyed them. You know that that's the thing because you and I are similar. We're really close in age, so it's like I watched those movies when I was young too, and. I'm in the camp of I actually think it's better to expose children to that kind of stuff when they're young because that way they can handle it better as adults. And I think that's, that's yeah, that's definitely one of the things that can happen. But you never quite know what can traumatize. You know, sometimes children could uh, react to some stuff in ways that you just don't see coming. The funny thing is, a lot of children or a lot of adults will cite that some of the scarier movies or whatever they saw when they were younger were not movies that were intended that way. Like the one I always talk about is Return to Oz. It's like scary ass movie that it's meant for children <laughs> watership never... down is one people often reference oh i never watched that one uh i had the movie that traumatized me was jaws but i mean that's kind of meant to traumatize you <laughs> well, this is the thing like uh it really just depends because i i was happy to see anything that was pretty harshly violent it really didn't bother me when i was younger i was just like yeah it's all it's a movie <laughs> it's like nobody's actually getting hurt <laughs> Uh, yeah, I did not think that. I, I actually just had this conversation the other night. Um, the first, I thought movies were real. So every oh. time I watched the movie, I thought it, well, when I watched a live action movie, I thought it was real. When I watched a cartoon, I'm like, that's a drawing. I know that that one's not real. But when I watched Star Wars, it says it's a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So I'm like, okay, it's real. It, that happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And again, I was two and a half when I watched Star Wars. So mm. benefit of the doubt there uh, for a two and a half year old. Uh, and yeah, when somebody said Jumanji, yeah, when I watched Jumanji, I thought that that was real and that you could get sucked into the game. And I thought that that would be cool to play the game and get sucked into it and go live in the jungle. Uh, five year old me uh, and logic. But uh, when I first realized movies weren't real was we were watching Rambo and the scene where Sylvester Stallone like falls off the cliff like into the trees and uh my mom paused it to say oh he actually did that like that that's really him that's not a stunt double and he broke like his ribs and I was like what do you mean of course he actually did that we were watching he did that and she's like no <laughs> usually they're stunt people and I was like what so this isn't real what is this I remember oh, um like <laughs> Terminator One, where he's cutting out his own eye in a scene that's supposed to be like the 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 scene that really got that age rating going. Um, I remember even when I was around eight years old, I was just fascinated. I was like, "How did they do this? How did they make it look like the way that?" Because I was too young to figure out a lot of movie making techniques, so I was just like, "It looks so good." And I remember even my dad was just like, "You're uh, you're all right, yeah." <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, this is fine." Uh. Had, stuff like that doesn't scare me. Getting eaten by sharks scared me, but mm. yeah, I, I remember watching Terminator thinking it was real. Uh, yeah, I was, I was very yeah, young when I watched Time it. travel is real. It It is in that aspect, and uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, Indiana Jones is real at one point, and uh, for some reason, I did not make the connection that he was the same person in Indiana Jones as in Star Wars. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, next question. Uh, what was your, this is in reference to Star Wars, uh, what was your favorite thing about it? About Star Wars entirely, it probably, so like right now or maybe when I first saw it or combo? Uh, when you first saw it, I got sad. It was right Vader. Now. I was absolutely blown away by Vader. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Same. <laughs> <laughs> and what about now? Um, I think... Probably, whenever I think of my favorite thing about all of Star Wars, it always comes back to that, uh, the, the basically the scene between Luke and Vader from start to finish of their fight to the redemption and the death. That whole sequence, I feel like all of it builds so gloriously to all of that being incredibly meaningful. Is Empire your favorite? Yes, uh, but my favorite scene across all three movies would probably be the between Luke and Vader and Return of the Jedi. Oh my God, 
That's mine. Well, Are it's you a pretty about the ending one or the one before they go and fight. Well, I was saying like nonstop the from the moment they start fighting all the way until Vader dies, like all of it is glorious to me. I think it's just it's really well done. See, what I like to do sometimes is I'll just so one of the things that I think is a very underrated scene in Star Wars uh, is when Luke goes and he when he surrenders himself and he goes and he talks to Vader. And that's the first time we get to see that Vader acknowledges that he knows everything he's done is wrong. But it, like when he says, like, no, it, it's too late for me. Yeah. And that's the yeah. first time we get Anakin ha- talking to Luke and like he knows he, he's acknowledging. He's like, yeah, I fucked up, but I, I can't like I, I'm stuck, you know. And it's like, oh, it. And then the next scene going into that, it's like, oh, it just, they don't write movies like that anymore. <laughs> they try. You get some here and there. It's, uh, you just gotta, gotta keep pushing for it. That's all. Um, you know, it's just unfortunately a lot of people, like JJ Abrams, the king of failing upwards, as everybody has been noticing. It's like, it's just gonna, oh, we'll, we'll get there. I'm sure of it. It'll come around. Hopefully we'll start getting mediocre things again. Imagine that. Just things that are okay. That we're like, you know what? That was all right. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. I mean, I after uh, this this craziness currently going on in the world is over and how a lot of uh, things might not recover from it. And I'm hoping with the way that they've been doing things and how, uh, yeah, it might make a lot of money because there's a really epic movie coming out uh a month or so after <laughs> Captain Marvel and Endgame, uh, you know, when they keep doing this, it's not going to end well, especially with even with the backlash with Rise of Skywalker and how the people they're trying to appease didn't get appeased and they lost their shit about it. And that can only go on for so long. So hopefully uh, new companies start, uh, you know, picking up where they're failing and then those companies start making money and focusing on story and all the stuff that we've just been saying, hey, um, you're kind of forgetting these basic fucking building blocks of making movies. So hopefully that can happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, on to the next question. Uh, If you could have one force power, what would it be? Ooh. So the thing with this is the force push enables me to, well, force telekinesis almost, right? Like just force grabbing and moving. Mm-hmm. Like that enables me to have a lot of bonus te- powers potentially, as yeah. in if I was to push really hard down, would I then get propelled upward? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, then of course we got we got, we got mind tricks, which the, the thing about that one is that you'd think most of the time you're probably going to be using that in a way that's not very uh, ethically sound. Could be could be a bit bit of a dodgy one. Then I guess like the more weaponized ones, like force repulse or something like that, I'd be like I don't think I'm going to have much use for it. I feel like I'm going to get to hit people. Uh, then, you know, um, we're not including the sequels, right? Or are we? Because oh, God. Those forced are... teleport is pretty useful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for Skype calls? Yeah, I'd uh, be able to just move lightsabers over to your friends, you know, whatever you need. It's pretty mm-hmm. useful. Uh, uh. But if, yeah, if we were to split them all into very specific ones, um, Probably just your standard. I would just happily be able to move stuff with my mind. I would be satisfied with that. I, I don't know that I would... Um, I feel like a lot of the other powers would be useful if I was maybe uh, doing more... Um, maybe maybe if it was in the army, that could be pretty useful, some of them powers. So, so, so maybe some kind of uh, agent, secret agent, could be could be very useful. But um, you know, I, I wouldn't mind the idea of sitting down, watching a movie, and you can use that just to grab the remote that was just too far away from you. That's a very useful use of the force, I would say. So we all know now, guys, confirmed Mahler's lazy. Yes. You won't get up to grab the remote. That's why I can just extend my arm like Mr. Fantastic to grab it. (laughs) That's why he's taking so long to come out with this next episode. (laughs) He's lazy. He doesn't want to grab the remote. Uh, All right. Um, Let's see. What's the next question? Uh, Which Star Wars character is your favorite? But you kind of already answered this one. Yeah, that'd be Luke. And uh, I mostly block out the sequels when thinking about him. I'm just like, nah, that's uh, that's some that is definitely Jake, a clone, a crazy dream apparition. That's not Luke. That's some weird thing. Oof. I guess Luke was just too busy. He's gone or he died. I don't know. I don't know where Luke is. 
<laughs> and what about in the prequels then? Is Luke still your favorite for the one minute he was in the movie? <laughs> uh, prequel? Probably. Ooh, we got a couple of. I, I Probably Obi Wan. I know that's a bit of a generic answer, but I mean, he's pretty awesome in the prequels. Very fun uh, character. Um, I'm trying to think of who could be a potential. Uh, I wish. Because if there was more flesh on the characters in the prequels, like, um, I feel like Count Dooku would easily become a favorite of mine if I knew more about him uh, in the films. I know there's a lot more in the Clone Wars, but I wish that um, he'd gotten maybe more scenes to sort of express how disappointed he is in the Republic with uh, the Jedi, that sort of thing. All right. And Probably then Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan. Uh, which Star Wars character is your least favorite? Oh, are the sequels involved in this? Because this is going to be easy. I think we know <laughs> your answer for the sequels. Let, let's go with the originals. and the, Well, you can say for each one. The prequels, who is your least favorite sequel, uh, original right. and sequels? So, least favorite prequel character. Pro, so, like, I guess I would go sh from Shia just like, you're annoying me, probably would be Jar Jar. Um, I'm trying to think of anyone else who... Like, Bores me more than him, maybe, but I, I think I think it would just be Jar Jar. Uh, and then for the OT, this is very tough. I've never actually thought of who I dislike in the OT. It's just like because um, I, I I mean I like C three PO. That's a, I know a lot of people choose him. Hmm. Though I suppose he still could be the least favorite. That's possible. I'm trying to think of who else would call because I know I like Lando a lot. Even even yeah. Lobot is pretty neat with his with his little pointy fingers to let people know where to go. You know, can't go wrong with that for the screen time that he's on. Um, <laughs> do 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 Ewoks count? They're kind of weird, the dog. How dare you? <laughs> They're so cute, little fuzzy. How mean they I'm help. So sorry. How dare you? Like, how dare you? You like. You you like the Sarlacc pit creature more than Ewoks? Oh no. yeah, Sarlacc's cool. It knows what's up. Ah. You you like Boba Fett? Yes, superficially. <laughs> he's he's really cool. Even though he doesn't help, uh, you like him more than uh, the Ewoks. Yes. <laughs> I feel like mine's not the controversial position there. <laughs> How dare you? All right, and then the sequel trilogy then. Uh oh, yeah, that's gotta be Jake. Uh, every uh, time we're talking about this uh, is my eyes. I was gonna say antagonist, but nope, nope, no, nope. You're right. Yep, uh, Phil, Phil's on that one. All right, uh, next question. Uh, if you could have a lightsaber, what type would it be, and what color or colors, depending on it? Count Dooku's hilt with Mace Windu color. You want purple? purple? I really like purple, yeah. Guys need to fix his avatar, whoever did this. <laughs> Give him purple. Hey man. Well, if I, I mean, if purple was out of the question, I probably would go with red. Mm. Evil. Oh, of course. <laughs> Long Mad Mad is right. <laughs> uh, let's see. Do you have any lightsabers? Uh, like, no. Or? I would not be against having one. I just, uh, there hasn't really been a, a time where I found an opportunity to sort of get one that I was interested in. But I know that there's a lot of really like good sort of sources to get pretty awesome lightsabers. I, I wouldn't be against that. That sounds like something I'd probably do if I had a Did good you avenue. Did you have when you were a kid? Oh, well, uh, yes, I had a Darth Maul one, but it was very flimsy. Like it, was, it wasn't like really well made. It was just a lot of fun to play with. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh all righty. Well, uh, I know you're not as uh, into the EU, but if it interests you, uh, the way that uh, uh, Count Dooku's hilt was, that's uh, the same hilt that Darth Bane has. They have the, the curved hilt. Hey. Yeah, fun, fun fact. Uh, you might uh, be interested in that. Uh, let's see. Next question. Um, tell us about what it was like when you saw The Last Jedi and how it affected you. <laughs> so like I said, very <laughs> confused because I had did you uh, see it in the theater or like at home? Um, yeah, it was it was uh, a friend of mine. I tried to get to go with me, but he lost interest in Star Wars uh, mm -hmm. after the TFA. He didn't hate TFA, 
he was just like, nah, I'm not. Star Wars is just not my thing anymore. And I was like, oh, okay. Was, you know, I'm still very invested in where this is going. I'm like, I'm cool with it. And um, yeah, when Luke threw the lightsaber over himself, I still remember distinctly being like, how very strange. I'm sure I just don't understand what's happening. Like, I'm I'm not grasping the point. That's that's all that's happening. It's not that this is terrible. Um, and yeah, more and more things just stacked up. And uh, I was very concerned. And then it just started to get to anger. Like, why have they destroyed everything? Why would you do this? Why would you spend so much money to spit on the fans? It's such a bizarre thing that you've done. And uh, yeah, once I talked to a couple of friends about it and other people, I was like, oh, I'm not crazy. This is actually what happened in the film. Mm. What were your um, initial thoughts on Holdo? Oh, I mean, the video pretty much summed it up. I thought, <laughs> why would you introduce this insufferable idiot and then not have her? I was convinced when I first watched it that the, the, the twist would be that she was a mole. And I was prepared to be like, it was pretty obvious, you know, like it wasn't very well done. Like it, you could tell she was evil from the get go. And I was like, oh my gosh, she's the hero. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't, yeah, I was just losing my shit because I was just I couldn't believe that this is how incompetent the script was. That um, she, the, yeah, uh, just Holdo blew me away. And I, t why the hair? Like I was so distracted by her hair, and I didn't understand why they would want to do that. And then um, it was an obvious sort of uh, thing for people to just be like, "Wow, you just you, you hate on the hair because you, you, you're anti SJW or something like that." It's like, no, I just think that the hair is bizarre. That's all. Anybody having that hair, it just it comes across as bizarre. It's like, oh, you could accept aliens, but not purple hair. It's like, I guess so. <laughs> the, the hair is that distracting. She was wearing a halo. Why was she wearing a halo? Because she's an angel. Oh, yeah. And then so um, to confirm I wasn't insane, I watched it locally with a friend. And uh, I did record the experience because I wanted to uh, record my thoughts as I was going through, just to in case I'd forgotten a lot of the things I was sort of picking up. And I happened to catch his reaction. He did not see the Leia scene coming where she flew <laughs> through space. And you can still find that in the TLJ rage. It's Smiler Al reacting to it candidly. He lost his shit. He thought it was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, at that point, I was like, this is a fucking joke. This is a prank. You know, Ugh. Yeah, again, all those moments, I was just really concerned and silent. I was like, what am I? I must be missing something. I must be. Like, they can't, this can't be happening. Yeah, it's just like, you know how they make those memes, like the different levels of like depression or rage. And it's like, you have this and then this and then this. And it's like, this, <laughs> you can just swap those out with re reactions to The Last Jedi. Pretty much, yeah. It's like, ugh. All right. Uh, this follows into the next question. Um, what from Disney's fan fiction sequel trilogy do you think was objectively most damaging? Uh, so this is tough. I think the clean answer is destroying Anakin's legacy in the third film, closely followed by destroying Luke's character and then closely followed by destroying Han's character and Han and Leia's relationship and then follow that with all of the damage they've dealt to the force and space battles and the general world building in terms of how the planets sort of how the galaxy works together and uh, the mechanics of a lot of how everything works that the other films rely on like they need these things to be functioning and these films are like now nah, we don't want them to function anymore it's like oh so yeah the primary damage i think that they've done is they've ripped Anakin's achievement out of his hands for some reason. I don't and they gave it to Ray, which just wow. Yep. And then uh what from Disney's fan fiction sequel trilogy was the point that broke you? And that's an air quotes like broke you. Uh I think it was the kamikaze uh, when that happened. That was when I went from being like I think I'm missing something to something is very wrong. Because, like I said, I think we mentioned it earlier, but I was just like, at first it was, there was like a few seconds where I was like, wow, that's gorgeous. And then I was like, wait, wait, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Because it tore the ship in half and all those other ships exploded. And I was like, oh my God, you can't do this. <laughs> like, you guys, you can't do this. You screwed up. You screwed up big time. Not how the force works. Not how any of this works. It's not how hyperspace travel works. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, how did it make you feel as a fan watching the interviews from Ryan Johnson and JJ and Kathleen, uh, along with Mark, on how they treated him and the franchise? And oh, really sad. It's, it's all in the TFA Critique 1, I think, where I just go through it. It's so sad. It's all so uh, almost depressing to think about that all of your favorite sort of characters and actors uh, may very well be kind of ignored and brushed aside when it comes to the creative process, which which is fine for actors who don't care. The ones who are like, yeah, I'm just doing a job, getting paid and moving out. But you could tell Mark Hamill really cared about Luke's impact upon people. And so when he was doing interviews, th this, is, this is the part that really does get to me. The idea that he's in interviews and people are like, oh my God, I love you as Luke Skywalker. He's like, he's the reason that you know I got through X, Y, and Z. And he has to watch these people say that to him when he knows that he's filmed a film where he's pathetic. He's he's let his family almost get killed. He he's like left the force and he's ignored the fact that what is essentially Empire Version Two are taking over the world and it's all because he doesn't like the Jedi because they helped allow Darth Vader happen. Like I even because I know that he watched the prequels, he knows them, he knows the storyline. So I, I I have a feeling that he's like this just none of this makes any sense and people are gonna be so upset and I have to watch people celebrate me for being a thing that they're not going to see in this movie. So it's such a sad process. And you can tell uh, from the interviews that he's not happy. And yeah, and it's, it, I guess it's just a sad point of view that, uh, or point of reference that we know that these creators, they have their story to tell. It's not about uh, what is, it, it's just about what they want. And uh, they'll do They'll destroy anything to get it basically. Yeah. Yeah, it, it breaks my heart every time I see it with him, like his face, and it just, uh, you've broken him and he can't do anything. Uh, let's see. Uh, when you put uh, your TLJ reviews up, did you have any idea the reaction people would have and were you worried about it at all? Uh, certainly not the first one other than my uh, initial subscribers being annoyed that it wasn't a game review. Uh, but when I was doing the TLJ critique ones, um, I felt like a huge amount of responsibility to get them finished as soon as possible because this was like uh, a communication hub for like all of the things that really pissed us off as viewers. Um, the TFA ones feel like much more of an autopsy, while the TLJ ones felt like an initial discussion, but uh, as extensive as I could possibly do with the time I had. And um, so I was very anxious about getting things accurate, which I managed to screw up quite a few things uh from memory and I try to correct them. And there's, you know, a lot of uh, weight that comes with uh, tr trying to direct it in a responsible way, like um, trying to get everything, like I said, get everything accurate. And also like, what are these problems and why? And wh what are they when going beyond just how I felt about a thing, right? Like, uh, why is it a problem that he threw that lightsaber beyond just being insulting to someone who, who loves uh, Luke, the lightsaber and the connection he probably has to it? And you have to go and find, because I remember looking for um, counters. I needed to find why uh, my perspective would have been uh, limited or narrow-minded. And I remember finding ones that were like, don't you see? Holdo thought that Poe was a mole. And she had right. She was right to think so. And you watch the movie again. And it's, there's that moment where she says she really likes him. It's like, there's no fucking way she thought he was a mole. She just thought he was hot-headed, which is not reason enough to not tell your captain what the plan is. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. It, it just, it, it, I was going to say the person that wrote it, but we know who wrote it. Ryan Johnson just has no fucking idea what the chain of command is, or I think it's more uh, accurate that he doesn't respect it to blatantly put that in there the way he did. Yeah. And, and yeah, so I was uh, very invested and anxious that I got uh, a lot of what the perspectives were correct and tried to figure out, um, where the definitive law flaws were lying. And, you know, the conversation just kept going. You know, EFAP has been covering Star Wars stuff since its inception. Like every other episode, there's Star Wars related things usually. Mm. Because it goes on and on. Yep. Uh, this uh, train wreck is something that's going to be uh, remembered in film history, I think, until the end of time. All right. Now, uh, change of pace. How do you feel about Baby Yoda? Adorable, and he's my favorite character in Mandalorian. Oh, he's just so cute. He's just so cute. He's got his little force power. He pushes the button. 
Were you mad when you saw it or did you, did it? No, get I was totally fine with it. I'm not one of the people that like, I know that a lot of people feel that it's manipulative or if it's Disney trying to sell merch or whatever. And, um, I, I just, I don't mind. I, I have no problem with something selling merch as long as, um, the character slash creature is more than justified. And I think it's almost perfectly justified. It's just creating a challenge for the Mandalorian to overcome. Can he kill what is essentially one of the most innocent possible bounties he's probably experienced? And, uh, yeah, I was, I was totally on board with Baby Yoda. And I, I find Baby Yoda cute as well. That's right. Oh, he's the best thing ever. Uh, if you were uh, in charge with complete creative control, how would you go about fixing the Mando series? Start, but you have to start from season two and everything that exists before. Oh. And for everyone that is not aware, because uh, I had never made any videos on it, I, I hated it. I hated the Mandalorian. Uh, I only loved the <laughs> uh, first episode. I was like, this, no. Uh, but, and I believe uh, oh, you're a good company because I'm not a fan of it either. <laughs> well, I, I watched uh, the the breakdown EFAP, but uh, I know that you liked the first episode. So, uh, with everything standing in place, how would you go about fixing it starting from season two? It's, this is this is a huge amount of stuff to fix. We got to fix the fobs. We got to make it so that we pretty much write them out. Uh, we will say maybe that. The fobs were specific to the guild and a particular set of people that he was hunting or something. We got to get them out immediately because they ruin a huge amount of what is interesting about a bounty hunter in a galaxy. Um, we got to fix Mando's competence. Um, I would off, 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 almost want to try and account for the fact that he screwed up so much in season one. I would actually have to try and write in reasons for why he is now competent where he wasn't before. Um, I want to make Cara Dune an actual character instead of just, I was a shock trooper and I'm on the run. Also, I'm strong. It's just like, yeah, she needs, we need to work on her. Um, explain everything that's going on with Baby Yoda in a satisfying way. I'm hoping they do that anyway in season two. Uh, recraft Gideon, Moff Gideon. He's worthless in the finale. We need to fix him dramatically. There's, there's so much to do. I don't even know where to start. Uh, but these are all the big sort of things I'd want to attack as well as uh, figuring out. I, I would actually try and get a season two with no uh, filler episodes. Not the filler episodes are bad, but that we need to get people gripped for an actual storyline. We've got plenty of time. We need to work with it and get something definitive happening. And um, yeah, we got we got Ahsoka coming into it, right? That's going to feel like that's, that's a potential disaster, depending on how Disney handled this. Well, I, I think uh, one of the biggest flaws with it is that uh, Dave Filoni and John Favreau, they're both yes men. And if you can imagine uh, I mean, sitting in a room with your friends, it's like, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do that. And the execution, they don't know how to do it properly. Mm -hmm. I think if they brought Katie Lucas in to write it, because she was the one that, in my opinion, wrote the best episodes of The Clone Wars, uh, it, it has the potential to be good. But Dave Filoni has his... Uh, his infatuation with his character. So I'm just like, oh. I, I know a lot of people didn't know what the Darksaber was when it was introduced in Mando. Did you know what it was? Or did you have to look at um, it? I'd, I knew I'd seen it before. And it's, it's, isn't it called a Vibroblade or Viproblade? Uh, so uh, the Darksaber is supposed to be the only Mandalorian lightsaber. But it is it is a sword. Uh, it's I haven't seen that episode of the Clone Wars in maybe five years. So I'm not up on it, on if it is a, a viral blade or not. But mm. the way that they described it, because in the episode in the Clone Wars, or excuse me, in Rebels, um, it was not described that way that I can remember. But uh, I know that that was a concern that my friends had, that they had no idea what it was, so it didn't have uh, the impact when it was revealed on screen. But uh, so, yeah, you wouldn't just do it where Baby Yoda woke up from a dream of all of that <laughs> being kidnapped by a Mandalorian. <laughs> I feel like that's disrespectful to the people who enjoyed season one to a, to a severe degree, and so instead I would do my best to try and repair what I think the holes are while maintaining what I think they enjoyed about season one. You're a lot nicer than I am. Uh, all right, next question. Uh, and this is uh, making a, a little break from Star Wars since we've been talking about it for a while. Mm. What is your favorite Marvel movie? Civil War. Captain America Civil War. Yeah. 
hands down. It's uh, it pushes two extremely long, well developed characters to their extremes because they both had journeys that pushed them to two ideological differences, and then it's further represented by a split down in the team for lots of different informed reasons for whether or not we can allow the uh, individual to have full control over their own power or because their power is so huge we need uh, committees to decide where and when they should go to what places and the compromise being that you say yes but only for as long as you agree with that committee but uh, principally Cap can't agree with that because it's almost dishonest while Iron Man absolutely can because it's the pragmatic decision it will lead to the best results um, and so, yeah, you you get after all of their different movies, they clash together, and it uh, it's what I think is the tightest written MCU film. And I look forward to eventually breaking it down in some kind of series of videos after I've done the other hundred thousand projects I have planned. All right, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm I'm holding it in because I did not like Civil War, but that's just me. I, I understand all of the points that you're making. I'm just, uh, I got bored with the execution of it. So that's just uh, me. Oh, uh, it's one of, it's, I think it's one of my controversial positions. I know a lot of people hate Civil War. So I was just like, all right, that's fine. <laughs> like it's... Uh, well, I understand like every point that you're making. I'm just like, when it's like, yes, the points are there. But uh, for me, the execution, and I can watch long movies and not uh, get bored, but it got to the point where I'm like, this I think it could have been done uh, better, but that's just me. And uh, moving on to this next question, uh, what is your least favorite Marvel movie? Captain Marvel. <laughs> you sexist, misogynistic man, how dare you? That is the only female-led superhero movie, and it's your least favorite? But, but, but I like Black Widow and Scarlet Witch. It's not fair. Why couldn't they get a movie? <laughs> because of sexist, misogynistic men like you. Oh, yeah, she's worthless. She's a horrible, horrible character, really bad role model. Her whole story makes no sense whatsoever. All of the people who are oppositions in her lives present basically zero threat, and she beats them at the beginning and at the end. Until they tie her up randomly, she's put into a machine, and she realizes that the power limiter on her neck was only limiting her power for as long as she believed it was limiting her power, which is the most nonsensical payoff I think I've ever seen in terms of a <laughs> hero becoming their true selves. She randomly learns to fly, it's it's so hilarious. It's like you even like you didn't matter steel like work its ass off to get Superman to the point of flying. And but a lot of people hate that movie. It's just like Captain Marvel. She just went, yeah, I can fly. Lol. It's like, oh, cool. You you'd think you'd want to make that a huge moment for your uh, for your character, but nah, she could just fly. She could also travel at the speed of light because why not? And she can breathe in outer space. It's uh, yeah, it's a disaster. Captain Marvel is just the worst of the MCU. It's it's everything bad about the MCU. So I was prepared for you to answer that one. So prior to Captain Marvel coming out, what was your least favorite Marvel movie? So that's a toss up between Iron Man three, Black Panther, Thor two, Incredible Hulk. Uh, I'm trying to think of. I think that I want to say I think that's it. I think the rest sit just above them. Um, Iron Man three makes me the most angry. I think they screw with Tony's character the most in that one. It really, really bugs me as well as uh, the cheap twist with the Mandalor Mandalorian Mandarin. <laughs> um, and a lot of stuff makes no sense in that storyline. And the villain is awful. It's some nerd who was like, "Come meet me sometime," and Tony was like, "Okay," and then he doesn't. It's like, oh. <laughs> Do you remember the scene? where he explains why he's captured Pepper. Do you remember? He I said, watched he, that movie. A she few. says, it's because I'm a trophy. And he goes, yes. He captures her because she's his trophy. Well, some people are simple like that. Oh, it's so lame. <laughs> <laughs> I know. When you have million dollars and that's the highest potential you have. And so, yeah, the other ones, like, uh, like Thor 2 just bores me. Uh, Incredible Hulk mostly bores me. Black Panther's mostly boring, but also kind of infuriating because I really liked Black Panther before Black Panther. But uh, Iron Man 3 pissed me off the most. So I'd probably say that's my least favorite behind Captain Marvel. Mm. All right. Well, then, uh, here, here's a controversial question for you. 
Uh, when you first saw Civil War, were you on Cap's side or Iron Man's side, and how did that change after watching Endgame? I'm, I was on Iron Man's side, and I'm still on Iron Man's side. <laughs> The, uh, I'm much more of a pragmatist than, uh, a, I guess you could call it a paladin. So There's this like uh, archetypes as follows, but I agree with Iron Man that um, if we do the get the answer that causes the least harm for the longest time, I think that's the most realistic way to do it. I think that we want to operate as heroes under a, any form of accountability because that's how the world works. We can't just decide who we save and who we don't. We need some kind of third party. We need the countries, the people to be involved. And uh, if that means having a, a group of people be like, Thanos is invading, you're allowed to go kill him. Or there's an explosion that's gone off in some distant country, town in some place. You're not allowed to go there because there's nothing to do with us. Um, I'm okay with the idea that they give us that order and then we discuss whether or not we're going to subvert that order or not. Because ultimately, we can do a lot to operate underneath this 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 particular said government, especially Tony, he's got plenty of ways to do it. And as Black Widow says, it's probably better to have one hand on the wheel versus essentially becoming vigilantes, which is the option that I think Cap is on board with, which I think leads to a lot of bloodshed, being that we keep trying to save the world, but also fight the world at the same time, which to me is like so best uh, accentuated by the scene with the, um, the police that go after Bucky. The amount of injury and collateral damage that was involved there just because Cap was trying to protect Bucky. It's like, it's uh, staggering and it gets very concerning with what that could mean for the future. And so I would rather go underneath the, um, the world police of governments of the UN, whatever, for as long as we can. If they start to get us to do unethical stuff, then yeah, we'll become vigilantes, fine. I want to say a joke, but I feel like it's just going to get clipped. <laughs> um... That was the best explanation for a wrong answer I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's the realistic choice and it's the compromise between technically the two teams, but it is what Iron Man is advocating for. He's saying that we should just do it. Because if you remember, and this is the part that a lot of people seem to forget, because I had this conversation with YMS, Iron Man is not advocating for the government to have complete control over the heroes. And what's evidenced by this is the fact that he finds out the Cap and to he knows where Cap and Winter Soldier are. And he goes to help them while not telling the government anything, even though he signed the accords at that point. He absolutely plans to operate uh, irrelevant of the government still, and I agree with him. Let's let's not become vigilantes for as long as we can. Mm. Well, I respectfully disagree with you, and we will move on to the next question. Very well. Uh, You've said many times you base your Marvel videos completely on what's on screen without the reference of comics or uh, air quotes source material. Uh, can you explain why? And have you ever had any interest in the comics outside of the movies? Um, I've never been a comic reader, but I could totally see myself reading some of the ones that maybe people would refer to as the best. As for why um, I don't make arguments that originate from uh, source materials is it's essentially the whole uh, adaptation versus sequel or prequel sort of argument. I think that um, those are applied differently depending on what kind of continuities we're looking at. Like, should a character be the way they are in their source when adapted is a very complicated question. And I think that it only tells us the quality of the adaptation versus the quality of the writing in, in the particular story that was created as a result. And the, the problem I have is if we decide that anything that is unfaithful to an original source, uh, we start to have to throw out a lot of amazing creations because we've decided that we're locking in potential writers. And the, and I think, it you know, there's a lot of things that experiment with this in narrative being like else worlds, I think, the DC do and um, different timelines and stuff. And so uh, the ones we usually reference are Shawshank, The Shining, and... Uh, uh, Hill House. These these are properties that uh, we should all collectively condemn if we're going to go with the idea that they should be loyal and faithful to their sources. While I think um, we can condemn them for not being faithful, while simultaneously appreciating them for what they've achieved in their crafts, uh, irrelevant of adaptation. And, and so when looking at the MCU, I want to judge how well it stays in continuity with the prequel slash sequels of its own world and its own content rather than uh, 
sticking it to the comics. And it wouldn't really work with me anyway, because I'd need to read all of them and uh, become very uh, well-versed in them. And I know a lot of YouTubers are very uh, good at addressing them from that point of view anyway. So, um, yeah, that's probably it. I just know that that's a question that I've uh, heard or, you know, people say a lot. Uh, but I know that uh, The Shining is the one that I hear the most about as far as like, oh, it's not a, it's a bad adaptation, but it's a great movie on its own. And so just looking at it for what it is uh, and explaining from there. But I know it gets sensitive when you have something like with a source material that's been loved for decades mm -hmm. and then you make the adaptation or air quotes adaptation if you want to perceive it that way uh so i hope that that uh satisfies uh that people that wanted to hear the answer to that question very in-depth answer by the way thank you for that uh who is your favorite marvel hero yeah that'd be iron man <laughs> really very very flawed uh but trying his best to right the wrongs that is both his life and his legacy have essentially committed and uh I empathize with a lot of the mistakes he makes, and I think they're very real. And uh, I think it's helped a lot by Robert Downey Jr.'s performance. Um, he convinces me pretty much entirely as a very real uh, character. Um, but I like a lot of them in there. I really like Cap. I like, um, I'm coming to like a lot of, you know, like Doctor Strange, for example. I'm really hoping that his second movie can, can get me to, to really get invested in him because I'm running out of people to be invested in. I'm a very big fan of Tom Holland Spider-Man, as much as that may or may not be controversial, depending on what fan base we're currently talking to. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's all very complicated, but uh, yeah, Iron Man would probably be the favorite. Hmm. And then, uh, who is your favorite Marvel villain? Uh, Thanos and Vulture. If I had to choose between them, I'm not entirely sure which one I would go with. Probably Vulture, because there's a couple of things about Thanos that irk me like what um i'd really like a character to challenge him on the repercussions of his choices the kind of obvious ones like do you know how much you can destroy ecosystems and um populations by halving them randomly like uh the damage you kind of cause and then of course the uh the fact that they repopulate are you just going to do this again do you think this is a permanent solution and you're halving populations that may very well be at the point of just being able to survive because of their population, if you know what I mean. They're just getting started, and you've just erased them by doing so. So I would have liked a character to challenge him on all of these and for the writers to come up with um, character-justified reasons for him to think that they're not strong criticisms. Yeah, I mean, I think Doctor Strange might have been a perfect uh, character to do that on the planet, have a intellectual debate with Thanos about it while... Mm -hmm. The rest of them are trying to, uh, you know, get get the get the gauntlet away. Uh, so I, I was not expecting Iron Man to be uh, your favorite hero. So then, how did you uh, feel about what happens to him in Endgame? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was uh, I was very invested in that. Um, I have since had trouble sort of uh, getting my feelings straight on the movie, specifically my feelings. Not the um, it's very easy to tear apart Endgame for how much it doesn't make sense. But uh, what bothers me so much about his last scene now is nothing to do with him. It's to do with everyone else. There are several characters that can save his life, and they don't because he needs to die. That's plotline-wise. He just has to die there. Um, several of them know how to use the Time Stone, and they have access to it. So you could just reverse him. Um, I guess I don't know what repercussions that may have for uh, <laughs> unsnapping. I don't know what would happen mechanically. But you also have the fact that a lot of people can put on that glove and just bring him back with a snap. Like, bring back anybody who died in that fight. And if you're going to be like, well, that might hurt them to the point of possibly killing them, I would probably just be like, yeah, they could save a lot of lives by getting hurt. Uh, I don't know. It, it all feels very awkward when thinking about how all mechanics work. Um, I don't believe that Black Widow can be dead. They just say that she's just dead and you can't undo that. And I'm just like, you guys like poof people back into existence. I don't see why you can't just do that with her. And uh, so a lot of that, the payoff of him dying to save everybody perfectly works with everything that I think we've had built up since his first film, the whole don't waste your life sort of thing. And the fact that he's had so much PTSD and anxiety over whether or not all the people he loves are safe and the world is safe from a lot of the damage that he's created and the last lines that he gets given from Pepper being that they're going to be okay and he can rest. I think that's pretty much perfect. But the mechanics of a lot of the stuff that surround it bother me. 
Um, but yeah, I enjoyed it for the most part. Certainly on my first viewing, I thought it was great. Yeah, um, I was sorely disappointed, but uh, they they forgot about Vision too. Nobody brought back Vision. All right, people. True, that's another character that not only did they not bring back, but they didn't even talk about really. I think they have a moment at the end with uh, Scarlet Witch is like, "Damn, sucks that he's dead." I guess. And nobody uh, could undo that. It's not like uh, you could have just given the shit to Captain Marvel, and she would have been completely fine snapping it. But yeah, uh, yeah. And you know what? If she died to do it, well. <laughs> we'll be fine. That's an exchange I think we could all agree is just, you know, we get Vision and Iron Man back in exchange for Captain Marvel. I, I, can, can everybody, do we agree with that? I think we do. I think that's a unanimous uh, thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could have a superpower, what would it be? Oh, this one gets asked, doesn't it, a lot. It's kind of, there's, there's just pros and cons to everything, and, and I wonder what the limits are. Can I do the, can I do the cheat where I say the power to have any power? No. <laughs> uh, so immortality is a tempting one, just because you get to do something that no other human could ever do. And uh, but I guess it, like, I wonder how it would work. Like, what age do you stop aging, and can you still die from diseases, or is it is it like invincibility? I wonder. I don't know. Well, you'd have to watch everyone around you die. So immortality after a while could get if you're the only one that's immortal. Well, a thing isn't beautiful because it lasts, right? Yeah, I, so. I stole that from Vision. That's a Vision quote. Um, um, let's see. Sorry about that. The construction's got really loud. Uh, okay. If given a chance with complete creative freedom, would you rather write a Marvel or Star Wars movie? And what would it be about? Star Wars and my entire thing would be to fix everything they did in, in any way I could think of doing. <laughs> or um, ignoring all of it and just doing my own story about Something distant, probably R-rated. I would want to go. I want to take Star Wars to a crazy place because they destroyed all of it. Um, maybe like a um, a Jedi hunting bounty hunter type person, or um, maybe a Jedi that hunts down remaining exiled uh, Empire members. You know, something much more linear than uh, a lot of the grand scale of Star Wars. Something a bit more personal, kind of like Mandalorian, but not bad. Hopefully. And uh, a little bit more darker. Let's 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 address some some scary stuff. Maybe maybe even have a horror Star Wars. That could be cool. Who knows? Sorry about that. Um, let's see. Now we're we're gonna make a, a little bit of a shift from Star Wars and Marvel. Uh, tell us about your entire experience slash evolution of watching Game of Thrones. Oh. So season one, I was taken away. Season two, I remember the main feeling was just upset that there wasn't more to watch. Season three, I adored. I thought it was fantastic. And then season four was all amazing. And I really liked what they did with Oberyn, casting and performance and execution. I loved him in the book. Up until the last episode of season four, where they fuck up a couple of things all at once. And the primary one being the whitewashing of Tyrion Lannister. He's essentially a villain in the book at that point because of everything that led to him basically having his life destroyed by all the people around him in the world itself just just in the same way that Ned Stark dies in the end of season one these events are almost unavoidable and they just dodged it at the end of season four because Peter Dinklage is beloved and can't have him be a bad guy so they erase a lot of uh, he doesn't kill Shay in self-defense in the book he doesn't um, give Jamie some of the most horrifying news that he could have in the in the show. They, they remove a whole bunch of things. The whole Taisha storyline is um, screwed with, and it really annoyed me. And I was like, I felt a little bit betrayed to the point where I was almost out. And then I watched season five, and I remember season five being the season that everyone else was like, yeah, this is actually uh, getting pretty shit compared to the first selection. And I was like, well, I don't even care, because I already hated it. And then I kept <laughs> watching it. Because <laughs> I was like, I'm still around. Then season six happened, and um, I, along with many other people, were like, season six was all right. See, you know, there's lots of good stuff in season six. You know, it, was, it, it wasn't the worst thing ever. And then season seven happened, and I remember just feeling like I have to keep watching it now to see how it ends. Um, and I remember going on the subreddits for uh, each of the episodes, and once the the wall episode happened, I mentioned this on Gary's stream. Um, 
it was a disaster. Everybody was just like that wall episode. Nothing made any sense. It was terrible. Um, and we were like, well, they got one more. Let's hope they pull it together. And uh, <laughs> wow, it's it's another one of those realizations where you watch it and you're like, whoa, I was way more invested in this than I ever thought I was. Because episode three, when I slowly started to realize that that was it for the White Walkers after all this time, I was very upset. So that was my experience. Because <laughs> uh, at that point, it was destroyed. And then the rest of season eight buried all the other characters. And now Game of Thrones has essentially exited pop culture discussion. Yeah, it's just known as the the, the worst uh, ending of all time. The the biggest uh, ten, 10 years in the making. And that's what we got. And uh, for those of you that do not know, uh, Mahler and Jeremy are actually the ones that told me. Uh, cause I, I gave them permission to tell me what happens. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> that was not what uh, anyone I don't think was expecting. Uh, the, the king needs to be the best storyteller. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, that wasn't even the best storyteller. Ugh. Oh, that witch and the, the, the flashback scene was a better storyteller. You mean the best story, right? <laughs> yeah. The, um, yeah, everybody there had a better story. The Brad's story was shit. He was like, just been carted around for half the show. They really fucked up. Yes. Yes, they did. Uh, if you could change one character's arc, what would it be? And when in the series, what had happened? Oh, I guess I have to rescue Daenerys. If I can only rescue one character, it has to be the one that they damage the most and is kind of the most important. So, yeah, we'll save her and we'll have it be that she specifically burns Cersei out of the top of her tower, um, just obliterates her with fire, and as a result, the, the castle crumbles and it kills most, if not everybody, inside it and the people around it, which Cersei had placed in to try and prevent Daenerys from doing that. And then we have... Well, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I would have the other characters be very critical of her for that to the point where they no longer trust her and think she's essentially lost her shit, which I think is much more reasonable than her hunting down innocent women and children in the middle of streets just to burn them alive. See, to me, that was a bit much, you know, just a bit. It's kind of uh, the exact opposite of everything that she was, uh, you know, going for. But, uh, yeah. Uh, whose death were you most disappointed by and how would you have fixed it so it did the character justice? So we got Daenerys was just stabbed by Jon, so I was pretty meh. Uh, Jamie had a building fall on him. Cersei had a building fall on her. Um, <laughs> oh, Jorah. Well, I, I guess I was thinking of good guys first. Jorah was just stabbed by a random knife. That was pretty shit. He survived since episode one to be killed that way. It's like, <laughs> oh, okay. I, why didn't they let him get killed by White Walkers? You, this is what I mean about people don't know how to kill anyone anymore. All you have to do is have him absolutely annihilating the zombies because he's like one of the best swordsmen in the show that remains. And then you have one White Walker show up. And so we're like, uh oh, he's going to have trouble with this. And then a second one show up. And so he has to try and take on two. And there's just no way that he's winning. And um, maybe he takes out one before getting killed by the other, and then someone can come in and save Daenerys from being killed, because God forbid we prevent her from killing women and children in the later episodes. But um, yeah, just give them give them more you know dignified deaths than a random zombie plugging a knife into his extremely expensive armor. <sighs> <laughs> I, it would have been epic if he would have gotten killed by a White Walker and then risen and then you know, trying to kill Danny, and then she has to figure out how to kill him, or somebody else has to come in and save her. Because for some reason, yeah, that would be extremely tragic. Uh, it would have been one of those like fucked up character moments, like where you'll have you know nightmares about it the rest of your life. For at least she would. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, who did you want to end up on the Iron Throne? Uh, Tywin, easily. Really. He would be the best ruler for, for Game of Thrones. Most people who like go through all of it uh, often come to the conclusion that it's probably an antagonist because all the heroes are so naive. <laughs> it's often the people who are more evil are actually the better at um, understanding what needs to be done and where for the most efficient society to run. And 
yeah, I feel like um, judging from what we understand about uh, the Mad King's rule, when Tywin was um, his hand, that was like some of the most prosperous times the kingdom ever had because Tywin's very clever. Um, oh, Tywin. Lucky he got killed before the show went to shit. Uh, was that a pun? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> was it a purposeful pun? Oh, well, I mean... Uh, can, can, does, a, does a pun lose its potency if it was done by accident? I'm going to claim it was on purpose now. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, who did you think was going to end up on the Iron Throne versus who you wanted? I think when I was talking about it with Wolf before we saw the season, um, my concern was that they would put Danny on there when I think that she doesn't deserve it. And then I thought the most likely thing would be that it would be Danny and John ruling together. And that was going to be the the sort of generic ending where I would be like, well, that's the ending, I guess. Not impressive, but not terrible. Um, I never would have thought it'd be Bran. And as soon as I read that spoiler, I was like, no, like this can't be real. Let's see. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry, I lost my place on my uh, question list. Which are we... We've gotten through half of it, by the way. We're only at halfway. I said we've gotten past halfway. Oh, <laughs> it's a, uh, I have no. Was it? Are we at, am I allowed to know what number it is? I'm curious. <laughs> uh, now I don't want to tell you. Oh. <laughs> uh, we're at sixty-four. Oh, out of fifty, or was it seventy? Uh, uh, eighty-one. Oh, okay. And then there's the, the 10 that I ask everyone. And then we get to the super chat questions. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, how do you feel when people judge things more on nostalgia for characters than the movie in isolation? And mm. I have to rephrase that, not just for characters, but like this nostalgia on the movie itself and characters within it. Oh, so like maybe a, an old movie where I'm trying to be critical of it and then maybe people aren't uh, that on board with it because they're very nostalgic for the characters or do you mean something like adapting well-beloved content into a sort of newer style i'm talking about when you uh, let me read this is uh let me rephrase this uh like the question was in itself and i i think i phrased this very uh, poorly uh how do you feel when people judge things uh more on nostalgia for you know the characters in the movie itself than the movie in isolation. So you're not looking at it objectively because well, yeah, I mean, it, it can be frustrating. Like if if I was to ask them what it is, what it is that makes them love it so much, I would expect um, them to appeal to having watched it when they were younger. I do with a lot of stuff I love, but uh, if I'm like, why is it so well constructed? And then they cite the fact that they saw it when they were younger, I'd be like, uh, that's not really what I was asking, but okay. <laughs> like, you, you know, I, I'd like to say I wouldn't get frustrated. I would just uh, want to clarify with them, hopefully, and get a get a answer out of them that I was looking for. Well, because I think uh, this is a critique that's thrown at, like, uh, like, people like you and I, is that, oh, well, you only care about Luke Skywalker, and you're upset about The Last Jedi because you watched it when you were a kid, and it's never going to be as good as when you are a kid. And so getting that uh, the nostalgia thrown back at us. Mm -hmm. as a, you know, a discrediting thing. How do you uh, address that when you're coming, uh, when you're doing your EFAP and people are using that against you? Um, we, it's mostly something to ignore, I imagine, because just like that's not addressing our arguments. So never mind. You know, because you can just essentially reverse it and it means just as much. I'll be like, your lack of uh, whatever is blinding you from being able to understand the reality of blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, it's just so substanceless to a degree that you just want to kind of move on. Mm -hmm. I agree with that 100%. Uh, how do you approach critiquing when you personally have nostalgia or a bias for a film? Um, I would imagine a lot of it's to do with getting it peer reviewed, being like, am I being way too positive or negative about this thing or is this fair? Um, and so, you know, a lot of uh, friends I have are creators and a lot of them aren't, but either way, they're, they're all very helpful in uh, figuring out where I might be going wrong in terms of um, getting an accurate sort of read on a thing. And, you know, I, I fall into it just as much as everyone else with stuff that I've just loved since I was younger or loved in general and disliked in general. So 
yeah, get it, getting um, getting it proofed by friends can often uh, help you rid yourself of potential biases, but also looking at other people's reviews, right? Like, I watched a lot of people who um, were very positive about TLJ, and I was just like, yep, a lot of these arguments are very flawed, <laughs> as opposed to, uh, oh gosh, I was I was missing out on all these details that make TLJ make complete sense. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a painful one to stomach when people say that. <laughs> um, all right, now we're going to move into uh, more uh, in-depth psychological questions for you. Oh my. Uh, who has been your biggest inspiration? Hmm. So this is like, uh, I guess this could count as real people versus anything in general. Yes, you can pick. Um, I mean, I have I have s s relatively sappier answers. <laughs> like, <laughs> I got, uh, my my bub is a pretty huge inspiration in terms of uh, sort of fighting for what you believe in. Throughout my life, I've always seen her uh, stick up for anybody she thought that was. Uh, in the right, but downtrodden, and um, definitely one to fight against injustice, sort of thing. And I've always been very proud of her proactive positions with a lot of um, stances she holds to be not only true, but uh, right. And then um, different teachers across uh, my life that have been quite inspiring. My, I, when I went on a foundation course for art and design, I've, I've spoken about him before, but there was a fine art teacher who was very um, kind, but kind but critical of work. He wanted to get people to improve. He didn't want to soften it just to help people's feelings. He was very concerned with everybody being able to create the things that they want to see themselves create. So um, I would say the, the two of the several uh, people that I would say are uh, inspirational. And then, you know, there's, there's, there's fictional characters as well that can sort of uh, act in that regard. I would say um, a lot of the dare I say themes of Buffy and Angel, uh, I've talked about before, but they're um, very inspiring. Buffy and Angel tries to address the meaning of life and um, uh, how do you how do you dry, derive meaning from life if there is no um, big finish and greater goal to work toward? Uh, what is what does it mean for us all if um, we're ultimately not heading? Well, obviously, it's a rather atheistic pr approach. Um, almost reaches levels of nihilism, but they try and pull you back out and give you. Um, sort of set path to understand uh, why we all do what we do, why we fight, and why we fight for what is right. And uh, all of those things are sort of inspirational to more of what makes my character versus my content, I suppose. Oh. All righty. Interesting answer. Uh, who knows you best? Um, that would probably be Smiler Al. He's appeared on EFAP a few times. He's been, uh, he's my longest known friend person uh, he's known me now i feel like it's been 10 years possibly 15 it's hard to keep track but uh yeah he would he would probably know me the best and he often um when he's in different uh, servers or forums people ask about different questions about what i've seen or what i like and he'll be able to easily answer the questions pretty much entirely accurately <laughs> <laughs> uh what question do you get asked the most often have you seen XYZ? <laughs> it's always, have you seen this and what did you think? And it's always like, hmm. Uh, and yeah, I think a lot of people don't like to hear that I don't like the thing that they like, which is natural with a lot of content creators, but uh, that's that's a very, very common one. I, I mean, realistically speaking, it's a, it's a very like lame response, but unironically, the most common question I get is, when is TFA Part 3 coming out? <laughs> yeah, I think that's more of a current question right now. For a year. <laughs> yeah. It makes complete sense, and it is coming out. Um, when did you discover uh, your talent for impressions? Uh, I guess it's kind of hard to know that it's a talent or not, but I started doing them when I was watching good old classic Simpsons. I was just trying to impersonate all the characters, and then when Family Guy and American Dad and Futurama came along, I was just trying to get all of them done as well. And then... Uh, I liked, them? sorry? Can you do all of them? No, no, uh, certainly not now, like, because I haven't <laughs> seen them and practiced them in so long, but uh, the only real thing that stands in your way when it comes to uh, changing your voice is pitch, because, like, it's really hard to, uh, 
like the low and, and highs you can't you can't just be, become a high pitched voice uh, at will but like accents they take time to learn but everybody can essentially change their accent um, once they figure out how to move their mouth, tongue, throat, whatever else. And um, yeah, I just found it fun to sort of mess around with it. And there always there's plenty of awful impressions, right? But then some I could almost get, and I'd be like, oh my god, this is how they do it. Those those <laughs> crazy voice actors. And yeah, it, it can create a lot of fun then with uh, you know entertainment. You can make voices, and uh, I've tried to use it for um, making jokes on EFAP or recreating or changing a scene in uh, TFA. I think I did it in the TLJ video and I'm trying to do it in some other stuff just um, and you know the, the scripts themselves when being read out is a form of voice acting um, and then the Goodell videos they, they be voice acting so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun and I, I did a voice acting for about uh, two years before I uh, managed to finally uh, kick off with YouTube as well yeah uh, you did a couple of video games correct Yes, uh, the 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 biggest one being the um, uh, Empires of the Undergrowth, I believe. I'm, I'm like the narrator in that game. It's a little ant colony yeah. game. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, what are you most passionate about? Hmm. Um. I guess. Do you mean out of all media, or just out of all everything? All everything. I, I don't really know how to answer that other than saying like life itself. I'm passionate about uh, I like experiences and stuff. So I like uh, learning and conversing and discovering like, all the classic sort of answers. Um, I like life. It's a fun little thing. Um, so I like talking to people and consuming different pieces of content, talking about why they have the effects that they do, and then talking with all the different people that uh, in my life matter to me the most, I suppose. There you go. Uh, what's something no one would guess about you? Um, I guess most people are surprised when they find out I'm six foot four because that's quite a quite a height. <laughs> I, uh, I remember being shocked when I found that out, and was like, oh, "God, <laughs> you guys are all giants." Um, most people are really shocked to find out that Buffy is like my favorite content because they're always like, "Not only is that a really goofy show, but like it's from like the late '90s and." Isn't it like for teenage girls? And so they're always very confused by it. And I'm always like ready and willing to sort of hash it out as to exactly what's going on there. Do people just automatically assume you're gay when you tell them that? Um, I haven't had that said, but there's, there's a very high possibility that they're thinking that. It's, it's <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, uh, I think you kind of touched on this earlier. Uh, what has been a content creator that taught... Uh, you about yourself and what you wanted to do? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say the selection that I gave sort of earlier because uh, each of the bigger attributes of their content I feel was very important to understanding what my goals as a creator was were going to be and um, really important to understand why we feel what we feel, simultaneously important to understand the mechanics and craft that lead to it and then to project a sort of an interest in integrity is really important and to strive for what's uh, better and right versus what <clears throat> benefits you specifically there's lots of lots of things come into it and of course being trying to be entertaining and comedic while while achieving all of this very difficult but uh you know when you when you watch enough of other people trying to do it you think you know what i'm going to give it a shot there you go what are your goals for your channel uh this is the weird thing where i'm at right now is already uh, two and a half the times the size of my ultimate goal was, which was I hope to ultimately reach 100,000 subscribers. That was what I'd originally set out to do once the TLJ stuff happened. I was like, that'll be where I'll be happy. And I am on, I'm honestly happy to just carry on making stuff and uh, there's no numbers that really come into it anymore. Um, I like to talk about what I think does and doesn't work about movies. I like to counter arguments about... Uh, I think the, the let's just say content that's being unfairly propped up or brought down. I like hanging out with friends. I like the creation of uh, what I think are decent enough explanations of, of different movies and stuff for why they, they're working and not. And yeah, I don't necessarily like if someone said, is, is your goal to reach a million subscribers or something? I just be like, I don't really mind anymore. It's not something I really check up on. 
and uh, I'm really happy where I'm at, and uh, I hope to just keep at it. There you go. Um, if you died tomorrow, what is the thing you'd be most proud of? Most proud of? Um, probably the community with EFAP, <laughs> as weird as this is, like all the friends and connections we've made, all the different sort of the, the network of people that are so sort of good at, good to each other while also being able to just be critical and um, have fun and just represent a lot of what I think is the the better parts of media consumption while um, as much as you know we rip into other communities for what we think are their failings uh, we do our best to try and welcome them in as well and and you know there's, there's there's flaws in all different things in every way but I just think that uh, what was created there was something quite special and I like the the whole history of it and um, everybody's involvement is all very, very wonderful and wholesome. Um, as much as I do like my videos and I'm proud of what I made there, it's just that I feel like uh, EFAB really reached out to a lot of people and brought a lot of people together. And uh, it was really fun meeting so many different creators and uh, community members through it. So yeah, it's probably like the most clear and wide reaching element of anything that um, I've helped put together. So it's, pretty cool. <laughs> it's a great thing to be proud of. Uh, who would play you in a movie, both serious and comical? <laughs> um, I really don't know, because I don't even know what that movie would look like, or what, or who, because uh, my brain's going to, like, favorite actors, I guess, that I'm like, wait, would that even make sense? <laughs> like, comedic, it's like, I don't know. Tommy I Wiseau, know. maybe? Danny yeah, DeVito? <laughs> I feel like Danny DeVito would be a really good choice just because he's the complete opposite of a tall long man who is just <laughs> having to review Star Wars movies can be very funny yeah whenever people ask me this I'm always I always immediately want to go to like male actors that I admire as compared to female I'm just like uh yeah, just let Danny DeVito play me. He's about <laughs> the same height as me. Uh, we're very different, but uh, I would love it uh, if it was him. Um, have you ever considered writing your own story? Yeah, uh, but not anytime soon. I really feel like I want to delve into more and more of my favorites or most hated and figure out what is working and what isn't before I try and make something of my own sort of thing. And even if I did, I'd want to start small, like short stories or... Um, like really short stories, like even just a couple of paragraphs just to have some fun with it. Or even um, script doctoring some stuff. I, I like the idea of making stories, but I also really like creating the um, the reviews I've been making in general. So it's, uh, it's like a trade-off. And um, I imagine that if I was to commit to making more stories, it would have to you know wind down quite significantly of the, what I do on YouTube. So but yeah, one day, one day. Uh if yes to the previous question, what kind of story would you tell? Hmm. I really wouldn't want to be limited at all. I'd want to try all kinds of different things. I'd want to probably go through it via genre. Be like trying all the big significant ones and seeing what I could do with each of them. Uh, I, like I said, I haven't got anything particular in mind. I would just like to experiment probably. Gotcha. Um, fictional. Who is your hero? Um, so, like, mo I guess that's most inspiring fictional character, I guess? Yeah, like, you know, when you, I guess, like, when you're a kid and, like, this character, like, n not a real life person, but, like, this is the person that you look up to as a hero. God, there's so many choices. <laughs> um, <laughs> Probably, there's a couple of big ones, but I guess if I was to try and choose one, it's probably going to be Spike from Buffy. Really? This is complicated because anybody listening who hasn't seen all of Buffy will find that answer very confusing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to watch it all, folks. <laughs> yep, you definitely do. Um. In regards to your channel and the way that you've been uh, making your content, is there anything that you wish you would have done differently that you know now that you didn't know then? Hmm. Um, probably all the different like uh, production elements, just uh, 
just sharpening everything. I think I cut a lot of corners earlier on that I'd like to not uh, cut as much. And then also um, the many ways that you can explore content further. Um, I know this is funny coming from me, but like I was always, I felt very limited even in my hour log videos about how much I'm covering about a piece of media. There's a lot more to um, a story. We're not even talking about the other filmmaking elements, just the story that can be talked about. And I still find it utterly ridiculous that people say, that if you're long, if you talk about a movie longer than the movie, then you failed. And it's like it's utter nonsense to me. The amount of man hours that go into creating just a two hour film um, should be reflected in analysis of how those man hours were used and, and what for and trying to figure out how better to utilize them or not. Yeah, and those people, have they haven't watched the making of a movie, <laughs> like the special features and how long those are. All right now, this is the final question before we get on to uh, the, the the ten questions that I mm -hmm. have. Everyone, if you could give advice to an aspiring content creator, what would you tell them? Oh, stuff that's like not generic, because there's some good classic ones out there. Like always follow your heart in terms of what you passionately want to create, but um, try and find something to say that you know other people haven't said yet. Um, try and go for something that is new so we can give you a shot at getting relatively noticed, which is funny coming from me because I didn't do that until TLJ and that's when my actual channel shot off. So technically speaking, that is actually applicable advice to myself. There you go. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. It's, uh, I, I'm trying to think of like advice that's not very common that I do genuinely believe in. And I think part of it would be just, uh, Get yourself a supportive little ring of, of friends that are share interests that you can bounce all your creative ideas off of as well as your actual content so you can see how it's doing in terms of and, and get some honest people don't get those people that just say it's fine you can't do that um but uh have people to to work with and you know rely on to a degree it's always going through life with friends just just magnifies the fundisms i'm just saying <laughs> And uh, it's it's you know it's not something many people really talk about when it comes to individual content creation the the importance of uh, people there with you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, I, I'm I'm on the the fence about uh, at least personally my own taste is uh, I in my own life never been able to completely rely on another human. So I I usually give people the opposite advice: is you can never rely on anyone but yourself. So I guess in this sense, uh, Mahler is a very optimistic person compared to me. Well, <laughs> it's gone, I've been burned plenty of times, but I've also been incredibly impressed by many people across my lifetime. So it's, uh, it is a gamble sometimes, but, uh, you know, believing in people, believing in humanity to some degree is part of what we ought to do to get through the day, <laughs> but they could disappoint for sure. Okay. You are a glass half full kind of person, which is why I think a lot of people like you and admire your work. All right, now on to uh, the 10 questions. So this is the questionnaire that was invented by uh, Bernard Pivot, and then it was utilized by James Lipton in his show for many, many years. Mahler, what is your favorite word? Uh, right now, probably tism. <laughs> it's... It Extremely applicable to all different phrases and words and sentences, and and people will mostly understand what you're saying, even though it's constantly used in different ways. What is your least favorite word? Least favorite word. <laughs> I kind of a meme answer, like the word theme, just because it constantly gets misused or <laughs> used to ignore things that matter, like. So I hate seeing it prop up because I'm always like, oh, here we go again, even though I love themes. So that could be one. Um, I don't really, there's not really, really many words I hate, uh, to be honest. So it's, it's a weird question to answer. I'm not, I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> uh, what turns you on, incites you, inspires you? Um... Wait, so is that like one thing for all of them or? It's because this question, uh, it was an older question. Uh, people have a very different connotation for the beginning of that. So it was expanded <laughs> upon. Uh, so it, it means like what incites you and inspires you in that sense. Um, sort of, I guess, 
discussions and presentations of like a lot of the 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 core uh i guess thoughts about why we why we all do what we do I get very uh, interested about fundamentals for for what's behind everything that gets done and said and made it's it'll, it's all very interesting to me like why even why humans what do we do why and all of it, it it gets me i get quite passionate thinking about it and i feel like all of media can get drawn back to that sort of fundamental mostly everything gets drawn back to that fundamental because that's uh, that's what we do as a whole is is explore humanity that's what art and media mostly is so yeah i get passionate about all that <laughs> uh what turns you off oh <laughs> taxes <laughs> like, not even not even because of the idea that you you're losing money or whatever just they're just boring and ex excessive and I, I really wish there was uh, easier ways to sort it all out and it's all very very uh obtrusive and annoying but i, I like i said i don't mind the idea of being taxed it's just uh gosh i wish there was more of an efficient way to sort it all out <laughs> very boring but uh yeah you know there's, there's other stuff too like as much as I said, it's it's in my blood as a as a Britishman. I don't like queuing for things. It's horrible. I don't like waiting for stuff. But you gotta be patient. You just it's said the duality of man. Interview that you're British and you guys don't mind being in queues. Uh, relatively, we do. I don't think anybody likes waiting for stuff. <laughs> like, because um, you know that gets associated with like a British person when angry is simply passive aggressive right they'll, they'll just be you, someone will be like are you okay with all this and you'll be like yes i'm fine with this and you'll be like oh while um america is more associated for being more uh, what the negative connotation would be obnoxious but the positive one would be assertive like are you okay with this and like no i'm not okay with this at all this is terrible and um and yet both of those people feel the same way you know it's just a difference of yeah you know waiting for stuff not a fan of that's a turn turn off a turn down that's that's what that is <laughs> Uh, what sound or noise do you love? Hmm. Like a particular sound. Uh, rain, I guess. What sound or noise do you hate? Oh, like cutlery scratching across stuff or, you know, nails chalkboard, that, those sorts of things, the ones that like stab directly into your eardrum. Mm. Uh, what is your favorite curse word? Um, I guess fuck. That's probably like it's so versatile. It's kind of like tism as well. That can be put in all kinds of different ways. A very fun word. <laughs> uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Hmm. So it would probably still be within the art in some kind. I guess because would it would it be too much of a cop out to say I wouldn't mind being a writer? Uh, I mean, you do write. Well, uh, I guess a different form of writing, yeah. Um, I guess, could I say screenplay writer? I guess, yeah. Yeah, it could be fun. Uh, what profession, uh, other than your own, would you not like to do? Um, I mean, there's loads of ones I wouldn't like to do. Like, um, we learned about... Uh, uh, do you know what, we learned about fat bigs on EFAP. They are um, <laughs> it's a it's a form of a thing that happens in the sewer, and and sewage workers would have to take care of it. That is not a job I would like. <laughs> yeah, I don't think many people would. All right, this is the final question. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say to you at the pearly gates? <laughs> I'd hope he's really down to earth, and that there would be a funny explanation for all this stuff, and so. I'd love it if he just did like the A. <laughs> I feel like I'd just start laughing and be like, no way, really? And uh, yeah, I would just hope that anything he would say would imply he's down to earth immediately instead of like some kind of horrible monolith monster that's going to tell me that everything sucks because it has to be that way. <laughs> All right. And that uh, concludes this portion of the interview. And now we will read Super Chats and then. Uh... I will free you from this uh, almost four-hour stream. Mm, nice short one. Yeah, nice short one, right? Uh, Jack Buer, thank you for the super chat. Like the new icon, haven't heard your episode nine opinions. Now, I think this was directed at me and not you. Uh, 
because I'm sure everyone knows how you feel about episode nine. I myself mm -hmm. did not make a video on it. I live tweeted my reaction and I had no desire to uh, do it on my channel. But um, thank you. This is an old avatar. Uh, Mala, do you want to say thank you in case he's talking to you? about your avatar? Thank you in case you're talking about me. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you very much. And uh, episode nine should not exist. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John uh, Machin, thank you for the super chat. I have no hands and I must clap. Count Jebku. <laughs> okay. I think we had, we had a lot of I have no mouth, but I was scream references in the previous EFAP, so I think that's where that's coming from. Gotcha. Uh, thank you for the super chat there. Uh, Cecil, thank you for the super chat. Uh, masked walking through book, Brooklyn wasteland listening. Oh, that sounds terrifying. Mm. Uh, let's see. Uh, Party Alan Sivy, thank you for the super chat. Uh, the Mahler Army's finest. <laughs> Uh, the Aptism Astrates. All right. You know. Um, I recognize the Molar Army part. It's, <laughs> it's coming from Patrick Willems, but I don't know the rest of it. Uh, I'm not sure either. Maybe there's uh, more on Twitter that we have not seen yet. Mm. Uh, Titus Moeller, thank you for the super chat. Have you done the Moeller painting I suggested yet? No, that would be... Again, like, like I said, uh, if I were to get to that and have nothing... Uh, come up in my queue that has to do with uh you know uh work uh then that that would be like a year down the line before i would be able to get to that because i have so much stuff that i need to do and painting uh does not happen quickly so uh yeah no i have not done that yet he wants me to do a painting of you uh with the captain america shield i believe saying i could do this all day with uh all the the memes coming at you from uh <laughs> Sounds awesome. It's it's a great idea. Do I have the time for it right now? I I, I don't. I'm sorry, Mola. That's okay. One day I will get to it, and you you'll be able to see it. Uh, it's a great idea, though. Uh, Peter Pumpkinhead, thank you for the super chat. I'd love to hear both of your opinions on Sargon's new uh, symposium vid about the Jedi philosophy. I have not seen it. Uh, I haven't seen it. So I'm sorry for that. Um, I don't. I don't know Sargon's opinions on Star Wars at all. So uh, I don't. I don't know if you do or not. Uh, oh, it's called the Jedi philosophy is an absolute mess. All right then. <laughs> well then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe you should efap that. I think. I mean, I think he's gonna go strictly from the movies. So. I wouldn't thought he, he's read any of the EU. I don't know if he has. But uh, yeah, you know, that could be interesting. Yeah, I've never spoken to Sargon, so I don't I don't know too much about him. Uh, the only bits that I've heard is when he's been on EFAP with you, when it's not like his uh, scripted videos. But uh, I, I don't know his take on Star Wars at all. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt G, thank you for the super chat. It's a birthday cake. And I don't think it's either of our birthdays because we are both October babies. Yay. Yay, October, best month ever. Yep. Uh, uh, Papyrus of Epirus, thank you for the super chat. Is this supposed to be Mooper? <laughs> no, no, no. Mooper is gone. She'll be back April 1st. Jeez. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, Mooper definitely has a, uh, a very alerting voice that uh, <laughs> I was not expecting. <laughs> Uh, it was thoroughly entertaining, though. Uh, I remember I was listening to it, and I was brushing my teeth, and my boyfriend's like, what are you watching? <laughs> it's, a, it's a parody, and he's like, okay, good. <laughs> uh, James Cannon, thank you for a super chat. Uh, hello, Anna and Mahler. Thank you for all the content you guys have provided as I'm working at night from the hospital here in Detroit. Oh, geez. Thank you for that. Uh, mm. uh it helps me by. I have a question for Mahler. Did you graduate from university in English? English? No, no, I didn't take English for university. I uh, strictly did art. Um, I did uh, English language for A level. I passed that. Um, and I enjoyed it. English language is fun. What kind of art did you study? Like, do you draw? 
Uh, it was illustration specifically, and it was well. I did some drawing back in the day. Um, it's around in my house somewhere, but uh, I it was the only subject that I had any interest in. But it was, still wasn't even necessarily the one I wanted to pursue. It's just the one I went with because I didn't know what else to go with. Mm, that's a that's a well. At, is university free where you are, or no? No. <laughs> so I, I've, got, I've got student loans to pay back if that's what you mean. Oh, uh, yeah, because I was, I remember some of my friends were telling me, because they are from uh, Ireland, and they were telling me how cheap it is to go to medical school there. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know what it's like over there. I have not uh, investigated that. Uh, Andrew Fritz, thank you for the super chat. Mahler, you seem to be good about blowing off a lot of the noise. Has any of it actually ever gotten to you? Um, any of it that any ever gets close to... Um... I usually rely on that sort of social circle I was telling you about. So I have lots of what I consider very close friends, and the idea will be to just just hang out with them for a bit and talk about how absurd all of it is, and it can calm you right down. Or at least it, it works for me if ever I feel like it's getting a bit much. I mean, th there's a that that Willem's tweet's gone out today. There's loads of content creators that are all piling on it again. You got High Top, Eighty Eighty Chat, Nando versus Movies. Uh, what's her name? Lindsay Ellis, Movie Bob, they're all like, yep, ball is the worst. And it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's just all based on some guy who said that he's gonna, he thinks that Patrick Williams is a terrible person and that the Mauler army is gonna destroy him, which, have you ever heard me use the phrase Mauler army before? <laughs> no, it's the toxic brood, those I was gonna say, swine. how could they how could get that wrong? Because they're uncultured swine. And so, but but like I think the more it goes on, the less effect it has because it's becoming more and more funny. It's like the whole like the 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 Trump support, the 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 alt right, the white nationalist, any comments like this. I'm always just like, how do you get this from my videos? I'm fine with you finding them long, but this stuff is just getting like parody levels. And obviously, my fans just find it hilarious as well. There's not even much to argue. You're just like, wow, that's interesting. So yeah, um, if ever. It got to be a bit much. Um, I have a lot of friends that I can rely on to sort of uh, calm me down or talk it out and just make sure that it's not getting to me on any kind of deeper level. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Andy from the UK from the UK. Thank you for the super chat. Hello, Andy. Uh, hey, Anna. Hey, Mahler. Hope you're both doing well. Uh, doing my best here. Enjoying listening to you both. Keep up the amazing work. Take care and take safe. Well, thank you for that. And yes, everyone, uh, the, the plague is uh, going crazy around the world. So everyone stay safe. Mm -hmm. uh, Drake is six. Thank you for the super chat. Anna, what's great about Buffy, uh, Star Trek, The Next Generation, DS9, etc. The episode do not always have happy endings, i.e. Buffy. Oh, it's spoiler. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I remember, I remember seeing that one, yeah. Uh, gotta be careful, because the show is so old now that loads of people don't know a lot of the significant well, I, I know, but I'm just... To anyone yeah, that yeah. wants to get in Buffy, I'm not gonna read that out. Um, uh, and then, Yeah, that spoiler is honestly one of the greatest episodes in both shows. It's amazingly well made. Uh, yeah, don't... Um, guys, this is one thing. I know I spoil some things, but... Um, if there's people that don't want to hear, that's why I at least always give a uh, spoiler warnings. Actually, I, I shouldn't. I can't lecture people on this. I'm being a hypocrite right now, and I'm catching myself being a hypocrite uh, because I do spoil things uh, sometimes without. Well, I mean, if but... someone was to spoil Buffy and uh, they they did it with like righteous indignation, they were like, "No, I absolutely should be able to do this." I'd probably be like, "Well, it is." It is very old. I'm not going to necessarily have a problem with it. But if you can avoid spoiling stuff, may as well go for it. But if you really need to talk about that particular spoiler, then it's all right. It's all right. Especially if the thing is 20 years old. <laughs> well, I'm not going to read out the spoiler. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd advise uh, to view, if you're going to do a spoiler, then uh, you know, take into mind that other people might get upset. Because that is something that I have had to uh, learn. Uh, especially when it's something that is 20 years old. But uh Buffy is great. Uh, I have I haven't watched it in a long time, but uh, right now I'm going to have a very different answer than I did before uh, it happened. But I know uh, it was my one of my sister's favorite shows. So because it brought her so much happiness, it that it means a lot to me. 
in that sense. And uh, I know a few years ago, I would have a very different answer, but that is uh, something that is the answer now. Uh, Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, it was, uh, it, I said this on uh, Doomcock's channel, actually. Uh, so it, Captain Picard taught me how to deal with my rage in a time when uh, I was dealing with a lot of stuff. And he showed me how to be diplomatic in a time when you don't want to and how to do that. And so it means something very special to me. Deep Space Nine, I think, got more into the grittiness that is Star Trek. And uh, I, I am uh, probably in the minority on this. Fuck Bajor. Uh, the Bajorans are the worst, most uh, un... Uh, I don't, I'm not sympathetic to them at all, and uh, I'm honestly kind of more on Cardassia's side and all of that. But uh, it's great to watch that and to experience it. Molo, have you ever watched any of The Next Generation or Deep Space Nine? No, but I, I've heard they're very, very good from lots of people, so maybe one day. They are. Uh, and do you want to answer the Buffy question better? Because mine's a little bit more... Uh, oh, like, why, why do I like it? Why is it great? Um... Because it has very raw and what I would call real character arcs that spread across many, many seasons that break characters down and rebuild them up as something very different based on harsh events that happen to them uh, while simultaneously having a lot of the larger and smaller stories address a lot of the bigger problems that we face when uh, thinking about how we should operate epi ethically and uh, pragmatically throughout everything. And it, it has a lot of... Um, hard things to go over for both heroes and villains and uh, addresses responsibility, uh, grief, depression, solace, and uh, generally it's very inspiring content despite getting very dark at certain points. Um, and it's, it's something I've watched since I was like, I believe seven, uh, possibly six. So it was, it's, it's very close to my heart and, uh, I think it, they've achieved a hell of a lot of amazing stuff throughout that show. But the first few seasons, very, very rocky. <laughs> when you watch season one and two, people are like, how is this your favorite show? And I'm like, she's just got to wait, wait. <laughs> and see, that always shows like that shows do have the potential to get better. That's why like with The Mandalorian, I'm, I'm like, it could get better if they brought in other writers. But one of the things I actually loved about Buffy was it did a really good job of explaining uh, why some vampires are good and other vampires are bad like with the soul thing yeah that's a very complicated thing that we could we could go over but i assume that <laughs> you might want to move on or not i don't know it's but it's a very well established exactly how the mechanics work and it helps you understand a lot about what characters make what choices and why well that that's a really big part of it though mm -hmm. it's like and i i just remember as a kid like that was the first time you ever got an explanation for it because I, I like vampire movies and like monster movies. And so like every time I'd watch Dracula or like a movie that had vampires like Underworld and stuff like that, it's like I, there was no clear cut answer because, you know, they're monsters. So they're inherently uh, bad, especially if they're vampires, you know, because they have to feed off of a human for, you know, their source of life. Mm -hmm. So because I remember, oh, fuck, I don't want to spoil when uh, the one guy is has his soul and then he loses it again and he uh that messes up the relationship between him and the character and it's like it gets you in the feels i was like oh. yeah and it's perfectly like it, it makes sense in that way as compared to just oh he's bad now like there's a reason behind it mm-hmm I like, I like that stuff. Uh, where is the next one? Uh, Ransom G, thank you for the super chat. If you ever want the real Carol Danvers as a likable person, try Miss Marvel, best of the best comic book. Nobody's more pissed off about Captain Marvel than me. Should be Miss Marvel instead. Complete betrayal. Well, thank you for that recommendation. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that there's a lot of stuff about uh, Miss Marvel and Captain Marvel and what it actually was, like the fact that the very first uh, essence of the character was she was Miss Marvel and she was standing next to a man and that's how she got her powers. <laughs> Obviously, they're not going to do that. But uh, no. could you imagine how crazy Twitter would be? Oh, the articles. The articles would be everywhere. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my god uh let's see uh whiskers voice thank you for the super chat uh re movies are great uh not objectively go what what is like re movies are great what is that supposed to mean uh i'm not sure Mo movies are great but not objectively i guess is yeah, it the... says re movies are great not objectively go Are they asking movies that we like that are, are kind of bad or like Batman and Robin? <laughs> I don't I don't know. It just says RE. I don't know what RE stands for. Anyone in the chat knows. Uh it was well, I mean RE was used to sort of signify response, right? Or no? I don't know. Hmm. I, I I don't know. Oh, Resident Evil. Uh does the question make sense if it, if RE was Resident Evil? Uh, Resident Evil movies are great, not objectively, go. Oh, right. Yeah, uh, those movies are uh, interesting, to say the least. Resident Evil fans are not hugely into them. Um, I... So here's a weird thing. My sister is a really big horror fan, and so we watched them all as kids, and it was kind of like a family thing to watch the Resident Evil movies, along with uh, this is going to sound even worse, the human centipede movies. So we would watch those as a family because we would, we would take turns picking what movie. And so my sister always picked the, those ones. And so uh, I, I very much remember uh, from Blockbuster renting the, uh, the two pack of Resident Evil one and two and watching it with the family. So uh, it's more of a nostalgia thing for me. I mean, I actually like the first one. <laughs> I think it's it's not too bad. Just as a, a, a but adaptation wise, it's probably a disaster, I guess. But uh, you know, um, and I saw the second one in the cinema. I think with Nemesis, that was interesting. <laughs> I just thought it was stupid when his point was, "Let me kill the guy that could potentially cure everyone and get this under control to make my point." I was like, "You idiot!" Yeah. But uh, I mean, I. I'm biased in a way that I I just have that nostalgia to like them. Uh, I haven't watched them back uh, in years, so I don't know how they hold up. But um, I was very happy, uh, the one when they are in uh, Vegas and the dude from The Mummy comes back. I thought that was cool. Uh, David L., thank you for the super chat. Teleporting lightsabers is one of the things that broke it for me. Uh, so... Uh, such a stupid force power you could never lose a battle watch pennyworth anna um do you know what pennyworth is uh the only reference i have for that is alfred pennyworth i know oh oh that, maybe that is the tv show no i have oh. not watched it um but yeah yeah the the it i don't i need to know how the teleporting lightsabers work because it, if you have to like have a mental connection with the person you're teleporting the lightsaber to, because what if you're in the middle of a battle and you teleport the lightsaber to somebody that's not expecting it and they drop it or it ignites and it like cuts their hand off. Like you could be hurting your friend more than helping them. <laughs> so I, I mean, yeah, they, they perfectly timed it in that, didn't they? It's like they knew exactly what was going to happen somehow. That's why I'm like, are they like with the whole four Skype thing? Are they like, mind linked can they think each other's thoughts like oh kind of like twice. i shudder to think ah uh, uh, so weird uh titus moeller thank you for the super chat anna efap is on you missed the notification Ugh, story of my life <laughs> story of my life uh yeah i didn't get my notification either and i had just talked to uh, somebody that hosts the freaking efap and did not tell me that it was about to start um, yeah, YouTube's been weird lately with notifying notify people about you uh, have. Yeah, yeah. I, I usually figure out it out like an hour after the fact, but um, <laughs> at least it's still going. That's true. That's true. I still got more to watch. Uh, I very rarely do I miss uh, more than half of it. Uh, little poet boy, thank you for the super chat. Just uh, wanted to show you some love. I hope this whole interviewing session becomes a staple of this channel. Well, uh, considering I've only done six episodes now, when I went to Star Wars Celebration, every single person I talked to said that they loved this. So I've been trying to get uh, more, uh, you know, 
be better about uh, doing it more often, but uh, then life happened. And then, so I couldn't do it. So this is actually the, the first one of this year. So yeah. And I'm right. all the way to, what is it? April now? Uh, oh, who cares? <laughs> yeah. And, but so yeah, Mahler's the first one of 2020. So congratulations. Dude. Yay. Yay. And it's number six, like the amount of Star Wars movies that actually exist. Yes. Ah, perfect, 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 perfect. All right. Um, uh, Whiskers voice. Thank you for the super chat. Mahler, do a whisker impression. It breathes life into my dark, withered soul. Who's who's that? Wesker. Uh, w oh, Wesker. Oh, I'm reading it wrong. So Wesker. he's the guy who's like, um, uh, oh, is it like 20 minutes? Like 20 minutes. 20 minutes is all I have to play with you. And complete global saturation chris he's uh he's fantastic he's in resident Evil 5 he's hilarious he's very campy oh is it like a, a character he's, yeah he's like the bad guy of that game oh gotcha i would not know that uh titus moller thank you for the super chat anna this was an outstanding interview well thank you and that was in all caps mm. uh, question after question for which I genuinely wanted to know the answer and have wondered about for a while. Is there, a, 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 is there another super chat in regards? Cause you didn't ask a question. Oh. oh, I get it. You're saying question after question that you wanted to know. Well, there you go. Yeah. So uh, this, this whole point of this is to uh, uh, expand upon uh, content creators and uh, let other people that, uh, want to know more about what it's like to make content and uh, based on the content creator's content, get some more uh, in-depth questions on it. So I'm glad you enjoyed it. Mm. Uh, Daily Dose, thank you for the super chat, is uh, The Force Awakens Part 3 going to point out uh, the wrong title font? <laughs> well, you see, I'm not as obsessed with the details as Hello Greedo is, so why would I do that? I instead focus on the heart of Star Wars, unlike him. <laughs> so yeah i remember when he that thing leaked on twitter of him saying that he's a youtuber which means he doesn't do any research and none of us do uh, <sighs> that irked my soul oh well bitters be bitters mm. uh let's see uh lance allison thank you for the super chat my favorite personalities together again nice job oh well thank you yeah i hope hope they had fun yeah, yeah. Uh, well read user one, thank you for the super chat. You're great, Anna, and currently my hero. Oh, well, thank you. I'm a very, uh, I, I would not consider myself a hero worthy person. I have uh, very intense anger issues, but uh, you guys seem to like those, hence the rant videos. But uh, uh, thank you for that. It's very, uh, very nice thing to hear. Uh, I just backed your amazing, beautiful cover. It's awesome, and you are true talent. Well, thank you. That was a very nice super chat. That's a pretty big uh, ego stroke right there. Thank you for that, uh, especially since everything that's been going on with it. So I'm very uh, happy to hear that people uh, like it. That, that makes me happy. Uh, Tamirius East, thank you for the super chat. Anna, what do you think of Rebels? And what are your thoughts for Ichibaka exposing Dave Filoni as a raging male feminist? Uh, you watching season seven? Uh, yes, my review for season seven. Uh, I'm, I, I like to binge watch it or else uh, I feel like I get a disconnect. But it's going to be out uh, this week. Molly, have you watched uh, season seven? I haven't watched any of Clone Wars, so I'm, uh, I'm out um, of the loop. Uncultured spy. <laughs> you call yourself a Star Wars fan? How dare you? <gasps> I, I do feel, uh, though, if you did want to learn more about Count Dooku, I feel like his character, even then, the little bit of more in-depth that they do, they make him more villainous, and he's more of a caricature of what Count Dooku actually was. Uh, and I think hmm. that they sacrificed that uh, character aspect of him for um, to maybe focus more on the heroes and their stuff. They didn't focus as much on writing villains, which is why I think... Uh, it's very clear when Katie Lucas comes in and writes an episode and uh, you'll definitely notice it when she's writing it compared to uh, other writers. So, um, yeah, but it, I think you would uh, definitely like the later seasons when she's writing it. There's, um, this is my favorite episode of the clone wars. It doesn't really focus on any of the main characters. It focuses on a clone 
and he discovers there's a chip in every single clone's head that's put into them when they're grown on Kamino. And that's the chip that makes, when the, he says, oh, execute order 66, and it activates that chip, which makes them act differently. And so a clone discovers that and has to go and try to get back to explain it to Obi-Wan and Anakin and stuff happens. Mm -hmm. But it's a very good episode. I would highly recommend watching it. Um, Doctor or Mr. Doctor Cornbread for the win. That's an interesting name. Uh, what do you guys think of Shazam? Didn't like it. <laughs> Not surprised. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you a lot of DC questions, but I remember you saying that you're not the biggest DC fan, uh, especially when it comes to the films. I completely understand why, given the, the shit that they are. You seem to be yeah. like, I mean, out of Batwoman, though. Oh, Batwoman's fantastic content. <laughs> Everyone should watch it. Uh, do, 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 if do, there do. was one thing I did wish, I, I would have loved to see you uh, just rip Aquaman a new one. Because anytime I criticized it, people are like, what are you talking about? It's a great movie. And I'm like, oh. Uh, Wolf eviscerated it briefly. <laughs> I, I loved his video. Uh, but I, I think it's because uh, I, I were you a DC person at all? Like growing up, um, I mean, I really like Batman, but I was never uh, like, yeah, I'm much more of a Marvel person, if anything. But um, totally on board with DC if they do some good stuff. Mm, I mean, about, hell, I love Joker, uh, 2019 Joker. Mm, what about um, Superman? You like Superman? Yeah, I've never really been impressed by Superman. I've always thought he was fine. I've seen all of uh, Smallville and several Superman movies, but never really connected that much with Superman. He's, he's a certain certain uh, people like him as compared to uh, Batman. I think it's because he's a very idealized character as compared to flawed. Mm -hmm. But I, I usually hear, um, as far as people that I've met on YouTube, I hear more people that don't uh, have a harder time connecting with Superman than uh, Batman. And I think it's for that perfectness that he is. Uh, let's see. Um, Wolfbane, thank you for two super chats in a row. I know how the rest of the series is, but have either of you seen the original uh, 1954 Godzilla? What uh, would you be open to? Uh, I have. My mom is a huge Godzilla fan. It's been a very long time. What about you? Yeah, it's been. I, I'm pretty sure I've seen it, but it's been so long I've mostly forgotten all of it. Mm. Uh, Anna, do you take art requests? I do, but understand there is a very long, long line on uh, when I can get to it. And um, it might not be what you expect. So it would be my own creative take on it. Uh, Gaia Ray, thank you for the super chat. Anna, I'm doing a thing for EFAP 100. You change your avatar regularly. So I'll ask which version you prefer I use. Uh, uh, the Ahsoka one or you as the other. Um, I don't really care uh, whichever one you think works best. It's all me. And uh, that that's one thing that I don't think people really understand, especially on Twitter, is that I always use my face, whether it's the face painted Photoshop ones or the drawing that uh, mm -hmm. you did of me. Uh, I, I love using the Slave Leia one on Twitter. People lose their shit and they think I'm a dude. I'm like, it says <laughs> girl in the name of my handle, but all right. It's like, you misogynistic man, you're using one of those sex avatars. I'm like, it's me. <laughs> then they block me. Uh, let's see. Uh, Zero Duality, thank you for the super chat. Hi, Anna, grats on the cover. Uh, Hail Mahler Army, in air quotes. Well, there you go. Oh, Excellent. <laughs> Hail both. Uh, the Shadow Love knows. Thank you for the super chat. Hi, Rags. Oh, well, he's not here, so I'm sure he's saying hi wherever he is right now. Uh, oh, wait. Hello, Musa. Uh, purely out of curiosity, I've noticed you're friends with Sargon, unless I'm mistaken. So I got to ask, how did you guys get together? Uh, full HMO. Oh, full homo. Uh He's uh, he does a regular stream of D and I think with Rags, and so it was, uh, I think it was a couple of nights randomly. If the, they decide to play something like Killing Floor, I um, I end up jumping in and I just talked to him a couple of times. Don't know if he goes far as saying we're friends, but we've certainly um, you know talked about different things here and there a couple of times and uh, get along with him pretty easily. Yeah. 
All right. And then uh, the Shadow of Nose, thank you for another super chat. For the two of you, uh, what would be your best moment in EFAP going from memory? Bonus point for the best moment from each presenter. Uh, is this supposed who? Is this short for Mussolini or is this just <laughs> Mussol? Oh, Muesli? Is, it, is that what it is? Oh my God. I don't know who that is, but uh, maybe I missed that episode. No, that's just a fun way of saying my name. My name gets said in lots of different ways. Mubsley is one. <laughs> Muesli. Uh, Raggled and Wolf Senpai. Well, um, I still go with Isle of Man for me, for my favorite. And I, like I said, the Rag's favorite for me was the Ocean Man thing. And then for Wolf, the Y-Wing rant was pretty good. The Game of Thrones rant was pretty good, even though that's not EFAP technically. Uh, uh, there's a lot of good, hilarious wolf moments, but the Y Wing one comes to mind the most for me. Um, I think my favorite moment watching was the, the first time you guys watched a Jared Genesis video. Like, ah, <laughs> it's just so. And then like watching it again, you're like, he came out with another one, and like just all of your guys' laughs are so infectious that it's like, and it's so ridiculously over the top how like satirical he is like in life. That you're like, this is a real person. <laughs> um, uh, Christian Coriolan. I don't know how to say your last name. I apologize. Uh, love your videos. A suggestion for a character redesign are the cast of Netflix's She-Ra. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Those things need to be fixed. Uh, look up those characters in the original versions, and you'll see what I mean. Well, I grew up watching that, so I know what they look like. Uh, keep up the amazing content. Well, thank you. And I think uh, the She-Ra design was perfect to begin with. And so if I were to do a redesign, I would just post the original next to uh, the... Uh, the trash that came after. Uh, Titus Muller, thank you for the super chat. For both of you, who's your favorite filmmaker? Ooh, uh, I guess, so all of them at their best, I guess I might be enslaved to Joss Whedon. He's not like he was when he made Buffy and Angel anymore, but that guy, when he made them at their best, that's the guy I'd probably be my favorite. However, all of them as they stand right now, probably Edgar Wright. He would be the one that I'd be most confident in making something that I would very much like. Or, um, I mean, I still really like Tarantino. Uh, and and James Gunn. I mean, I can't wait for Guardians 3. You know, I'm on board with that. But yeah, those would be some picks. Do you have picks? Hello. I don't know if what's happening. Can you guys still hear me? <laughs> oh. Is it just me? Um, well, I get, uh, is it just me now? Okay, uh, so, I mean, I can see the, I don't know how this works. I would have thought that the stream would go down if, if she's not here, or is that not how it works? <laughs> OBS and StreamYard seem to work uh, differently. Um, I can I can see what super chats were sent in that are addressed, so I can try and answer them. In the meantime, while, while she's coming back, if she's coming back, uh, Mola, would you say Diabeto, a simp for sugar? Um, yes, one hundred percent. Not even a question. And uh, Anna, when you're taking the movie Bob small meal challenge, she's already done it. Um, I believe she said on the on the Jack show, and she said that it's not possible. Um, oh, and that's, I think that's it. The other one is for her. So, yeah, uh, let's, uh, this is really weird to suddenly become a, I'm just streaming to you guys now. <laughs> um, 
how is that? How is everybody? I, I like that question about, um, you know, filmmakers, because it's almost like a, a bit of a gamble with everything they've done before. What will they create in future? And it's usually the newest stuff that gives you the, the faith. You know, if they've made stuff ages ago that was good, wouldn't matter if they've made stuff recently that's not very good. And the examples for that would be stuff like, um, you know, like Ridley Scott. It's like, oh, he made Alien, but he also made Prometheus. I'm like, okay, what about um, James Cameron? You're like, ooh, he made Terminator 1 and 2. It's like, yeah, but he's making like 10 million avatars. I don't know. I don't know about that. Construction guys shut off their power. Damn. How is it that the stream's still going? Mola, what do you think of Christopher Nolan? Oof, mixed bag. I think he's a really, really, really good director, but I've not got much faith in his writing abilities. Um, I don't know how to explain prestige, but it seems like maybe Jonathan Nolan was to blame. I don't know. But uh, I would still have faith that he makes very engaging movies, but holy crap, Interstellar annoyed me. Very much so. But yeah, I guess um, Anna should be back any time now. Uh, it's gonna be more the rambling for a few hours. I, I I think it's better than uh, than for me to leave. I think I, I I believe this is it could be a worse if I leave. I think that it it would just have you guys listening to an empty stream, so we can't have that. But it's not EFAP. You gotta have rags here for that. Um. But yes, Edgar Wright is pretty uh, reliable from what I can tell, and I. If I was to have any film randomly made, I'd, I'd assume he would take good care of it, you know? What do you think of BVS? Batman vs. Superman. Uh, hilarious, but, you know, I haven't watched it recently, so maybe I, uh, I could be wrong on some of it, you know? I wonder if the construction workers having turned off her power might mean that she can't come back soon. Like, because they need it to be off to do certain things. It's so unfortunate as well because she was right at the end of the super chats. She could have uh, ended almost. Um, but I'm keeping an eye on chat in case she says anything uh, in the oh, Mola's God. army. Oh, hello. I'm so sorry. That is all right. They turned off the power, which uh, does not help when I'm uh, doing this. Uh, no, so. no, it doesn't. <laughs> no, not, not really. So I had to go inside and yell at them and uh, like, what the fuck? The one thing I'm doing, and they're like, oh, we need you to turn this off to do this. I'm like, is that required today? It's like, no, it's like, don't do it. Uh, so I apologize. Uh, were you okay? Yes, I, uh, I survived. It was a close one. Oh, okay, good. I'm, I'm glad. Uh, did you, did the chat, were they nice to you? Mm-hmm, very friendly. Okay, good. Uh, did you answer their question? Yes, uh, I think there was one, one or two for you as well. Oh, okay. Let me go look. Uh, oh, the favorite filmmaker. Um, well, I'm biased because it's George Lucas and he made Star Wars. If it was George Lucas back in uh, the 70s and 80s, you know, that's where it's at. Um, I'm, again, I'm biased. Uh, I love Quentin Tarantino. Um, but one of the things that I think has been a really big uh, hindrance to him was that he lost his editor. She passed away a few years ago. And since then his movies haven't been as tight as they were before. And they were a really good uh, team together, but I love Quentin Tarantino movies. So uh, yeah. And then some of the other people that uh, I love their movies, um, they, it was kind of like a one hit wonder because my favorite movie is silence of the lambs and uh, his other movies are not the best. So um, yeah. I think everyone has, you know, the, the best work in the highlight and then they kind of do other stuff that uh, would not be as, uh, does not hold a candle to what they used to make, you know? Because mm. I also like Guillermo del Toro films and, um, yeah. you know, I feel like some of the ones that he's made, I really love and other ones are not his best work. But uh, I feel like I'm one of the only people that loved The Shape of Water and I'm fine with that because it's a good movie. Mm, who did you say? Uh, Edgar Wright, and if it was them at their best, then Joss Whedon and uh, Tarantino is a relative favorite as well. A couple of choices here and there, lots of good ones, lots of dodgy ones potentially. <laughs> James Gunn, I like. I, I'm looking forward to Guardians Three. I'm hoping that he can pull that through. I like that he's answering questions on uh, Instagram. 
about <laughs> the movies and like Suicide Squad and all that. <laughs> I actually think that Suicide Squad, I think it's two, is going to be good. I hope so. I hope so too. I've been waiting a while for a good DC movie and Joker. I was really excited about, uh, and it did a good job. I, I honestly think that if DC like to change the tone, uh, for Marvel, if they did, uh, eat, so they just did Joker. What if they did like the next one would be Riddler then penguin and then just do the DC universe, but then show how each character becomes their villain. And then maybe kind of how Marvel did have the big lead up the Avengers movie, but have it be all the villains. And then like Batman comes in or something like that. I would love yeah. to see that with DC, but uh, never know, never know. And uh, let's see, Mad Ghost 4, thank you for the super chat. Anna, what do you think of the Umbria arc? Uh, it's my personal favorite. Why am I blanking on what that is? Is it Clone Wars or? Let me Google real fast once I see a picture. I will know. Oh, oh, this episode. Um, well, that's going to have a lot of spoilers in it for uh, people that have not watched The Clone Wars. And uh, I am very big on uh, convincing Mahler to watch it. Mm. So um, it's a pretty pretty big thing happens in that thing so um i'm not gonna spoil it but uh it's good it's good like i said the the farther you get into the clone wars the better it gets well and it starts off good too so that's saying a lot uh john ellis bush bush thank you for the super chat mahler would you say uh diabito a simp for sugar oh and, I had you. <laughs> did you read this one already yeah yeah Mm. Did you say yes? Yes. <laughs> Anna, what are you uh, talking, taking the movie Bob Blob's small meal challenge? Uh, we did it on the Jack show and we all died. And we even had to change it. Cause it's like, I thought it was two 10 piece chicken nuggets and they were both two 20 piece chicken nuggets. And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> like a, a small meal like ah, what does he eat normally i don't know <laughs> yeah um he is not uh, i don't think he's necessarily a sane uh, minded person but anyways that is all, all cut up on super chat so um i'm going to thank everyone for uh showing up and uh if you haven't yet please uh, go and check out my uh, Indiegogo campaign for my very first comic book cover. It just passed uh, 24,000 today. So thank you so much, everyone. That's amazing. And uh, make sure that you go check out Mahler's channel and uh, his very special uh, Mueller channel, which is where you can find all of the EFAP, uh, the show that we were talking about, if you did not know. Of uh, which you have guessed it on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple times. Mm. Uh, I, I honestly prefer watching than being on. I always feel awkward when I'm on, but uh, the one, and I, I was always sick when I was on, wasn't I? <laughs> I think you've been sick, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just because uh, I, I remember I was in my office, like right where I am, and I laid on the floor, like with the microphone next to me, and I was just dying. And people were like, Anna doesn't talk the entire stream. I'm like, I was on the floor dying of the plague. I'm sorry. But uh, I, I very much enjoy watching it. Uh, it's it's very different being a guest on a show as compared to uh, just sitting back and enjoying it. I yeah, mean, for sure. Yelling at your phone as compared to uh, having to sit there and listen to a psycho person's video. I shouldn't say that word. But uh, the, the person that was talking about Toy Story 4 being good for really freaked me out. I felt like he was one of those people that would be a doll that would kill you. <laughs> Like that's See, what I thought of when I was not allowed to it. say that. It's too mean. I'm a wham, and I can get away with it. Oh. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, yeah. Is there anything uh, you want to plug, Mall, or anything you want to say? Closing statements. No, no, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to uh, leave it there. Other than saying thank you very much for having me on, and thank you for very um, meaningful, insightful questioning. I think you make a good rev reviewer, interviewer, <laughs> and uh, it was it was fun sort of exploring them all with you and. Uh, yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see who you may have on in future, guest-wise. 
Yeah, for everyone that's wondering, uh, I know you guys have been hounding me and hounding me about uh, doing collabs with certain YouTubers. So I have taken that in mind. Uh, Mauler, you have been one that uh, people have been like, do a stream with Mauler. And I'm like, I have like, <laughs> many times, but uh, they were never on my channel that I can remember. Actually, I think the Game of Thrones one was, was on my channel. But uh, that was a long time ago. So uh, I have, but now here you guys go an official one uh, with me and Mauler. So uh, thank you. Thank you for agreeing to it. I know uh, this is not uh, an easy thing to undertake sometimes, especially when uh, you do not know the questions that are going to be asked. Mm. But so, yeah, I see people screaming for rag. So uh, yes, <laughs> may maybe I will get time. You shall pull some strings. <laughs> in the puppy's biz busy schedule. I'll get him. I'll get him on to say hi to everyone. <laughs> but anyway, guys, uh, thank you so much for watching, and uh, have a great rest of your night, day, morning, wherever you are. And may the force be with you, because we are really, really, really going to need.